Well, welcome back to the Comic Book Historians Podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Alex Grant. Today we have uh, a good friend and uh, comic book illustrator, painter, uh, Dan Brereton. Dan, thanks for uh, being here today. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah. So I have a comic book get together at my house every couple months. Dan is one of the friends that comes over with Bud Plant. We had uh, Steve Englehart over one oh, time. Oh, yeah. Tom Yates, uh, Justin Greenwood, Kelly Jones, Kelly right? Kelly Jones. And um, what's great is when you guys talk shop. It's so much fun for me. And yeah. um, we have a good time. But basically because he lives close, we can actually do this one without a webcam. Actually more like just kind of hanging out. We've been planning on doing something like this for a while. This interview uh, transcript will also show up in a project of Dan's uh, that he's going to publish uh, coming up soon, which there'll be some fun announcements for. Um, but Dan, I wanted to get started, you know, kind of a little bit on your biography, your mm -hmm. artistic approach to comic books. You're an illustrator. You're not from the East Coast, which is interesting. You know, a lot of comic guys, especially in the 60s, 70s, were like kind of East Coast people. Then oh, kind yeah. of the West Coast people start coming in kind of in the 70s, like Steve Englehart, for example. Mm -hmm. You're more in the modern era of comics. And so you're born more in San Francisco, Bay Area. Does that bring a different artistic sensibility and also tell us a little bit about your kind of childhood in the bay area you know i was pretty young when i got into comics i was uh about eight years old so we're talking um, spring summer of 1974 huh? and i was eight years old and a friend of mine who was uh, in my class this kid named eric he lived in pittsburgh and he mo his family moved out to san ramon which is this sort of bedroom community East Bay Area, and uh, that's where I was introduced to comics by Eric's collection. And uh, he had an older brother who was probably in his twenties, and he had a collection that we weren't allowed to look at. We weren't even allowed to go in his room, uh -huh. but he had boxes and boxes of comics, and Eric's had a few boxes of comics. And he introduced me to to the whole comic book thing because, to be honest, they really weren't in my. I didn't really know about them because. Right. You didn't know about them because they were like, they weren't all over the place. You you I mean you could go to Seven Eleven you know convenience store, and that was the only convenience store where I could ever find them because we have Circle K out here. They didn't have comics. Seven Eleven had comic books. That's <clears> true. <throat> I, I think I read my first comic book at a Seven Eleven. Yeah, that's interesting that you say that. And yeah. we I didn't go in Seven Eleven a lot. It's not like my parents took us to Seven Eleven to get Slurpees and stuff all the time. That right. was a new thing too that came with comics, and so it was like we'd see a Seven Eleven. I go, oh, can I go in? And um, as part of the Seven Eleven experience was, hey, I want to see the comics on the rack, basically. Oh, yeah. so much of what I do and who yeah. I am is rooted in that time. And you try and talk to other people about it. Well, I don't talk to other people about uh -huh. it who don't share it because they wouldn't understand. They yeah. Just think and I was this crazy. is the late 70s you're talking about. 74. So, uh -huh. so Eric's got this collection of comics. And I'm pretty sure the first thing that really just hit me was looking at like Jack Kirby's Captain America. Jack because Kirby, I knew yeah. Captain America and I knew – some of the other characters like Namor and right. here and there because of the brief time I had watched the animated shows. Yeah. Uh, the Marvel out. superhero shows. Yeah. yeah. Really badly animated um, stuff that you saw here and there. And usually by the time you're in the seventies, uh, those older cartoons would be shown at like six o'clock in the morning uh -huh. on a Saturday. So you had to get up really early if you wanted to see them. Yeah. You have to get up there while the farm report's still on. And turn the TV down really low so you wouldn't wake up your parents and get yelled at. And so I remember him from that. And that's, you know, that's so seminal. The work that appears, you know, you're looking at Don right. Heck and probably Gene Colan and Jack Kirby, obviously. Right. And uh, so then to see the comics where they came from, to see the, the full color and all the storytelling and everything and the covers, it was just like – it. Totally grabbed me right basically, off the bat. And Marvel, basically. Yeah, Marvel, yeah. Marvel. DC, not so much, but that gradually DC kind of worked its way in. And in and, and interesting titles like Doom Patrol, Metal Men, yeah. Strange, Strange Sports. Uh-huh, oh, yeah. Because Eric would go check this out. You know, the golf ball hole that goes down into like, you know, a spaceship or something right. like that. Yeah, crazy stuff. There was instantly uh, this – delineation between marvel and dc as far as style and content and, and where they're coming from and but i'm it was mostly you know like jack kirby you know yeah. and then and then and i remember you know steve Englehart speaking of steve Englehart, i remember like the first time my friend sat me down and said you have to read this com read this comic i want you to read it yeah so i sit down and it's it's an avengers written by steve and i'm reading and he goes you're done already i go yeah he goes did you read the captions 
I go, yeah, I read the captions. He goes, you have to read the captions too. So he was like my mentor. <laughs> That's you know, like true. How to read yeah. comics and how to understand comics. And and um, so I just got really into it. And uh, I remember like the first time my parents would let, you know, stopped at 7-Eleven one, e- one evening and uh, on the way home. And I was probably given a dollar to go in and discovering like Conan the Barbarian. And that was one of the first books I bought. I think I had two copies of that, Thor, and some other ones. Uh-huh. Just, probably just four comics, right? And those are like the beginning of my my collection. And so you were nine years uh, old, eight, eight years old. Yeah, I, I, I turned nine that year. But by the time I was nine, I was fully hooked in. Yeah. And and then I remember the following year, in 1975, you had all these things going on in comics. Um, you know, the first appearances of Wolverine, the new X Men, right? Um. Oh yeah, all that Dave Cockrum uh, stuff, amazing. Captain Marvel right. uh, was kind of a big deal right. in the 74, 75. And then uh, what, Adam Warlock oh, yeah. and all that, the yep. Jim Starlin yep. stuff. Yeah, yeah. Adam Warlock stuff, um, because that's when I was coming in when Starlin was doing the book. And um, Gil was, was not doing the book anymore. I didn't even know about that stuff. And then I discovered that you could buy back issues if you went yeah. to certain used bookstores. There was a place called Hooked on Books in Walnut Creek, which was where my grandmother lived a few towns over. And my uh-huh. parents would bring me in and go through this box. They had this small box and go, well, look at this Fantastic Four Galactus. Who's this guy, Gabriel? Yeah. Oh, my God, I got to get this. And you could get him for like, you know, a buck or two back then. Um, so that was just like this just explosion. Yeah. And – you knew everything was taking place on the East Coast. You got the feeling that, you know, I, I, in my mind, they all worked at the bullpen somewhere in, in right. Manhattan. Yeah. I dreamed about going there. I wrote letters to the bullpen. Um, I sent them uh, designs for for superhero characters and, you know, here's so-and-so. You can use them if you want. You know, all I want is just some, you know, sketches that maybe you're going to throw away or something. Because I imagine that when they were drawing comics, all of them together in a big room. That they would maybe try stuff out on a piece of paper and then just, yeah. oh, okay, and then throw it away if they didn't like it. And I uh-huh. thought, there's probably waste paper baskets full of these just cast off drawings. Maybe I could get one. And that's the where your mind goes, you know, right, right. when it comes to comics and, and just the whole explosion of the imagination. Yeah. I think. Visual imagination, especially, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. And I, they never, I never got a response except that I did finally, after sending several letters and characters, um, I got a, like a, illustrated catalog of marvel merchandise yeah, uh-huh. and this is probably in 75 um and uh i'm gonna jump ahead real quick to tell like how to close that loop yeah um so in 1992 i meet gene colin in san diego yeah and his wife go. adrian and and obviously gene's huge you know huge influence he's one oh, yeah. of my heroes and yeah. he's such a sweet guy when you meet him and uh, he's working away doing commissions, and his wife does most of the talking. She's very sweet, and they're funny. And Gene uh, sees my work. I bring some of my my originals over to show him what I what I'm doing. And um, at the time, I was probably working on uh, Legends of the World's Finest, so Superman, Batman stuff. Right. And he he responded really positive to to it, and he, he really liked it. And then even later, when I was sitting at my table, Adrian came over, walked over to my table. This is back when you didn't have to walk, you know, four miles to go to someone's table. Right. Right. Um, <laughs> Smaller convention. The convention center was literally not as big as it is now. Mm-hmm. She walked over and she just said some nice things about. Uh, uh, that Gene had said after yeah. I had left and, and what an impression I had made and I was just like I couldn't I was so bowled over so uh, later I go back to say hello to them the next day and she he's again Gene is just drawing away and she's talking about some Daredevil drawing that he started doing that didn't it wasn't coming out good and she goes he just looked like a jerk I go Daredevil? He go, yeah he just looked like a jerk and, and so he started over I go, oh, okay. And then like it hit me like a ton of bricks. Bam. I said, where's that drawing? And she goes, oh, it's, you know, and, and it's on the floor. Like it's on Bristol board, but it's like yeah. crumpled. Right. And, yeah. yeah. It no good. Uh-huh. And I pick it up and I unfold it and it's just drawing. It's mostly there. It's, it's not finished by any means, but you, know, you can see Daredevil and stuff. And I don't really know what she's talking about. You know, uh-huh. I can see that maybe it's not like his best drawing, right. but there was nothing wrong with it. I said, can, can I have this drawing? Yeah. She yeah. Says, oh no, honey, he'll do you, he'll do you a, a good one. And I said, oh, you don't understand. <laughs> so I told her the story about how I was always writing in hopes of getting something sent back. And she goes, oh, you have to have this. Oh, that's nice. And she, and she gave it to me and I still have it somewhere. But uh, yeah, I was like, that closed that loop for me. Yeah. That was right. So huge. 
Yeah, it um, closed the loop of like being a, a young kid writing letters to Marvel and finally getting something back. Yeah. But then also realizing yourself as a professional in the field at the same time. It took it took getting there to get that, to make that happen, I guess, <laughs> in some weird way. But I mean, it also just uh, my that person who I was back then who loved comics, that is still he's still there. That's still there, yeah. All the time. You know, I mean, when I go to comic shops, I look at the, the racks of new stuff and I go, mm, competition, mm. you know? Yeah. You know, I, I sense art. that when yeah. we were uh, when we were talking to tough. Steve Engelhart, we yeah. were both like kids listening to him tell his old stories. Oh, and yeah, we were like totally. on the same le- even though you're a professional and, you know, you, you illustrate comics and you've hit that point. We were both like kids in the candy store yeah. soaking in his stories. When he walked and- in, when he walked, well, to the backyard. And he came in and you walked up and you introduced yourself to him. I had met him outside. Yeah. And you just – we were just standing there for like an hour, standing there for an hour. Yeah, yeah. We were sitting – we were right next to a table and chairs. And for an hour, we stood there while you interviewed him. And it's, your interview, you couldn't help it. It started right away. Right, yeah, And yeah. I was just like – It was impulsive. Yeah. yeah. And then finally after about an hour, Steve goes, okay, hey, can we sit down? <laughs> and <laughs> then we true. sat for another And we sat for hours? like – yeah, like two, three, three hours? And yeah. then um, Bud and Kelly and, and – most everybody else were looking at some doing some yeah, show and tell Scott some things. And them, yeah. But it had Broad and Kelly. They finally come over and then they all sit around and then it just opened up some more. And yeah. It's just amazing. It was amazing. You know? Yeah. You could see that that kid in you that loved comics reading his stuff. That was still very much alive. All the background. Yeah, all, all the that uh, stuff. Yeah. The, the stories about what they were up to back then and who they were. And they were just young kids, too. Yeah, that's you know, right. Yeah. Walking around New York tripping and, and coming up with ideas. Yeah. And just being allowed and giving all this tether and free reign to do right. what they wanted. Totally. And that kind of reminded me of when I was in my early 20s doing comics. And my editor on first two things for DC was Mike Carlin. And Mike was like that. Mike gave us a lot of, a lot of leeway. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, and I'm, and actually, I'm going to ask about Mike Carlin as an editor later because he 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 oversaw some of the stuff you did. Yeah. Um, some of the other comic influences I want to talk about. Um, now, I've seen where you've described John Buscema also as some sort of influence on you reading his Marvel stuff. Is that right? Yeah. So my sort of triumvirate is Jack Kirby, John Buscema, and Gene Colan. Right. And then you if you and if there's a fourth one, it's it's not quite as um, prescient in my mind, but it's probably Gill. Gil Kane. Because Gil go. was everywhere in Marvel. He was uh-huh. doing all those covers. He was drawing so much stuff. Yeah. Um, the cover work that Gil did didn't always register to me as being Gil's work because a lot of times he's being inked by someone else. But when you saw Gil do interiors, you knew exactly who it was. Right, right. Know? Totally. The nostril. The nostril shots. The nostril. Yeah, looking the, up, up the, the nose. The, the, yeah. the nose, the, um, yeah. the construction of anatomy. Right. Um, just, you know, so flawless, but also not a lot of um, – uh, illustrative touches in the way that you would see like say John's work yes. or John Romero yeah. or any of those other guys. Right. You right. Know? Like Gene yeah. Col- Gene Collin and Gil Kane, miles apart. Right. You know? Oh yeah, totally. Um I think Gene and and John are much more uh in, in simpatico because yes. of the organic nature of that's how they interesting. Draw figures, yes. You know? Yeah, that's interesting. Gene used a lot of uh, uh photo reference and uh, it, Yes, that's Adrian right. Adrian told me, Oh, we had everyone in their underwear. <laughs> and I was like, I knew exactly what he was talking yeah, about. Yeah, to do the that's, superhero that's, stuff. That's, you know, I had James Robinson in, in boxer shorts for a for a thing that we did together. Oh, really? We did a uh, an issue of uh, Legends, Legends of the Legends Dark Knight, 114. Knight. That's right. Legends 1999. Of the... <laughs> right. I've done my research here. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. And James was the – James um, – it's a story about Batman. He's he's chasing down this assassin and he's been he's been shot, gut shot. So he's wounded and he's wandering around wounded, wounded and he's also kind of delirious because he's losing blood. Right. And he's getting weak and this guy is like toying with him. And James is, is – Robinson, who wrote the story, is yeah. the bad guy. So I said, well, I'm going to use you as the bad guy. Oh, is that what that happened there? That's <clears throat> yeah. great. And James didn't have a like a personal trainer then. Yeah. You know, he was, a, you know, like a thin, pale British fella. And uh, we, I had him uh, in boxer shorts and like a little a toy Batman utility <laughs> belt and a toy Batman gun. Um, so you're doing very much a lot of the same things that even your comic book idols were kind of doing. Like you were also having fun. Without realizing with, it. Without knowing yeah. it. Yeah. Um, yeah, utilizing kind of the same material in a way. Someone um, told me Gray Morrow, yeah. he would – you get all this photo reference together yeah. and then he had an assistant who would to kind of lay things out. Right. And then 
I was told that in the heap in gray would just go in and gray Moro eyes all the faces or whatever. Right, right, right. There's yeah, so and, much and also, more to it. Also, than I, that, I've you know? seen pictures of Gray Morrow wearing like having a Buck Rogers ray gun in yeah, his hand. And, I have seen pictures you know, photo of references of Frazetta, Gene yeah, Colin. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. I have no pic. I've no, I've seen no pictures of John Buscema, uh doing anything. Yeah, but right. Just that's drawing true. and I think smoking. that's that's yeah right uh, exactly. Now Buscema, yeah. do you ever meet him? I met him once. Uh-huh. Thankfully, I met him once. Yeah. Uh, it was. Um, Probably what six? It was San, it was the San Diego that he attended before he passed away. Yeah, and um, I see. So two thousand and one or two thousand. David Spurlock had put out his art book. That's right. And yes. God, I wish there'd been more art books. There's just not enough stuff on John. And uh, I said, "Oh, I'd love to meet him." And David goes, "I'll see what I can do." So he brings him over to my table, uh, and John and I have like this half hour conversation. Yeah, and just like, I'm, I'm part. There's like two people. There's the there's the artist you know the working artist talking to another working artist who's you know obviously the master of the you know of his of his profession and there's this kid yeah. who's just can't believe it and he was so cool he was just the coolest guy and um i asked him i got to ask him a lot of the questions i'd always asked him i asked him questions about frazetta and conan i asked him mm-hmm. about this that and the other thing and uh it got to the point where I felt comfortable enough with it that I actually said I wanted to work with him, like I wanted to write a story for him or something yeah, yeah. one day, and um, which is ridiculous, but still, um, yeah. So and then later, Dave goes, uh, "You owe me one." Yeah, yeah, I connected with <laughs> and, the hero, for and sure. I did a cover for him for Space Cowboy. Oh, there you go. Oh, you did things. for Space yeah, Cowboy. Goes, I need a oh, Space cool. Cowboy cover. I go. That's right. right. Yeah, that's his it. thing. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Yeah. And then, did you ever meet Kirby by chance? I wish that I had because yeah. I did attend San Diego for the first time in '89 uh-huh. when I was still in art school, and he was probably there. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm yeah. sure he yeah. was there the next few years. But I, I never. Uh, I it, it, for me, walking up to one of your heroes and introducing yourself is not an easy thing to do. So when Frazetta was there in the early '90s, I didn't have the nerve to go up. Oh, and, really? And talk to him. And yeah. there was one year I was at a convention in um, in. Uh, Atlanta in the early 2000s and Jeffrey Jones was there. Oh yeah. And this is after gender reassignment. Yeah. Yeah. Catherine, Catherine, Jeff Catherine, Jones. that's right. Catherine, Jeffrey Jones. And, uh, I just didn't have the nerve to go up and yeah. say hello. And Amazing. Illustrator. Amazing. Just too shy, I guess to, so yeah, I missed out on meeting Frazetta and I missed out on meeting, uh, uh, you know, quite a few people, but yeah, from what I hear about Jack, Jack was just love to talk to, just the neighborhood kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He liked and, young people and yeah. he liked knowing what the finger on the pulse of young people. Yeah, I think that's just amazing. It's so that great. Is, it's, it is um, great. And he's not the only one, you know. Um, when I meet kids at conventions who are interested in comics, I always have questions for them. You know, right. I, I want to know what's going on. And you want to know kind of what, what the new kind of stuff What do you might be. like? Yeah, what do you they know? like? Yeah, actually there are t- stories. Mort Weisinger's son, when I interviewed him, he said Mort was always having his – son's friends over asking him what would you like superman to do and he was listening mm-hmm. to him like every weekend yeah and he would use some of those ideas and yeah. i think that's why he liked jim shooter who was a young kid writing for him too you know right um, right so now yeah. um let's talk about okay you're reading comics we were seeing marvel was kind of a early marvel was kind of an, a, an explosion for you with you know busama kirby colon were you also drawing were you doodling were you drawing the characters or were you already drawing before you were reading comics I started drawing, I think, before kindergarten. Uh-huh. When, I, when I went into kindergarten, I was still four years old. My mom is, is an artist, and she got me painting with watercolors, uh, I think, 18 months. The first painting I did was 18 months old or something. 18 months old. Still That's your first painting. Down. That's incredible. Okay, so there I mean, you it was, go. I don't know what kind of painting it was. And, it's and got it blue was... and yellow and red on it or something. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Right, sure. But still, it's working with paint. From yeah. a super young age, yeah, um, which is what you still work with is paints. Yeah, for the most part, you pencil stuff too, but paint is a big deal here. For Drawing you. for me was always number one. Mm-hmm. Uh, the painting at a young age makes sense because my mom was probably doing a lot of painting and and setting up the watercolors. It's not like setting up oils or yeah. acrylics, yeah. you know. And yeah. your kid can yeah. just have, and I've done that with my children. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, but uh, by the time I was in, I was in kindergarten. Four years old, I was drawing monsters. Yes, and uh, you know, horns, four years old, so big you, eyes. You liked monsters. Oh, as, since you were four, even okay. the thing about monsters is that no one can tell you that you that they're wrong. Oh, that's interesting. You can't you can't mess it up and say, oh, that yeah. monster's not working. Um, and I remember one of the highlights of, of kindergarten 
was an afternoon when the teacher probably had, I don't know, half hour or more left in the day and, and she says, what do you guys want to do? And they never asked us what we wanted to do. They usually had the day planned. And I shot my hand up. I said, let's draw monsters. She goes, okay. Yeah, yeah. And I was just like on it. I was like, couldn't believe it, uh-huh. you know. And so we all sat at this table, the whole class, and she put out the paper and the crayons and everything. And we sat, we drew monsters. And some kids actually came up to me and said, this is, how is this? Is this a good monster? Yeah, you know, yeah. asking my opinion. Oh, like, really? That's oh, cool. Oh, my God. The, the so you're, you're, of, you're the monster connoisseur from an early age. Well, that kind of imprinted me. And it's funny because now I look at people who draw monsters in comics and they're they're not even considered monster people and their monsters are amazing. Oh, you interesting. Know? Yeah. But um, yeah, that was that sort of cemented me as a kind of a monster kid. And I remember my mom even saying later on when I was really into comics, she goes, You're, you've always been into monsters. Even the superheroes are like monsters. <laughs> and I understood what she meant by that. Yeah, the, yeah. Sort of the fantastic nature of, of, a, of a Captain America costume. Uh-huh. And yeah. I remember learning how to draw his costume and, and memorizing how to draw all the things, you know, when I was pretty young. And it was, I think, easier for me, though, to come up with my own ideas rather than try and copy because uh, I did do the copying. Everyone does that. But I, but I was just drawing stuff to free form a lot. And I drew very quickly, too. I remember someone in seventh grade, some girl in seventh grade saying, there's just all these lines you're doing. And, but then it turns into something when you're done. Yeah. And that was kind of how that sort of sketchy thing. And I remember when I got my first copy of uh, How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way. Oh, yeah. And the way in watching. Uh, By uh, Stan Lee and John Buscema, yeah. Yes, based on John's uh, classes he was teaching. That he was teaching in the late 70s. That's yeah. right, which I saw the ads for and I, I so wanted to be in that class. Yeah, even yeah. at, I don't know, 10 years old or whatever. Uh-huh. So um, John, you know, the construction of how he does the figures, you know, he draws the oval, and which is a pretty – you know, general yeah, way of doing it, of but doing I comics, had never yeah. seen that. And not everyone draws that way. Yeah. Interesting. Not everyone does the draw through and the, in the, um, the, uh, the contour of the body and the, in the motion and, and, um, kind of sketching things out that way. Some people just draw like, you know, they construct it, you know, um, but he did a lot of draw through and that uh-huh. was what I was doing. I was doing a lot of draw through. And so I was very comfortable with that idea. And when I saw that he was doing that, I, I, I took heart. I thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe there is, hope for me <laughs> yeah <that's> <laughs> you know because yeah. i knew i wasn't gonna ever be as good as these guys but that was kind of the goal by the time i was in high school i thought well my goal would be trying to be as good as a john Bessemer or frank rosetta but i know i'll never get there obviously but maybe somewhere along the way i'll be okay i'll be good enough another aspect of influence you know we always talk about comic influence but there's other things in pop culture too especially when you're a painter like yourself now there's another dimension of influence so first Monster movies, horror movies. It was that. Were you watching that stuff growing up? No, because I had a really overactive imagination, I guess, or or just, you know, I I got nightmares and I got scared at night real easy. Uh-huh. So when the lights went out in our room, um, the the half light uh, creates this landscape. Yeah, and I was very susceptible to to how my my brain would sort of turn everything into something scary. Right, and I don't know if that's childhood stress. I think it's a lot of childhood stress. Um, now that I'm a parent, I can see it in my own kids sometimes when um, one of them will have uh, some nighttime stress. Uh, my 12 year old, when he was 10, nine or 10, had a lot of that, and that was during pandemic when things were stressful. Yeah, and you know the monster in the room, and I'm afraid there's a monster in my room. Right. That was me all over the place. I yes. mean, I would get so scared I couldn't even go down the hall to use the bathroom at night. And, um, I got like that. That's funny. And not everybody. Yeah. A lot of people. Oh, I, you know, I remember having conversations with Rob Zombie about, about, you know, cause we're close in age Yeah. and he was allowed to watch everything when he was a kid. Right. And the things that he was allowed to watch, I wouldn't even have wanted to watch, you know, like I remember in fourth grade, a kid describing the plot of the exorcist to us in class yeah. while we were working on some, yeah. And Exorcist and things. Omen are legitimately scary movies. And a kid at that age in fourth grade should not be told that movie, should not have seen that movie. <laughs> right, right. It's just not – I just disagree with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I was hearing things I thought were made up, some of the some of the details that I heard about that film. And I was yeah. like, no, that's not real. Um, and I didn't want to have anything to do with that stuff. Yeah. And that's why I like superheroes because they win when they fight the monsters. Right, yes. And my monsters like were friendly monsters. The ones I drew were my monsters. And so if the one the monsters I did like as a kid were man thing. Right. Because you could imagine that he yeah. wasn't a bad guy. Yeah. If you were a jerk, Man Thing was not gonna be on your side. 
So yeah, he burned things, but they weren't like he was trying to burn them. It was almost self inflicted by the bad person that was exactly. afraid of him. Your fears are what are going to hurt you. That's right. Yeah, so much him. Yes, right. And he just wanted to be left alone. And I understood that sort of the the um the monster that's just going to want so, to be left alone. So like alone. the '70s Marvel monsters were fun comics that you were reading. Not the magazines, but um, like not Gra- – I couldn't understand why I, I d- wasn't interested in Dracula. Interesting. Or Frankenstein because I didn't really understand – because, you know, he was a bad guy. So why yeah. would I read that comic? Right. What a werewolf the by artwork's n- amazing. Werewolf by Night? Uh, yeah. A little bit of Werewolf by Night. Uh-huh. Man Wolf. Uh, like I said, Man Thing. Son of Satan. Big fan of Son of Satan. Yeah. Uh, Ghost Rider. It's in 1974. Huh. Yeah. I'm eight years old. Kill Raven in War of the Worlds. Oh, yeah. Which right. – yeah, Don those McGregor, are yeah. hardcore books. Yeah, they are. I mean, my mom took a look at one issue and went, "What is going on yes. in this comic?" I go, yes, I just like that he has a serpent stallion. Right. <laughs> yeah, thongs and aliens, and it's all very you know Pink dystopian reptile horse things. You're yeah, right. yeah. It's fantasy and science fiction. And then the other book that was huge, again, probably not appropriate for an eight year old, was Deathlock the Demolisher. Rich that Butler. Book, I remember they were like advertising it in the you know the bullpen page or whatever. And I couldn't wait to get that. And I remember we went on a camping trip that summer and we went into this uh, little general store up in the mountains um, in a town called Gray Eagle on the way to our camping ground that we would go to every year. It's the first time I'd read comics. It was in the comics, so I'd never looked. But I go in the general store and I see there are a few – it's a smattering of comics with the magazines in yeah. the store. Uh-huh. But really there's basically one comic book there sitting basically by itself. And it's and it was like it was there for me. And I got that book and, and that was – you know, everyone was having their doing their camping thing, and I was just like immersed in that world. Interesting. And uh, yeah, way too young for it, but but, but you like it. But it yeah. spoke to me. Yeah, it yeah. spoke to you. There he you was go. a monster. So, right, he was a he superhero. Was. Yes, it was a very dangerous. You know, yeah. weird time, just like Kill Raven's world. Right. You know, I, I guess still want to do a story with those two characters. Yeah. Oh yeah. Martians. I guess in a way, RoboCop is a, a monster too, in a sense. Um, another question I That's have true. is uh, the. What was the first age that you were when you watched your first scary movie then? Um, I remember uh, the Omega Man. So oh, okay. when it came on TV. There you go. 75? 76? Okay. okay. And that gave me nightmares for like a year. Interesting. Uh, really? Okay. The um, Another one was uh, – I remember when the trilogy of terror came on TV uh, with Karen Black and the three yeah. stories and the, yeah. the little headhunter doll. Uh-huh. And I couldn't watch that. I had, went and took a bath. Yeah. While that was on TV, and then my mom tried to tell me about it later. I said, "Don't tell me. I don't want to hear about That's it. So I don't want to watch it because I couldn't. I just couldn't wrap my head around this little tiki doll hunting you at night. Said, that was already <laughs> going on. In my right. Head, That's you know, true. So now, um, American illustrators, classic illustrators, the painters, because mm-hmm. you're a painter, so that adds another dimension of influence. And I've heard some uh, mention that you were inspired by illustrators like Dean Cornwall, Gustav Klimt. Sure. Gil Elvgren, Frazetta, you mentioned, yeah. N.C. Wyeth, John Singer Sargent. There's so many, yeah. 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 Tell, how did you get, start getting involved in those kind of visuals? Like, when did they start making their imprint? Well, I think when it comes to illust- illustration, yeah, which I consider all of this illustration, comics. Right, sure. It began with children's books. So yeah. My mom took us to the library a lot. We had a school library. I was a pretty avid reader, very young. Um, so... Illustrated children's books was was a big deal for me. So uh, some of the illustrators that um, were my favorites were Mercer Mayer, Wallace Tripp, Marie Sendak, um, and mm. Bill Pete. And Bill Pete's a guy a lot of people don't know about, but he was an, he was a story man, an animation guy at uh, at Disney for years. He worked right. on so many so many different uh, films, going early on all the way up to um, Hundred One Dalmatians. Mm-hmm. And Pete became a children's book illustrator after he left Disney. He did at least 40 books or in his after that over the next, you know, several decades. And I remember uh I was in kindergarten when they I was introduced to his work, a book called The Wump World. And if you haven't seen Bell Pete's stuff or his books and you have kids, or even if you have kids, check it out cuz he was amazing. Mm-hmm. Very animated style, pen and ink with colored pencil. Yeah. And um Always, you know, like you can find it in hardcover here and there, but most of these things just like a series of paperbacks. And I have them all now, but huge for me um, because it had a Disney feel to it, but it also had like animals and fantasy characters yes. and trolls and, and dragons right. and creatures and, and farms and circuses. And just he drew everything and he did everything so well and everything was so alive. 
And so I think when I saw comics, I there was that sort of Disney, but then Bill Pete and even Mercer Mayer, because there even Wall Strip, you there's they I'm sure they all read comics when they were younger. Um, so that was the that stuff is still with me. Then you then you get into comics and and then later you're in like going into high school and it's heavy metal magazine. So you're being there you ex- exposed to like Mobius and even you know William Stout, which more because of his dinosaur book coming out. Right. And then discovering, well, he did us other stuff. And then uh, Epic Magazine number one comes uh-huh. out when there I was in go. high school. Frazetta did the cover. I don't think that was the first time I'd seen Frazetta's work, but I started to really pay attention yes. to the guy. Um, How about like the Warren magazines? Were those... The Warren magazines came a little later in high school because I started getting into Bernie's stuff. There you go. Get into Bernie Wrightson and, and trying to figure out where he came from. So right. then it's Swamp Thing and then all the Warren stuff and Creepy and I'm looking at that. And then you're discovering all those other artists that were in there. Uh, Jack Davis. I'm like, wait a minute. Jack Davis was drawing monster comics? Yeah. That's so cool. I didn't yeah. know that. And he know? did like movie posters, all sorts of well, stuff. Well, you, you, you knew Jack Davis. In the 70s, if you were coming into Jack Davis in the 70s, it was because of all his commercial stuff. TV yeah. Guide covers, right. magazine. Right. And then you see that he had this whole illustrious career as a comic book guy doing all kinds of stuff. And yeah. he was like blown and the away. easy comics. Yeah. But Frazetta was huge uh, back then. Bernie. Um, I mean, there's so many others that I'm just, you know, blanking on. But, uh, uh-huh. Uh-huh. but those two, very, very important for me. Uh, the fact that uh, Bill Stout, was doing this pen and ink and, and doing watercolor and doing paintings. And that, that dinosaur book really, really was a huge oh, yeah, um, beautiful. influence on oh, me yeah. um, as far as in terms of color and what you could do. Uh, and it, the the Golden Age Illustrators, that's more art school. You get into art school. There you go. It's 1986. And, and, and you went to the California College of the Arts and the Academy of Art College in San Francisco. Yeah. So I first went, we called, it was CCAC back then. So it was called California College of Arts and Crafts. They dropped the crafts part uh, when I'm 20 years ago or something. Uh-huh. Um, so, yeah. So, I, so I'm going to school in Oakland, CCAC. And I haven't even been there like a week. And I'm already sort of like, I kind of knew about N.C. Wyeth, but I'm getting more into that. There you go. And someone said, oh, you, you checked out Dean Cornwell? No, who's well, Dean Cornwell? Oh, yeah, yeah, the Dean of Illustration. And then you're like, okay. And that's that stuff starts to, you know, Start to jump out at you. Yeah. And I remember I was also in a bookstore in Berkeley in my first year of school. And I found these two oversized hardcovers with the, the name, what looked like Clay, mm-hmm. K-L-E-Y. It's mm-hmm. Cly. Mm-hmm. The two Cly books that were huge when they first came out in the mm-hmm. States. And so I got those for like 15 bucks each. And I remember going through all those painting drawings, just like, whoa. And then you start to realize, oh, I bet Frazetta saw these. And obviously, Fanta- you know, that the one sequence in Fantasia is definitely, you know, client influenced. And uh, so all these things start to, to kind of bubble up when you're in art school. You're, you're exposed to all these new um, illustrators and, and styles. And, and so I'm also taking classes in drawing and painting and taking illustration classes. So I'm painting, I'm learning how to paint. I'm learning how to, uh, to use watercolor in a way I never used it in high school. Cause in high school I was just coloring stuff in with my watercolor set. Yeah. Didn't really understand painting right. quite uh, yet, but sitting outside with a model or sitting in painting a landscape yeah. and you have 20 minutes to do it or, or a certain amount of time to do it before the light and the shadows change. That was an eye-opening thing to to draw from the figure for the first time and have a minute or two minutes or five minutes to, to capture something, and I took to that like a you know I just took to it. It was it was not um, a hard transition to do that, and I loved it. It was like being set free to draw uh, from the figure in life drawing classes. Um, and I remember there were um, times when people would say, "Hey, did you see the Frisetta girl who was our model today?" <laughs> that was a thing that people would say. That's great. No yeah. one ever said, did you see the, you know, the Dean Cornwell girl? They always said, there's a Frazetta girl. There's a Frazetta girl here. Yeah. yeah right. Um, but uh, yeah, that was, uh, and Frazetta, you know, Frazetta is ubiquitous. So he's everywhere. I mean, the first time I ever walked near a, con- a, a an art school, a guy was walking out of the, uh, the, the Academy of Art College. This is before I was even in art school. I think I was still in high school. Yeah. Visiting with a friend. This guy comes walking. He's this big drawing under his arm and I'm noticing <laughs> the drawing is made up of all these rips of like Frazetta figures, which I recognize instantly because I had all those books in high school. Uh-huh. I was like, Oh my God, this guy's in art school. And he's ripping off Frazetta. This is snap. 
This is going to be easy. <laughs> I thought they were all like, you know, you know what I mean? You, yeah. you think that everyone's supposed to be doing like original work, which people were doing, but, uh-huh. Uh-huh. but it was just, it's hard to get those influences. But then, um, and for like, head. for like assignments, basically they were doing that. I, I mean, I hope he wasn't trying to pass off Rosetta for an assignment, this guy. But I never saw that when I was in class. I never saw someone try and pass off Rosetta. I see. But when yeah. I saw that, I had to laugh. Because, like, that guy's he – he was definitely too old to be in high school. But that was a definite high school move. Yeah, yeah. You know? I actually had a friend, one of my best friends in, in high school, who was who hung out in the art room with me. He had this little, like, uh, like the Academy sketch pad you can get at the store with the picture of the hand drawing with a pencil. And um, that paper that I just, it's its good, it's good, it's a good tooth for pencil drawings. He would take, um, he would fill every page of his pad with uh, pencil kind of um, studies of, I call them studies, but he was swiping for Zeta paintings and, and he was drawing them and he was, but they're studies, you know, that's kind of how you learn to draw, uh, one way to learn. And I remember uh, he would take a lot of the credit because girls would come up and go, did you draw that? Yes, I did. And I go, isn't that from the Death Dealer painting? <laughs> Yeah. And he'd go, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't help it. Yeah, you knew. I was such a jerk. Yeah. But, um, yeah, but we, you know, that was our mutual, that was how we became friends, our mutual love of, uh, of Frazetta and of comics. Frazetta. Yeah. Because there was a time when I, there were times in my life when I would stop reading comics and go back to them. And when I was in high school, Derek and I would sometimes walk on our, our lunch break down to this comic shop in Modesto called Bonanza Books and Comics. Yeah. And uh, we would we would ask uh, Terry, the kid working there, his parents own the place. And uh, we'd say, can we look at the Frazetta portfolios today? And he'd, yeah, he'd pull them out and let us look through them. And go, wow, he signed it. That's his, that's his, his autograph. Yeah. I have all those now, but back then they were like, you know, it was like way out of your reach, you know, a hundred bucks a pop or something. Uh-huh. It's just an impossible dream. Oh, yeah. But, to finalize a quick point that I'm curious about, mm-hmm. we've talked about these different influences, whether they're comics, you know, or movies or illustrators, you know, the, the degree of learning you did uh, in your more college phase. But um, location, does being more of a West Coast person create a different visual sentiment than being an East Coast person? And I'm wondering that more from your perspective. I can imagine it. I think it has to because has I think to. De- depending on and de- no matter where you were brought up, um, your you know the surroundings and the place that where you where you have lived your life, those those things have to make it into your work somehow. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, I mean, maybe not for everybody, but I mean, if you're drawing if you're drawing a, a story that's set in Metropolis, you're going to try and and make it Metropolis. But I remember. When I was doing stories, whether Gotham or Metropolis or wherever I was set, I was trying to um, – something Mike Mignola said to me when I was still in art school and I met him. He was obviously a you know, working professional and he said, when you're drawing buildings, don't just make them a bunch of lines. They're not just a bunch of vertical and horizontal lines. They're buildings. Yeah. They're architecture. Uh-huh. And I took that to heart and started to really pay more attention to the fact that I, I liked architecture. I liked looking at buildings. My parents had an appreciation for that stuff. When I was a kid, we used to take us on these drives and stuff. Look at that old Victorian house. And um, so I, when I, anywhere I would go, I would take pictures. I mean, when I was in the offices of, of DC, they took me up to this one office that had this beautiful view of penthouse apartments along. Right. So I took a bunch of pictures and I used those in my stories. And, um, when I when I was in San Francisco as a student, I was taking pictures all the time, and and when I was in Glasgow, uh, you know, taking pictures of the architecture mm-hmm. and wanting to work it into man, because Glasgow is, looks like Gotham City. Mm. I was like, this is Gotham City. This right. is perfect, you know. And before he was even doing um a Batman story, I had all this stuff aligned. So, but when it comes to um your surroundings, you know, living in like California. Yeah, you're definitely, I think, going to have an aesthetic that is that's different from someone who grew up in, um, you know, in, in Brooklyn or something. Right. And so much of the comic stuff, you know, that you accept that Marvel, the Marvel Comics world is kind of an East Coast world. You yeah. Know? Right. So many of the stories take place there, and it becomes this sort of the fabled land of of Manhattan, and you know, and even though you don't, I don't know anything about it, I, I had a feeling for you know this. Oh, Daredevil's in Hell's Kitchen, and you know. Uh, but I really, I really wanted to um, capture something about where I came from in some of my stories. Like with Nocturnals, I imagine um, 
the town and the surroundings where that takes place is definitely California. Right, right. Very clearly California. And Giant Killer, right? Had, it was West Coast, wasn't that? Um, Giant Killer takes place in the Mount Diablo Valley, which is San Ramon's in the Mount Diablo Valley. That's what Valley. I mean. So yeah. That's my old stomping grounds. You grew up in the shadow of, yeah. of Mount Diablo. And, and I felt that very much. I was like, this feels like a West Coast oh, yeah. kind of thing. And then also there is that Asian influence with like the samurai swords and stuff. And yeah. I just thought, wow, this this feels West Coast. And, and, and that's, that's what I mean true. is, and there is an expanse of like exploring this large area of land and what monster is around mm. the corner mm. whereas in the new york marvel stuff it's all very crowded like there's cars and buildings yeah and there's dr octopus it's and like spidey that's... can barely find room to do anything right? yeah so it's like yeah. there was a it's different a corridor of a... buildings that they're fighting yeah, yeah. Just like in and that it's scene all very in narrow yeah in the last scene in the avengers they're right. just fighting these corridor of buildings yes and um and that I had narrowness this... right that feels yeah. east coast yeah, yeah for sure uh, no definitely because even in stories <clears throat> like you watch a lot of movies that take place in San Francisco now, like Godzilla and whatnot, um, and they don't have that necessarily that up and down vertical building yeah. corridor feel necessarily. Right. You right. know, they, they'll, they'll throw the action over on the the Golden Gate Bridge and things like that. And so when I was doing Giant Killer in the late '90s, um, I kept it in the the the, the territory around the volcano which is mount diablo which is not a volcano by the way but when we were kids we were told it was a dormant volcano uh, it's not i found that out when i went to mount diablo to shoot a bunch of reference for the story i we ran into a, a friend was with me and we ran into um a park ranger and and she wanted to know if we were taking <laughs> pictures the, to sell for postcards give you the no, lowdown no, no. yeah i said i'm doing a comic set here and then I asked her, and she goes, oh, no. Um, she goes, Vol- volcanic um, activity formed the mountain, but it's not a volcano. Right, right. I was like, okay, well, in my story, it'll be a volcano. <laughs> um, and, and who knows? Maybe yeah, it'll be one one day. Went all the way to the top, and yeah. I'd been there before and took pictures and imagined the final scene and how it would take place. Uh-huh. And I could sort of like map out some things. And that was amazing to be able to – it's like going to location, finding a location yeah, for you. Yeah. And I had friends when they found out what I was doing. They said, can you can you like destroy my old high school? <laughs> you know, everyone wanted things destroyed yeah. from their life, which was hilarious. Well, that's what uh, happened in the New Universe, right? John Byrne destroyed Jim Shooter's town Pittsburgh in, <laughs> in New Universe, right? Oh so yeah. I guess this is what yeah. happens. You know, now you're starting to become a professional in the late '80s in comics, and you're working for Eclipse. Is that that's was that your entry? That merchant, was my first, yeah, my Merchants first, of Death, mm-hmm. uh, number one. They were the first publisher to hire me, and they're, they're a California company, and they were based in California. Yeah, for, yeah that's what I was going to so. say. Right. Yeah, even though Cat and Dean, who ran the company, husband and wife, uh, were f- New York people, right? And they had that sort of New York sensibility, but also kind of a little hippieish sensibility. There you, know? you go, yeah. Kind of San Francisco, and they were living in California at the time. Uh, yeah, the it was Guerneville, and then it was Forestville, which is yeah, kind of Santa, right. near Santa Rosa. Which it says it on the indices of that comic. Yeah, yeah. I I did a short job for them, a penciling job uh, that was gonna go was gonna go nowhere. I I mean, I, the stuff came out, and and I was told. Uh, by the editor had hired me that that they were mildly unimpressed with my work. That was okay, the term there you go. I'll never forget. But it was penciling. It wasn't painting. It was penciling. I was penciling and I was yeah. inked by Rich Howell. There you go. And it was a backup story in a um, – so it was a uh, four-issue or maybe – I think it was four issues. It might have been six uh, – magazine uh, called Merchants of Death. And it was um, Breccia uh, – reprints of Breccia's That's mercenary right. stories. That's right. And so Kurt Busiak, a young – yeah, newcomer he, he wrote time. that story. You he did. wrote the Ransom a character called Ransom, backup, and, and that was uh, Lost Causes. That's right. That's right. Mr. Lost Mr. Causes, chapter guy. one through four. <laughs> that's right. In so Merchants of Death, one through yeah. four. Um, yeah. Je- Alex Toth did the last cover, uh-huh. and which is really cool. Um, and they and he the character was described as a kind of a mercenary who will do a job. He doesn't get paid. He just takes whatever booty or treasure there is to take along the way. Right. And he's described by Kurt as looking like Sam Shepard. So okay. I dove into Sam Shepard. Did you guys talk on the phone at all about it? Did you just get a I script? How that work? I do not think we talked on the phone. I think I just worked from a script. You got the script. And I penciled the first issue in my grandmother's my grandmother's kitchen table because mm-hmm. I was I got the job just as uh, art school for that semester was ending and so I spent a week at my grandma because my grandmother lived not too far from where I was in Walnut Creek and I sat and I drew the whole thing on her kitchen table and the, the first uh, I guess it was six pages yeah and yeah I went right. home and finished it that summer this is like anthology 
you know, comics, right? Basically, and each each one is a different little yeah, story. Yeah, yeah, and mm-hmm. that's what each and you, you did one sub story. They wanted that one comic. backup that was new material. Yeah, right. uh, which and um, and I was that was all new to me, you know, uh, <clears throat> and but it was great because I was and I they put me through the paces. I was drawing horses. Yeah, I was drawing uh, Romanians. I was just drawing, you know, whatever. <laughs> Romanians was, you know, and horses. Horse, Romanians yeah. and horses, and this and that and the other thing, right. and, and you know, battle scenes and stuff. Uh-huh. And it was like um, things I'd never drawn before. Yeah, a little more in the, in the realism aspect of things. Very right? much adventure kind yeah, of. Yeah, adventure, right? Yeah, almost kind of a um, very European sort of feel. To yes, it. that's right. And yeah. Kurt was Kurt's stuff was very easy to work from. Mm-hmm. He had what it, he had the good chops. I mean, even even then, it's a well, kind were of his scripts writer. kind of pretty visual? Like you could visualize it pretty well then. From the I, way he I had no, I have no, no recollection of anything that was difficult or uh, hard to understand. It was it was very very straightforward and very easy to work from. Nice. So I feel like uh-huh. I was almost maybe a little bit spoiled, and um, because it, there were no difficulties. Like maybe I might have had later on with some other writers or something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, not necessarily difficulties, but. Uh, you get a script sometime and you don't quite follow you have a harder time maybe visualizing things but for the most part comic book scripts are not you know that hard to suss out and i think one of the things is with writers is that some writers are much more uh visually oriented and um and really understand that like you know you can't have two different things happening on the panel and some writers will describe things i think it's writers who are new you know, maybe a little greener. They'll describe more than one thing happening in a panel, and you're mm. like, "No, I have to break that up. I can't yeah. have the guy pick something up and sit down." <laughs> Occasionally, you get All that. The flash, the flash can do that. Sure, you just draw yeah. him five times. Yeah, yeah, Gene could would draw that. You know, right, right. Um, uh, but uh, you know, just little things like that. But there was never no. There, I remember there were some scripts I got early on in some other jobs where uh, I would read the stuff to my friends out loud, and we would all laugh. Yeah. And go, what the hell is this? You know, but then I just do my best to <laughs> to make it happen. Yeah, to make it to make it happen. And um, tell me if I'm wrong. You turned the art in on time. They wanted to use you again for the Black Terror Limited. They series. didn't want to use me again. They were pretty much done with me. I remember I showed up as my second time in San Diego. I'm still in art school. I go there uh, with a couple of my art school buddies, and who wanted to do comics and yeah. everything, and. Uh, I'm sitting in the Eclipse booth and I'm talking with Fred Burke, who's the editor, and he's telling me that they were mildly unimpressed. And mildly I'm unimpressed. Mildly okay. unimpressed with the job I had done, and it didn't seem like I was going to be offered any work. Now, Fred knew, had seen my color samples from my work in, in, yeah. in art school. There you go. So I remember the same day, it was probably this Friday of, of Comic-Con, the second day, I meet uh, Dave McKean. George Pratt, Kent Williams, and Jay Moose are all sitting in a row in Artist Alley. Back mm-hmm. then, Comic Con was three rooms: a big hallway, and then two rooms: a dealer's room and an artist room. That was it. And this is 1989. This is 88. I think. 88. Okay. 88. So I meet them. They're working on various things. Their pages are huge. They're all painted. Jay Moose is showing his. Uh, he's working on. Um, He's working on a thing with Kent. Kent had blood pages there. Jay had moon uh, moon shadow pages there. Dave McKean was working on uh, Black Orchid, so he had some of those there pages there. Yeah. George Pratt was working on Enemy A, so he had some of those. And I was just blown away. And I remember asking Kent Williams, I said, so you're doing all these paintings on one big board. Right. What if you screw something up? What if you screw one up? Because I just work on it until you, you know, you paint over the. You the just error. keep working on it until it's. And I go, well, what if you can't fix it? This is the insecure art. You know, yes, art student interesting. Here. He goes, oh, you just gotta let it go then. And I was like, wow, you just gotta let it go. <laughs> How do you do that? And I remember thinking, this is really what I want to be doing. I want to be doing what they're doing. Eclipse doesn't want me. The next day, my friend, we all get up to go down to the show. And I say, I'll meet you down there. Yeah. And I was so depressed and dejected that I called the airline. I got a flight home that day. I wrote those guys a note and I flew home. Wow. Okay. So depressed and told my parents, you know, because I was, when I, you know, when I wasn't in art school, I would go home and for the summer and with my folks back home. And uh, so I go back to school. I'm in this class with Kazuhiko Sano, who's um, an, a very well-known illustrator. He, he, he painted the, uh, the, Return of the Jedi movie posters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, book covers, you know, uh-huh, um, uh-huh. 
Spencer for Hire book covers. Oh, he did really? everything. He was a, he was a working, very uh, busy great. working illustrator, right, not in go. comics. Right, right. Movies, books, uh-huh. whatever publishing, whole, whatever, editorial. What yeah, have you, you, yeah. you? Yeah. Amazing artist. I wish there was a book of his stuff out there. You can find it here and there on the internet, but amazing artist. Um, he was our teacher for that semester. And that was the beginning of what would be my last year in art school, my fourth year in art school. Okay. So illustration four was what it was called. And one of the things that he had us do was a semester long assignment that we work on on our own, yeah. a personal assignment, whatever we wanted to do, work on it on the weekends. And at the end of the semester, you'll bring it in. So I thought, well, this is my chance to do a painted comic book story. So I had been told by Fred and um, Bo Smith, who was a sales guy for Eclipse, who lived in Virginia, uh, that they wanted to um, revamp this Golden Age character called the Black Terror. Black Terror, and right. And so I looked at the Black Terror and I thought, maybe I can make him into something. Because they told me they kind of wanted to do something like the Punisher with him. So I did this story with the Black Terror. I redesigned his look. Uh, and I had him fighting vampires in the sewers because that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. And it was just something that I thought in the back of my mind that maybe I could have these show pages. So by the time this, the first semester was over, it was December, I had about seven pages done. And I would bring them in every week when I had them done and show the teacher and show other you know, friends and people at school. And I got a lot of good feedback on them. And I was – they're acrylic and watercolor and I, and I got my brother and my friends and some other people together and I would shoot some reference and throw that together. And um, that ended up being the first seven pages of the Black Terror number one. Oh, OK. There you go. Fred saw the stuff. He said, can I take these and show them to Cat and Dean? And it was sometime before Christmas. I go, yeah, sure. And then like two weeks later, he calls me up and he goes, they want this done yesterday. Oh, okay. I go, what? He goes, yeah, they're going to do it. They're they green with the book. I see. And Bud, Bud, uh, Bo had been trying to get the Black Terror going for a long time. So Fred was the editor. Bo Smith and Chuck Dixon wrote the, the script. And I was doing the art. And I'm still in art school in my last semester. And the weird thing was, here I am working as a professional in comics, getting paid – a rate that nothing like you're getting paid is when you're just a working for part time guy right, at sure. the movie theater where I worked, and um, in co- in 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 school they're trying to teach us and raise us to be these uh, mold us to be these like editorial illustrators, and none of my stuff really fit that mold. And I remember I was in the um, I had you, there was an illustration show they do for third year illustration students. So even though I was in my fourth year of art school because of the transfer, yeah, I was still thir- considered third year third year illustration. So they did this spring show that was a juried show. So you didn't just get in what you put in; you had to be chosen by a j- judging panel. And I put in some pieces I had done. A lot of the stuff was my personal stuff or things I liked that I thought were me. Yes, none of it got accepted into the spring show. I didn't have a single piece in the spring show. Yeah. I was really upset. And I had teachers who said, why didn't you put in that painting of the homeless guy? You did, you did this painting of a homeless guy sleeping in a doorway and he's wearing like a come to California shirt. Uh-huh. This is something I'd done for an assignment an hour before class, literally. And I said, that's something I did an hour before class. That's not indicative of what I can do or who I right. am. I said, well, that's the kind of stuff they're looking for. I see. Content wise. And they all could have picked something to put in. Yeah. It, they were thinking about other things. It wasn't about my career. They were thinking about. it was about their, it was about representing their school and what they're about. Yes. And comics were not what they were about. So I had friends and teachers that were all very sympathetic. They couldn't understand. And I was like, oh, I don't care. I'm done with this place. I don't need them. I have a job. I have a job. Now. Right. I'm working on this comic. Yeah. And so I left school. And um, did you, you finish know, the school? I did four years of art school and then I left. So I no, I didn't get a degree. Okay. And I had a portfolio. Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing is you can get a degree in a bachelor you get a bachelor of fine arts, you can get a degree in illustration or whatever it is, but it's the portfolio that gets you the work. That's right. It's not the degree. That's totally and I already had the work. Yes. So by the time I was nineteen ninety, while I was working on Black Terror, I'd already lined up the psycho. Right. So I think by the time I was done with high school or not high school, with art school, I think I was already about to be working on the Psycho with DC Comics the following year when I finished Black Terror. So I was mm-hmm. well on my way. Yeah. And so it was okay. I, I was I was all right with that, you know. So when Black Terror number one comes out at the end of 89, I get some copies 
And in January, I mail a copy to um, the head of the School of Illustration, Barbara Bradley, who's yes. an old school uh, illustrator who is very talented. And uh, she created the Dole Pineapple Kids. And okay. <clears throat> she was not a fan of comics. She liked Bill Sienkiewicz's work, not a fan of comics. Mm. I remember trying to show her Kevin Nolan stuff and just like, look at Kevin Nolan. Yeah. She's like, oh, this coloring. I was like, really? What? His coloring oh, is great. Yeah. Didn't, didn't get it. Didn't I understand see. it. Thought it was junk. Thought that was a, a waste of someone's talents. That's crazy. Okay. It is crazy. Now, what's, what's really cool, though, is I send in Black Terror number one, this fully painted comic. I send it to her, and, and I wrote a little note saying, this is what I was working on. This is what I want to do. I still feel like I have a lot to work to, to learn, and I, I do want to come back to school one day. And uh, here it is. And so uh, nothing, you know, like don't hear anything for a while. And then it's just before Christmas, that December, that I, there's a call on my, my, you know, on my answer machine. And it's Barbara Bradley calling me, which she didn't call students. She calls and she leaves a message yeah. saying, it looks beautiful. I get what you were trying to do. It's wonderful. I don't think you need to come back. I think you're well on your way. Good luck. Oh, okay. I mean, very nice. She Wish did you not the very have best. To do that. And, what, and, and, it, and I heard from people who were still going to school that they took the book and they they tied a string to it and they pinned it up in the, the main floor of the illustration yeah. classes. So everyone – with the little explanation of who had done it and what oh, it was. Cool. So everyone could flip through it and look through it. Yeah, amazing. It was a few years after that that they started a um, a comic book department, a comic book – So you classes. may have opened their eyes up to there that were, as an art form. There were a couple of others. Like John Estes was a, a fellow who was doing comics, got into comics around the same time. Um, and there were a few other people and it, it started to become more of this sort of scene thing. And then, and then you had like Baron Story, who right. was teaching at the school, had, he knew some of these guys. Yeah. So his connection to, uh, cause he worked when he was teaching at, um, at Pratt uh -huh. back east, uh -huh. he had a connection to like Bill Sienkiewicz and yes. Kent Williams. Not necessarily that they were, they were students of his. I think Kent was, but not Bill. He knew of these guys and he, he was, they were kind of, they were, those guys were always in the upper echelon of painted guys. I never got into that echelon. Mm hmm. Um, which, which is fine. Cause I always feel like I, I always felt like I did my own thing, you know? Um, and, uh, because of that, that helped create more of a, um, uh, a more friendlier attitude toward comics and that there was this, uh, this segment of illustration where you could get work Yeah, because painted comics became huge then. Yeah, they did. Anyone and who could hold a brush, they were going to hire to do a book. So yeah, right. There you go. And that, that obviously helped then. There was a demand. There, there created then a demand for it. There were too many painted books, and not all of them were great. Uh -huh. One of my classmates ended up doing a couple of things for for DC, for Marvel. Yeah, uh, that were painted that were very beautiful, but he didn't have the. I think they some of the stuff lacked the um, the love of the medium. I see. Um, the love. That's an interesting point. Um, yeah, because I guess you you could argue that the Marvels, you know, by Alex Ross, you could feel like a certain love toward that. Oh, definitely. Six, to the sixties Marvel in is, that is yeah. is highly realistic, is highly detailed, as illustrative as it is. It has deep roots of love in yeah. comics, and not all the painted stuff did. And some stuff it was it just it lacked that. You know that. Like that, how to draw Marvel comics. Yeah. It's not yeah. just drawing like John Buscema. It's this feeling that you have. That's right. And I, I'm not saying I had it in my stuff, but I tried to put something in right. there that was of comics. A that, certain that's kinetic. Going past something. reality to a certain point. Yes. Um, that's and, interesting to transcend the reality of it a little I bit. I always felt like the way I, when I would talk with Alex, or when we talk, I would say, you're trying to conform comics to reality, what's in your head to yeah. reality. Right. And I'm trying to conform reality to what's in my head there you go so it comes out looking this way and yours comes out looking that that's way. really interesting i always felt like if i if i was trying too hard to be photorealistic or ultra realistic it would lose something yeah there's something of that um and that right. i think that might go back to um just you know obviously being a comic fan looking at gene's style and, right. and everyone had a specific style and gene's work in particular and jack had this unreality to it gene yeah. pushed everything and, 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 he, and yeah. he exaggerated things much more than john sure but he also had the illustrative uh qualities of john's work that say jack didn't have and that's yeah. why those three for me are so important right because they all have they, this they, they have a different aspect of, oh, of a yeah. similar thing and you need to go out from there to other artists yeah. obviously you know it's and that's interesting and that's where the stylized versus non-stylized realism 
in comic illustration, right? You have yes. stylized realist- realism, which is like a Neil Adams thing. There's some exaggerations. It transcends a reality. Yeah. You have stylized realism. That's like a Hal Foster, Prince Valiant, where it's all very exact, but maybe it lacks a certain life. Neil's in it. stuff is so interesting because he's not in my triumvirate, but his work is illustrative. Yeah, his the rendering right. of, of form and faces and stuff, and obviously he's you know he's paying attention to life. Yeah. But then he was able to stretch it out in the way that you know yeah. like Jack or Gene or, right. or even John would throw do. some foreshortening yeah. in that, and, uh, um, for sure. And and well, you know, he was a student of Gill's as well. So right. Gill is you know Gill was doing that. Gil, you yeah. see so much of Gill in the way that uh, Neil uh, constructs figures and 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 plays with the space right. in right. there in the way that you know you feel this sense of space. And I think Kirby was almost more in that Milton kind of cartoon realism, which is like a different category where they're using cartoon figures to almost emulate the action. But then there's some something about it that you feel the punch in the face when you look at that yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah, but it wasn't as it yeah. wasn't like a stylized realism like, like you or maybe he really knew how Adams to these other capture. Guys. I mean, what, well, especially when he was working on the Fantastic Four and he started to come into right, this, right, the style that we all yeah. think of. You know, the way that he was able to sort of just like pull you in and that's right. smack you in the face. That's right. You know? There's something about that action science fiction. He's just so perfect. The Fantastic Four stuff. I feel like the Fantastic Four when Kirby was at his height with that book. Yeah. It's the greatest comic. It really is the world's greatest comic. And for, oh, yeah. you know, for the story, I mean, the art, oh, yeah. the character, you know, the character of Ben Grimm alone is such an insanely yeah. great character. Amazing. I mean, the way that the melding of b- those two minds to create that, 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 that guy is perfect. Oh, yeah. For There's sure. There's just no more perfect, uh, character written by those two. You know, and they really did write him. You know, I mean, yeah. it's, oh, it's yeah. definitely a marriage there. It's just, there's nothing better. You know, I go no, back and true. read those and Yeah, I think um yeah, I mean in uh in my thinking as far as the anti hero, the anti superhero, uh I think like E. C. Seeger's Popeye, uh Kirby Lee's thing, and then something about Chris Claremont's version of Wolverine. Yeah. And you yeah. feel like you know these characters, like yeah. you feel like they're real or something. Yeah. Okay, so you also did some work for Eclipse on the ESPers. And I think James Hudnall oh, had yeah. something to do with that. <laughs> then after that, you guys are working on Psycho together at DC. So is that how you met Hudnall? Was it over at Eclipse? Or you guys now join in on the DC thing? Jim approached me in 1990 at WonderCon. So it okay. would have been like, what, eight, March or April of 1990. I was still working on Black Terror. And he saw my work. And it's a big, tall, kind of soft-spoken guy. Um, and... Uh, he really liked what he saw, and at the time, what he have seen, what he would have seen the first two issues of the Black Terror, and I think I had, was finishing up the the last issue. I'd finished the last issue, uh-huh. and he said, uh, I'm, "I got this. You know, I just did this Lex Luthor book at DC, the unauthorized biography of Lex Luthor. Oh yeah, and I got this other pitch in with them that they want to do, but we're looking for an artist, and it's called it's called the Psycho. I go the Psycho." And I'm obviously first thing I think of is the movie and he starts to explain what it's about, about um, a world where um, you can take this drug and if it doesn't kill you, it gives you powers and you become a, a super powered being like a walking, you know, sort of weapon. And, and they're called FCOs, freelance costume operatives. The nickname is psychos. And he goes, I, you know, I think you'd be great for it. And so I look at the pitch, uh, and while that's happening, I, I put together some like uh, color Xeroxes of some pinup paintings I'd done, like Catwoman, Joker, Batman, you know, and some other stuff. Color Xeroxes of acrylic paintings. And Jim sent those to his editor, Mike Carlin. Mike Carlin, yeah. So I forget all about it. A week goes by, two weeks. I get a phone call one afternoon, and it's Mike Carlin. And he's in his office with Andy Helfer. Andy Helfer happens to be in there. Yeah. Looking at my stuff. And, you know, they worked on the Superboy TV show together, those two. Carlin and Helfer. Okay. Oh, they were definitely, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so they're just, like, really excited to look at my stuff and, and definitely want me to do the Psycho. And I remember at one point uh, he goes, yeah, Helfer, Helfer wants you to do a, a Justice League graphic novel. He's not doing a Justice League graphic novel. He's doing my thing first. Then he can do your thing. Yeah. I never did do the Justice League graphic novel with Helfer, but uh, but um, it was like 
these two guys who are comic book editors are like, they want to hire me? Yeah. DC Comics? It was just insane. Yeah, that is great. And the funny thing was, is again, Mignola tells me later that he was in the offices when this stuff gets opened up and they're looking at it. And, um, you know, I met Mike a few times in, um, because he'd gone to CC agency as well, but that was, you know, after I'd been there, but, uh, he said, uh, they were looking at all this stuff and, and he's like, wow, who, who's this guy? And, and he looks at the name and he goes, and it hits me bong. Hey, I know this guy. <laughs> like he remembered me, you know, this, this, just this student that he had met and, uh, that was just like amazing that just at this sort of full circle thing. And, and you're dealing with these guys who are in New York. It's not the same time frame as where you're at. It's yeah. three hours ahead. Uh-huh. They're at the end of their your their day. And, and you're like, wow, I'm talking to two guys in New York who want to hire me. And then that's when you start to feel connected to that that place that you dreamed about when you were a kid. That, 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 you know, far away Manhattan and all the stuff that's going on. You know, because that's where the superheroes are. You know, that's where all these things are happening. They're making the comics, and that's when you really start to feel like you you've you've entered into this the real world of comics, right? You know, of course, because working for a California company is great, obviously. Yeah, but now I'm with you know, yeah, the big two, one the of the Manhattan, yeah, the Manhattan people. Yeah, there you yeah. go. So yeah. um, so Jim and I, so Jim and I start uh, kind this of. This sounds very around. much like the Jeffersons. Right? <laughs> yeah, moving on up. Moving on up. Yeah. So Jim and I become friends. Um. He's kind of an odd duck, but that's for another time. But uh, interesting guy, knew a lot of things, had worked for Eclipse. Uh, he was um, he made uh, his money uh, as like a computer um, sort of got come in and put all your computer system oh, really? together. Oh, and he move was on. Okay. And, and he actually financed uh, Espers or ESPers. Ah, okay. Uh, he, he wanted to do it with them and they weren't going to put the money up, but he put the money up. Hired yeah. the artist he wanted. There you go. I could have helped put him on the map. Then he pitched up. Uh, Lex Luthor book to, to DC and and he was very ambitious and he thought the psycho was going to be like the next Watchmen and I said please don't say that let's just right. do our own thing and just enjoy what we're doing and let's not try and be the next anything try you know, to ride too much the wave pressure. of that yeah. it's silly no one's going to well, do well because in the late uh, 80s and early 90s there was very much of uh, the realism of superheroes yeah. and yeah. superheroes being in the real world and how would that be and what's the modern take on that and i understand that and um, uh, i loved Watchmen; it's still one of my favorites yeah right? and even the legends of dark knights has that feel to it right i remember there was a british comic called the new statesman that was very watchman like um uh there's a lot of that stuff that was very big deal for a while it was. so we're doing yeah. this thing that's that's like again what would it be like to have super powered individuals in a world where there's terrorism and there's espionage and all stuff. And that's very much in, in James's wheelhouse. So James was thinking that this main character, the psycho would be uh, this techno ninja who would have all this sort of body armor and stuff. And that he would wear a, 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 like a helmet that had like a mirror image mask. So when right. you were looking at him, you were looking at your face and that's really spooky and stuff. And I just thought, you know, I want to make this guy look like a psycho. Love it. I come up with this guy. Mm-hmm. This crazy, creepy, scary, yeah, weird guy it. who's wearing all this <laughs> strange, like, overcoat, and he's got a gun, and he's got claws, and something that um, I think there might even be a drawing in there. My first drawing of something that doesn't even look like anything like a superhero. It looks mm-hmm. like uh, some deranged right. guy in an alley. And uh, Jim liked that idea that he was almost scary. Mm-hmm. Those are, yeah, the th- and the three bad guys in the first issue and make it on the cover, which another, which kind of another interesting thing you can do if no one knows your character, you can just put whatever on the cover. Right. Um, so I think he's only, on, the psycho is only on the second cover. The other ones are, are some of the more colorful villains that, that I got to sort of design. And I had a lot of, um, I had a lot of freedom from Jim to kind of go in different directions. I was creating like a world of superheroes. So I get to name them, get their powers, what they look like. There were, you know, Jim had his, his, um, directions here and there. Right. Did you but guys talk on the phone a lot during Oh, that? yeah. We became friends and uh, there were a lot of shows we were going to and we'd hang out and stuff. I remember calling him up one time. At, I was at the very end, the last final confrontation and I said, you know, I call him up and it's like one in the morning. I said, Jim, he's killed everyone he's come up against. Could we just maybe do one fight where he doesn't kill the guy? Yeah. And maybe if we are going to do, you know, a follow up, at least one character could come back. Who wasn't killed? And he goes, uh, what did I write? I go, yeah, you have him killing this guy. And he goes, I just want to, you know, not kill him. I want him to realize that he's outmatched and he 
go, he runs away yeah. to find uh-huh. him another day. And uh-huh. he goes, okay, we can do that. And, uh, but he was, you know, he was, he was pretty easy going on that kind of thing. And, and, and DC dug it. They, they put a lot behind it. They did uh, some variant covers with, uh, different colored fluorescent because I was using fluorescent, um, some actual fluorescent paints that don't, they don't print fluorescent, but they're still very bright. So this bright pinkish red that's yes, in there and some love greens it, yeah. and stuff. And that was something that people, I guess, hadn't seen too much of then. I don't know, but they made a big deal out of it. And they did these different colored logos and they're sort of like three or four variants and stuff. And the book did okay. And I think I was nominated for, I don't know if it was my first Eisner nomination or if it was some other comic book well, I saw that, that you got like a, what a Russ Manning award. Is that right? I got the Russ Manning award after Black Terror. So that right, was ni- it was that after was the Black Terror. Okay. So I was working on the Psycho, and uh, and, and and you've been nominated for an Eisner um, a few t- for like five, five times. times. Yeah, and I know that um, from what I understood from researching you was it was more for Nocturnals. Um, in was, 1995, right? So I was nominated for Thrill Killer twice. The, there you go. Yes, uh, I was nominated for Nocturnals once. Psycho might have been a nomination. It's just that I wasn't aware. I see. It might. It might have been. There was. I think Dread was the thing I did for Eclipse. Yeah, I think I got that's nominated for right, that. Right. Right. I never quite won, but I also realized that getting a nomination is pretty great. I it mean, is. I, yeah. it, it's you got to pick one winner. And the thing about Eisner's is, it's. I've had people come up to me who are nominated for an Eisner, and say, "Hey, I got nominated for an Eisner. Will you vote for me?" And I said, "Well, I haven't seen your book." Oh, well, you could buy a copy or, you know, whatever, get uh-huh. a copy. Um, I said, well, I also haven't seen the other books you're nominating. Right, against. right. Yeah, because so it if takes I just votes vote for you, to finalize I know the you. winner. Yeah, because judges vo- pick the nominees, but then it's votes from people that determine the so winner. So it's, yeah. it's people in the comic book industry who vote. But you're supposed to be voting based on who did the best job. And nine times, not nine times out of ten, I couldn't say that, but... I think a large number of the votes are based on, I like that guy over that guy, or I like that person's work in general. I, I, don't, I didn't even see this other stuff, but I liked that. So I'm going to vote for it. And I don't feel like that's representative of, of what's the best. I sure. think everyone has to fail. It's like if you're going to watch, if you're going to, if you're going to pick an Oscar for a film, you should watch all the Oscar films. Yes. You know, and then say, which one was the best? Right. Don't say, well, I like, you know, Clint Eastwood, so or you know, I'm going to vote for his. Right, I, I totally get ones. that. Yes, and that's where I feel like it fails. You know, um, also I I remember one time complaining, thinking this was years and years ago. Yeah, the nominee never won an, Os- an Eisner, and then my friend Karen Dwyer goes, "I've never even been nominated for an Eisner." Mm-hmm. I go, "Oh man, I'm sorry." You've been nominated, and, I, and you're so a good. And times. Kieran Dwyer, if you know his work, he's yeah. so good. I can't believe that he's not been nominated for, and at least, let alone not won, because he's amazing. Right. And I, I realize how ridiculous it is, you know, to even care about that stuff. To get an award, it's great. To win an Eisner is a great thing. It's definitely a badge. But to have lost five times, it's not bad either. That's not bad either. <laughs> to be nominated I'll five times is it. awesome. Oh, yeah. And I stopped getting nominated after a while. Um, but when the same people keep winning it over and over and over again, that's when you know it's kind of lost its power. Yes. yes. And that's kind of what happens and because there's so much new talent coming in. Now, the one that I vote on every year is the one I won, which was the Russ Manning Award in 1990, which is the most – it's it's the Promising Newcomer Award. There you go. And I never met Russ Manning. But uh, the fellow who was good friends with him, who kind of took over and would, right. uh, and ran the awards, he, he and I became friends and – well, friendly uh, because I became a judge. So when you win, you become a judge. Yeah. So you're being judged by your peers. So when I won the award, I was being judged by people like Steve Rude, Dave Stevens, you know. Um, and Dave Stevens actually handed me the award, which I didn't even know I was nominated for until about 10 minutes before I walked in mm. the room. Because Eclipse said, here's a, a ticket for the Eisners and there's a dinner and then there's the award ceremony. Don't be late. And I was an hour late, so I missed dinner. And they said, you, some things you can't be late for. I go, what's the big deal? Who am I? And he goes, you're nominated. So it meant a lot to them, but they, they, <laughs> they failed to tell me why. <laughs> they wanted me there. And then um, they're reading off names and then Dave Stevens says my name and I go up there and I speechless, you know, and he said to me when I walked in the seat, he goes, I voted for you. Oh, that's and cool. that was all I needed to hear. Yeah. You know? And Dave um, Stevens, yeah. The great Dave Stevens. And yeah, Dave Stevens and Russ Manning are both also West Coast dudes as well. That's right. That's like you are. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah. 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 Um, and even though Steve Rude didn't start in the West Coast, he he, he became a West Coast that's guy right. for sure. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so... 
that was a big deal. And I kind of used to think, wow, I wonder if I'll ever win another award or if this will be the only one. Watch, this will be the only one. And, you know, I think I won a gaming award for a, a Nocturnal Sting years later. Oh, but, cool. Uh-huh. But it is kind of come true. But the thing is, is it doesn't really matter. I mean, it's not the totality of everything to win awards. It, it becomes important for a while. You get a little obsessed with it and then you kind of let it go. Interesting. You know? Yeah, that makes sense. And then at that point, mm-hmm. you just do the work you enjoy doing and and move forward. I've done so many things that I've been proud of not so many things i've done things i've been proud of and that haven't been recognized and that's okay because because other people recognize them. i recognize them. they made me happy yes and that's where nocturnals and giant killer come from is me wanting to do a comic that i wanted that you wanted i would want to read and it shows you could see the love you could feel the love in that stuff um there was an amphibian humanoid in uh in psycho Mm -hmm. did you watch that reminded me of Creature from the Blue Lagoon. Did you watch that stuff? So I mean, were, I those, was, were you a fan of those 50s films? I didn't watch them when I was a kid. Um, but I was always fascinated with the idea of the Creature from the Black Lagoon from the, I don't know, at least high school. Yeah. I remember I was part of student government and we were supposed to do some uh, special thing. And my idea for the special thing to do for the whole school was to watch the Creature from the Black Lagoon in 3D with 3D glasses out in the football field. And that idea stuck for about 15 minutes before some – but he else came up with something he really wanted to do. But I was like so excited because I was like going to yeah. be able to see that movie yeah. for the first yeah. time. And it wasn't until I got it on VHS and I think I bought it on VHS. And you know how much VHS costs back in the 80s? Oh, yeah. And I saw it for the first time and I was just like so happy to have finally seen it. And then I started you know, getting into the Universal stuff and watching all those movies. And- so what, what age were you when you started watching those then? Oh, my 20s. Yeah, in the twenties, yeah. right? So this I is hadn't all kind seen of, any of them. Yeah, yeah, because you're yeah. So it's, it's more TV, in the twenties and much. later where you're now. You're really digging. I wasn't in. allowed to stay up late, right. To watch creature features, and yes. I kind of didn't really want to when I was a kid. Yeah. The only time I ever stayed up late to watch right. creature features was Bob Wilkins. This is an, uh, an Oakland came out of Oakland KTVU. Was when Stan Lee was a guest on the show. Oh yeah, this would have been in seventy five when he was uh, going out and, and um, promoting oh, works that's awesome. Marvel comics. Uh-huh. And I got to stay up on a Saturday night to watch that, which was amazing. And there's no um, there's no copy of that of that. Uh, yeah, I got to find that. Which is really sad. There's no copy to watch it because a lot of those shows were um, they had some videotape or they had some yeah. Um, yeah, they weren't digitized. Yeah, a lot of things yeah. were not digitized. But not that one. It's really it's too bad. Because I remember it just how, and plus they had these big standees of Marvel characters in the, like the set, which was like yeah. exciting. And, you know, so then, nine, so then when you're saying like in your nine. early twenties, mm-hmm. so this is like the late eighties, early nineties. Now you're catching up on monster and horror yeah. movies at that point. So I, I like the idea of, of like this sort of amphibious character because, uh, in the psycho, these, these, a lot, most of the characters who have been, uh, changed by this drug, XDL, that makes you superhuman. They're human, more or less. Right. I thought maybe this one guy they called, that James called Killer. And he was just supposed to be a big hulking brute of a strong guy. Yeah, yeah. I thought, what if he was just monstrous? What if he was like this fish man? And he's like, yeah, cool. in a suit. <laughs> so, and yeah, yeah, in a suit. And then That's later right. on, yeah. I do Nocturnals, and one of the characters, Starfish, is, is an amphibian girl. Looks like she could be his, his sister. Um, so it's just one of those things that I was interested in doing. Starfish came about as a, a comic book friend was going to put together a book of uh, pinup art. And he, and he actually paid several artists to do these pinup pieces and i had this idea for a pinup that i would do like a like a 50s sci-fi pinup but as if it was on an alien world with an alien girl so yeah. i had this fish girl like a ray gun and she's underwater uh-huh. had this kind of andrew loomis sort of mermaid feel to it and that was starfish and then i ended up putting her in nocturnals later on because nocturnals was kind of like i had a couple of ideas for some main characters and then i had some other characters that had been floating around my sketchbooks and stuff right. and i put them in there to kind of round things out and she was definitely one of them so later on, she she ended up joining the roster. Uh huh. Now, how was working uh, under Mike Carlin as an editor then? Like, was he supportive? Did you talk to him a lot, or was he kind yes. of keeping his fingers out of it while you guys were doing it? I mean, what well, what kind of feedback were you getting from him uh, in that early period? He was a great teacher, and he was a friend, and he was a f- super funny guy. Uh, very very um, much a company man, which sometimes it was. A little, uh, you know, like okay, dude, okay, I get it. You work for the company, but for the most part, he was he was a cheerleader. He was always very um, supportive, very organized, very clear and concise about about you know if any questions you had, there was no ambig you know ambiguity in anything, and um, he made things actually 
much smoother and easier than than maybe another editor might have. So mm-hmm. he was he was a he was a great editor, especially uh, like you know it's my introduction to like the you know the bigger world of comic book publishing. So yeah, he was. I, I'm, I feel really lucky. Yeah, that I was able to work with That's him great. on uh, as many uh, projects as I did. In fact, when the psycho was over, he was like, "What do you want to do next?" And I said, um, "I want to do Batman." He goes, "Well." If you're going to do Batman with me, Superman's got to be in it. And I was like, okay. Because oh, I wasn't great. a huge Superman fan. My my yeah. my love of Superman is like George Reeves' Superman yeah. TV show. That's my favorite Superman. Reeves More so too. than Christopher Reeves? Yes. F- for a couple different reasons. Because he was kind of a smartass. And, um, George Reeves was. Yeah. Yeah. He right. was this There's something a little more mischievous in what he was doing. amused at the other people. And it's like this idea that – I mean, they didn't really delve into the idea that he was an alien – but it had to be on um, his mind as an actor <laughs> that he's watching cool. these humans scurry around and be silly. Yeah, and he has right. the two silliest humans, yeah. the three silliest humans of, of all creation that are his friends, you know, uh, his boss and you know his partners. That's I never thought of that. And yeah. he's just like, come on, Jimmy. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know. They're silly, yeah. Shaking he's his a, head at he's how a su- silly. He's a superior being and he knows And all, it. The, all the bad guys are silly too. They're all dimwits. Yeah, and right. And he's just like the smartest like like guy in the room. they're like weird mob guys. That, and he's not even yeah. human. And you, you forget that a lot. You forget that he's not a human being. Yeah, they don't yeah. like make a big deal out of that. But it had to be on his mind somehow. But right. yeah, there was just this. And, and that's who I was thinking of Interesting. For, when I was doing Legends World Finest. And that was my touchstone at first. But then I started thinking, all these all these artists and writers and creators have come before me to make Superman what he is. And I don't want to um, okay, I wanna a, there, honor that and respect a, there's that. There's a certain tradition with Superman. And. So when I did Superman, I, I kind of had to fall in love with Superman and had to, and it, cre- it created this appreciation for the character and, and really wanting to do well. So it wasn't just, I'll do Superman because I'm get, trying to get to Batman. It wasn't like that at all. I was definitely locked in. And and Carlin said, who do you want to work with? And I said, um, hmm, Walt Simonson? Yeah. He goes, perfect. Right. Let me talk. And I had met Walt and Wheezy uh, like a year before or two years before in Scotland. I'd yes. Gone to Scotland in I think 1990 or 91. And, and this uh, is 1994, Legends of the World's Finest. The idea of it and the concept of it preceded Walt's involvement. It sounds no, like. no, no. It, it was definitely uh, it was definitely after Walt and I got together. And, I see. Uh, and we actually I uh, came out to the the offices sometime after that. Okay. I had characters I wanted to be in it. I wanted Silver Banshee to be in it because I really like that character a lot. I wanted I, uh, I thought it'd be cool to have Man Bat in there. Right, right. Um, I, I love that. And yeah. I had this idea. I guess I had an idea for like this villain character who was kind of like an ancient sorcerer. Yeah, like maybe a Celtic sorcerer. Right. And so, I'm brought that stuff to to walter because walter said you know what kind of things you want to draw yeah there you, you go know, we'll come up with a story that's based around the things you want to draw on that which is great so yeah we came up with this idea and the idea that that walter came up with was probably more in tandem with mike than me was the idea that superman's dreams and batman's dreams were were becoming inter were becoming switched so in other words batman was having nightmares about his his planet being destroyed yes. at Krypton and Superman was being plagued with nightmares about his parents being murdered in front of him. And that was messing them up because yeah. the, the inference of the influence of this sorcerer and their dreams was, and they were totally off their game because of it and it was screwing them up. And so they, they band together to fight this, this presence and, um, this guy named Tullus and, uh, it worked. It was really cool. It made sense. It was specific to the characters. Uh-huh. You know, that's another thing I learned uh, from working on that book, which is you don't just say, well, I want to throw this character and this character in because I like them. The story has to be specific to, For that situation. to these characters. And there needs to be a reason why they can be the only characters that this story fits. There you go. Not interchangeable. Yeah. You know? And and it sounds like, <clears throat> did you learn a bit from Wall 2 on like story yes. structure? Oh, yeah. You can't help it. When you're working with people who are good, and even people who aren't so good, you can't help it. You have to learn. You have to learn something. You have to come away with it having learned either what not to do, what works. I mean, when I wrote Nocturnals for the first, you know, that was the first time I'd written a full six issue thing. I learned about what I wanted to do differently the next time. You know, uh, I remember making this sort of uh, having this idea that I early on, not not after I wrote Nocturnals, but I didn't want to do thought balloons. You know, captions are okay, but I wanted the characters to, when they spoke, that they were speaking and they weren't just 
doing thought balloons, mm-hmm, you know. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, you can do thought balloons with a caption. You mm-hmm. know, it's like narration. Yeah, yeah. You know? I think Frank Miller really popularized that concept. There's this great scene in the movie The Hand, which is a Michael Caine movie. Yeah. And Michael Caine's... Barry script. Windsor Smith yeah. uh, was involved in that. So the strip that he does is basically Conan, but it's yeah. called Mandro. Right, I remember. And Barry Windsor Smith was hired to draw, to draw yeah. these strips, and which if you were a comic fan, you knew right away you were that it was Barry his Smith, stuff, even, yeah. even though you're watching a movie. Right. And uh, there's this great scene where uh, he's he's sold the strip and this other artist is is drawing it right, for him. This right, young right. artist is drawing it for him. Yeah. And he's just sitting back and collecting the checks. And uh, he sees the work that this guy's done and he gets really upset that there were thought and, balloons. That yeah. there were thought balloons. Yeah, and and he's like, Mantro uh, doesn't think it's based on a book, but yeah. the script was written by um Oliver, Stone. Oliver Stone's first. I think it might have been his first. Yeah, uh, yeah, script, and but it's based on the book uh, that I actually read. It's pretty good. But he says, uh, "What are these thought balloons? Mandro doesn't think. Yeah, he acts. Yes." And I yes. was like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah." yeah. And the, and Conan very much Conan uh, doesn't, doesn't doubt anything he does. No, Thought, well, it's, just, it's it's basically Conan. There's no thought balloons in Conan. Yeah. And yeah. Oliver Stone, you know, obviously a big fan of Conan. It's like John Milius. Yeah, right, um, right. And, I, and I, I, that's such a great lesson. You know, I'm not yeah. saying that you can't have thought balloons, but it's a great lesson. The char- because that is in screenwriting. That's very important. Yeah. Characters if it's like a kid or a teenager, action. they kind of could in a way. But if it's like a well-actualized warrior person. Well, I mean, all characters act. They They take action. And that's what fuels the storyline, not sitting around thinking in a room. Oh, that's interesting. It's, it's you mean the, like a play or something? Like in a does, play, it's action any, and speaking. Any, There's no thought balloon in Any three-act structure, any story structure, the character, the, the story is moved along by the actions of the character. Yes. Um, you know, maybe something they say or what they do, but they make they make a decision and they, they act on it. And that's what propels the plot see, and yeah. the story. And um it, it was all encapsulated in that, and I was, and I didn't realize that at first when I first heard it. But I was like, "Oh yeah, Conan doesn't really have thought balloons." But then later, you realize what genius that is. Yeah, it is genius. You know, yeah, you're right. His character doesn't sit around moping and thinking all the time. He actually does something. Yeah, he takes action of whatever that. Yeah, you're right. Kind. Yeah, and that propels story. Yeah, so, um, something I really liked about Legends of the World's mm-hmm. Finest was you also depicted like some of Batman's rogues gallery. You had Catwoman, yeah. Riddler, Joker, Penguin. Penguin. Mm-hmm. But then you also have like monsters and demons and <laughs> it's like a real yeah. visual hodgepodge yeah. Yeah. where you're getting, you know, this kind of funny... We were going to call it that. We are going to call it Legends of the Hodgepodge. No. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but I noticed, but you, were you a fan of Simonson like in the early 80s when he oh, was doing yeah. Thor and stuff? Yeah. In fact, Thor, uh, his run on Thor is what brought me back to comics in 83. There you go. Because yeah. I was in my kind of like well, it wasn't that I was into comics, but I was into like Warren comics and Bernie stuff and, yeah. and, and you know, heavy metal stuff. He brought you into like mainstream superhero again. And then, yeah, somehow I, I might have just gone into a 7-Eleven in Truckee. This is like I was out of high school by this time. And I knew Walt's work from other things he'd done. Yeah. And I saw this alien dressed like Thor. Yeah, Beta Ray Bill. Yeah, and... My brother, too, who wasn't a big comics fan, we both just were like, what the heck is right, this? Right, right. And we just got so into it. And yeah. that pulled me back into comics. Oh, that's great. Me. Because, and I asked that because you did a bit of a visual homage to him in Thor Godside's, oh. Godside's special yeah. 2009, The Death and Life of Scourge the Executioner. I did a retelling of the story. Well, it was written as a retelling of right. the story. And then it was put in this God-sized Thor. So it's in context of this larger story. Yeah. But the thing I didn't realize, and they didn't tell me, uh-huh. was that I'm retelling this story. So I'm, I'm taking visual cues from, from, from uh, Walter's work to kind of imbue that and, and pay homage to that. But then they didn't tell me that they were running Walter's original story in the book as well. You would have maybe done a different I might have something. taken some more departure from – I didn't like take whole panels and just – Copy them. Oh. I tried to do was embellish. No, you upon, did you absolutely. Know. The thing that was interesting about that was the way it was colored. Was right. back then the coloring was very simple. in yes. eighty three of, of that stuff, and and even that story, it's just very primary. And so I was going and doing that too to try and again pay homage to what, yes. to what he'd done to to say this is how you should be feeling about this when you're looking at it, not like knowing that you could just see it like you know a few pages later. <laughs> You know, but that's okay. It was still kind of cool. No, it's a beautiful story. And you also penciled Beta Ray Bill in the Green of Eden in that same year. And you had some involvement with Beta Ray Bill. I was working with Warren Simons, who was the editor at the time. I got a lot of work from him. It was a secret invasion aftermath story. Beta Ray Bill was the main character and he was uh, worshipped as a god by these scrolls. 
kind of gentled scrolls yes. that thought of him as a god. And yeah, yeah. I penciled the thing and um, didn't get the didn't get the cover, didn't get to paint the cover, which always annoys me. You do all the work in the interior. Because you penciled the, the interiors, cover. but you didn't paint the interiors on that one, I think, right? No. I uh, In fact, it was inked by three different inkers. Right. There you go. Uh, and that's something that Warren would do when the book was late because Warren is, a, a, you know, I don't know if you want to call him a frustrated writer or if just a writer who was frustrated in that he wasn't writing comics, he was editing them, mm. let's put it that way. And uh, so he spent a lot of time with the writers trying to get things right. It was important to him. But it was – sometimes the books would go over I see. schedule because of that. Okay, and then it would fall sometimes. to you to hurry the hell up. And then it would fall to several inkers to finish it up so the book would be on time. And letters too, I guess. Probably, yeah. Back but, to uh, the kind of that Mike Carlin – like kind of 91, 92 era. Was he the one that hooked you up with the Legion 91, 92 covers? Or, or, or did you just kind of through word of mouth work with other editors? So there was, another edit- there was another editor there, uh, Dan Raspler, who was editing uh, Legion and some other go. titles. And he, he liked my work. And, you know, he was, you know, just down the hall from Mike. And he had seen my stuff. So he was hiring me to do, to do covers for, for Legion here and there. And I did some uh, pencil and ink stuff. And then I did some blue line colors, but mostly I did painted covers for Legion. And there was even one year, I think it was in 92, and I was the second time I was back there visiting the offices. And uh, I was about to leave on a Monday and Rasper calls me into his office. I came, to, I went to, you know, say goodbye to everybody. And, Hello and goodbye. I'm going to go fly home. And I'm in the offices and, and Rasper calls me into his office and he says, uh, hey, you want to you wanna do a Lobo cover? I go, yeah. Lobo, yeah. I love yeah, that cover, yeah. Because this is uh, one shot. Uh, Dennis Cowan was supposed to do the cover. And he, he got, he fell behind or whatever. I need it like Friday. I go, what? It's Monday. Yeah, I need it Friday. Can you do it? And I'm like, okay. I'm going to f- fly home on Monday, start working on it Tuesday, paint it on Wednesday, FedEx it on Thursday. He gets it Friday. Yeah, I, okay, yeah. It's two grand, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. It's Lobo. Why not? Okay. And he goes, yeah, it's Lobo on a pile of women. What? Yeah, it's a pile of women that he's just he's just, you know, satisfied. A pile of women cover, not just logo looking god ass you need in 3 days or 2 days or whatever. I go, "Okay, fine." So I go home and yeah. I do it. Very climped. There's a lot of climped in that cover. Yeah, yeah. Not right. a lobo, but the women, they're very climpty. They're very rosy, huge, interesting. And, yes. and yeah. It's almost like a collage sort of effect. It's not a mountain of women with him standing at the top. I, I didn't do that. <laughs> I finished it, but I wasn't able to get it out FedEx until Friday, not Thursday. So he got it on Monday. Yeah. And for several years after that, he would say, remember you were late on that one assignment? And I was like, I was not late. I saved your ass. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He liked to bust chops. Yeah, when lot. you have to add a pile of women, that's a lot more details you yeah. have to add. Dan to was one of the most smarty pants guys. Let's put it that way. It's very, very smart alecky. You did some work also with Marvel's Epic line You, you with Clive Barker's Book of the Damned Hellraiser with some there were some internal illustrations. Mm-hmm. Um, it seemed to be a project that appealed to kind of your horror monster kind of sensibilities, visual sensibilities. How did that project come about? Um, Clyde Barker became very very popular. There was the Hellraiser book, but then Eclipse had to took out the license to do the Books of Blood stories and and illustrate those. But Hellraiser comes out. Mark McLaren or Marcus McLaren McLaren was the editor. He was friendly and liked my work and liked the work of quite a few other painters. And they're hiring, you know, different people to do stuff. I never Mm -hmm. got hired to do a story, but I did get hired to do a cover and I think a pinup or something like that. Yeah. And so, which is fine. No, you know, so I have a pinup in one of the issues, which should, I would have been cool if it was a cover. And then I did a cover, which has been reprinted several times. And, um, and that character who I did in both, I did, the pinup has three or four characters that I created, Cenobites, and then the girl, the female, is also on the cover. So she became her own character that Marvel sent me a like a thing to sign, saying she's now this character, she's called this. If she appears on any cover with her name on it, you'll get a royalty, which never happened. <clears throat> Signed her away. It was interesting. And then uh, because that was for Epic, so Epic had yeah, that, that was, additional yeah, uh-huh. incentive. Yeah. To Plus, it, it, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, it's Clyde Barker's, uh, you know. Uh, work and he owns it you know just before i got into crime fiction really heavily i was reading clive stuff the editor fred burke had worked with black terror said do you want to you know do a story i said yeah my i think my the story i'd like to do is dread because i Mm -hmm. like that story Mm. um where the guy locked up his girlfriend with a big piece of cooked meat and she's a vegetarian and he wants to see how long it's going to take before she breaks down and eats it (laughs) which is and then his other friend, he does a thing, he hit his number on his other friend who goes crazy and then ends up going after him with an axe. You know, he just, this guy is just a 
What a creep. Nice. Clive Barker's Dread. You illustrated the interiors and the cover. And the clown with the axe. That's the cover of the HarperCollins edition. Eclipse edition has this, but it's a little square uh-huh. with blue yeah. and peach. It doesn't look at all like a horror. It's the worst design horror cover. And then later on, uh, Clips in HarperCollins did this one, which is how it was supposed to look. Right. And that's my go. sister who modeled for oh, the really? character. Oh, really? That's yeah, great. And she yeah. has this painting up on her yeah. on her wall. So that's that's a cover I'm pretty pretty happy with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It really, it really captures the And I could have done fear. stuff like that for the next 10 years, but I just, you know, um, ended up doing superheroes and stuff for DC. You know, right, DC right. Guy. Sure, sure, sure. But uh, – <clears throat> and. Uh, and the clown with the axe in it. Yeah, the clown I mean that's with the scary. Axe. Yeah, it turned out that the main uh, character who was putting his friends through hell—that was his fear. Okay, this, the, the 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 murderous clown. And and at this point in your career, how long is it taking you to like illustrate one page, like fully paint one page? In the nineties, when I was doing painted stuff, I had um, basically it was supposed to turn in twelve painted pages a month. That mm-hmm. was my and that was a lot of work, but I did it. Twelve and, painted pages a month. Okay, yeah, I see. that was my quota. Yeah, so it's like one page every two to three days. Yeah, and then of course you might have a cover or two or three, and you push or some other little. So you small push it a little thing. harder. Never, on that never, stuff. never two sequential art jobs going at the same time. Can mm. Never do that. That's mm-hmm. just crazy, too much um, to pull your head out of one story and put it in another. The cut. You also did the cover for Clive Barker's Nightbreed fourteen, nineteen ninety two. Right, this time as well. I did two Nightbreed right? covers. Two Nightbreed covers. Now the there funny thing is, one was my favorite character from Nightbreed because Nightbreed was a, a movie I loved. This guy, Peliquin. So I did a Peliquin cover. And then the second one was a specific cover that the editor asked me to do because the story they needed, um, Marcus's, were doing the story to figure out why a guy who got killed in the movie is still alive in the comic. And this is the story. And we need you to make sure that this guy's head is being held by another character on the cover. Right. So I do that. It's the best of the two covers. It has several characters on it. And then they don't do that story. So when the when the when this when this cover comes out, um, it, there's two people standing behind and one person kneeling down holding the head, but they put this like, uh, you know this, what do you call it when you just like a a you know a, a graphic, yeah, a, a, you know like a burst graphic that says something on it that's about the story, but it's covering the head of the guy. Yes. So it just ruined the whole point of the cover. They just oh we don't want that's not the story, so we'll cover it up. Mm. And I was just like, oh, my God, I'm never going to work with these people ever again. I was so upset. I mean, it's not necessarily true that I didn't do that. But I just – that's the kind of thing that will happen sometimes. Yeah. You know? um, but other than that, I really liked doing that uh, that cover. And you were fully caught up on the horror genre of movies at this point as well. I mean, you were oh, – were, yeah. were you basically kind yeah. of like – did you just kind of like make up for lost time and just watch a bunch of that stuff? I When I bought my VCR, yeah, I made up for lost time. There you go. Everything. That's what I was kind of worried about. Everything. So in yeah. other words, being not being an art student, well, I, I worked in a movie theater for about a year or so before, you know, quitting and going f- full time with comics. And I was still in. Yeah. I saw a lot of movies. There you go. And we were able to see movies in other movie theaters around the yeah. area for free. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't pay to see a movie for three years. Uh-huh. <clears throat> and I watched a lot of movies. And then I got my VCR because I, you know, when I got a check from whatever job, I could afford to buy a VCR. And then I was just like, and not like I hadn't rented movies yeah. before with other friends, but I didn't have a VCR. I don't even know if my parents had one. They might have. But yeah, I was catching up on everything. There you go. Um, yeah. So and and that you you caught up on like fifty stuff, eighty stuff, whatever. Um, well, I mean, Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the Thirteenth. Nightmare uh, on Elm Street was something that I'd seen, but I, I'm not a big '80s slasher fan. I mean, uh-huh. I've seen all those now. But, You've seen them now. Yeah. But Rosemary's Baby. Yeah. You know. Um, there you wow. Go. The '70s. You know, yeah, '60s, '70s yeah. horror. Yeah. Um, the. And you know, yeah, some and there was definitely the like a satanic interest in the horror movies of the seventies. Yeah, that's a pretty funny thing. The guy who really hit me really hard, as far as the movie that was one of my one of my favorite movies, it might be my favorite movie, is the thing. John Carpenter's the. Thing. Oh, I love that movie. And you know, I got caught up on the original thing. Yeah. But then, the, th- the there's these three movies I saw um, one afternoon with some friends in 1982, summer of '82. Was visiting a friend in the Bay Area, and. uh we saw three movies in one afternoon. We hopped from one movie to the next. We we went to see The Wrath of Khan, Star Trek La- Wrath of Khan, which that's, was great. That's amazing, yeah. It's like the first and maybe the best Star Trek movie. Yeah, I think but so. It was the next two films. It just blew me away. And one was The Road Warrior, 
which had never seen anything like that. Before. Yeah, Mad Max, amazing. And then this movie called The Thing. Yeah. With the John Carpenter, the guy who had done Escape from New York and some right. other films, right. seen like how like I hadn't seen Halloween yet. Yeah. It blew me away. Eighty two. That was huge. And then the same in the same year, you know, you have so many super important films come out as far as I'm concerned. Blade Runner, E.T. Oh, yeah. You know, just it's a huge – and there's many, many more. It's a huge year for, for movies. And uh, so I so my love of films was completely cemented probably in that afternoon. Not that I didn't love going to the movies before, but just that was like – there were so many things that just – game-changing things that happened in that afternoon. That's true. And The Thing was definitely one of them. It was like – I was like, wow, there's no women in this movie and yet – it was just the things that the, the choices he made. Like, there's no female characters. Yeah, you're right. I never thought of that. There isn't. Yeah. There are in the original, but it's all men. It takes place in this basically. This, it's like a weird play in a way. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's a weird play with crazy special effects, yeah. crazy hard boiled dialogue. You know, um, is there's a lot of things in that film that, that encapsulate. I love like hard boiled crime fiction, uh, and that kind of dialogue and and spare. Um, kind of um, stripped down storytelling, which you get in 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 crime fiction and film noir, and then monsters, and yeah. weirdness, right? And yeah, and there's know. almost like some Lovecraftian oh, sense that totally. the that yeah. that an alien is an is a very ominous thing to be frightened of, and it's ghastly it spends and horrible. How many tens of thousands of years buried in the ice? It's, yeah, it's it's what. You know what I mean? That's and the that's first thing craft. it does when it's awake is it consumes us, and it doesn't they're, care what we look like. It it, it right. mashes us all together in right. some uh, yeah. Lovecraftian, you know, yeah. nightmare horror thing. Yeah, right. yeah, it's amazing. And, and Lovecraft was another uh, writer I came into, like, so I was you know reading Stephen King in high school, and then um, you know other some other horror writers, and then uh, someone mentioned it was probably Stephen King mentions you know. Lovecraft, and I was like, "Oh, I gotta check out this Lovecraft." Oh yeah, guy. and you read that stuff and go, you know, the stuff doesn't read as easy as Stephen King. It's written in this other vernacular and everything. Um, but Call of Cthulhu is so story, easily the, readable. The ideas yeah. are so holy. Like the, and, I remember and the, the way, one that, the way he verbalizes things. It's like you can imagine it, but you can't imagine it at the same time because yeah. it's just so yeah. bizarrely written. And there's this; it taps into this part of your brain that that's sort of the dream imagery that's kind of that's like right. amorphous and ever changing. That's that right. He yeah. taps into that yeah. so directly that yeah. no other writer has ever been do able that? to do it's that. It's incredible. I don't know. And, yeah. and like the and just with a turn of phrase or like a a, a a character who's wearing a mask of a human. To cover up what it really is. That is such a nightmare. And I think maybe that might be what it is. It's just like tapping into your nightmares. He is. Tapping into whatever his dreams and his fears were. Because he was yeah. afraid of everything. He was afraid of everything. Yeah. And um, yeah, so so yeah, Lovecraft was like an eye-opening thing. So when I finally did do the Nocturnals in the, like the mid early to mid-90s, I wanted to do something. It was a melding of like say Dashiell Hammett with Lovecraft. Yeah, All crime that, horror. Mm, Black Lizard crime fiction series with... Yeah, with this sort of Lovecraftian thing, and then some Halloween thrown in, and just some other, you know, Marvel comics. I, I, you know, here's like an a ensemble list. team of competing personalities in a way. And I didn't make a shopping list out that I w- checked all the boxes on. It was just stuff that was of interest to me that I wanted to throw into one story. I mean, I wanted to tell a hard boiled crime fiction story, but I didn't want to draw a bunch of hard boiled guys. I wanted to draw monsters, you know, and I wanted th- to have this. And so the ideas of the story start to come together. You know, you have interdimensional travel, people from other worlds, cre- you know, creatures, monsters, this, that, and the other thing, and then somehow meld it into one story. And, you know, to be honest, I thought that everyone was going to hate Halloween Girl because she's this little girl character who acts like a little girl, just yeah. like my daughter Lindsay. You know, I mean, she's based on my daughter Lindsay and, and my daughter Audrey, and not a not a little sort of um, a, a little girl who's who's actually like an like an adult in a child's body. You know, the, the way a lot of characters are written. You know, like yeah. they're smart, the smartest person in the room, written like a child, and in 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 with all these really dangerous scary people around her what's she gonna do well she kind of goes into this halloween world to cope with it yeah you know um and uh all that kind of stuff i thought well they're gonna hate halloween girl she's a little girl character 
You know, there just weren't really any in the mid early nineties. There weren't any little girl characters in mainstream comics. Right, the closest right. was Kitty Pride. She wasn't a little girl. Yeah, anymore. she wasn't a little girl. She no. was a teenager. Yeah, and um, that stuff kind of came after. There were a lot of little girl characters, adventurous little girl characters afterwards. Um, just seeing these things sprout up afterwards and going, okay, so you know, I don't know what that means, but but I know that people who read that comic, that was one of their favorite characters. Now, a question I have about the Marvel era: Were you? in any contact with Carl Potts at the time uh, he was Epic's executive editor while you're doing the Clive Barker stuff yeah I did I did some Conan covers when Carl you did Conan uh, so him, they yeah. did it they, they launched a magazine called Conan the Savage and I uh, Carl and I had met Carl and Carl and I had um, we had a we had a connection through Vincent Perez who was one of my teachers at CCAC and and he taught, uh, among oh, other things, he taught the uh, artistic anatomy year long course that yeah. most of us have to take and he was friends with Carl he knew Mignola, he knew Steve Purcell, uh-huh. and Carl had taken a short course with him, so he I knew see. Vince. And that's how, when we met each other, we kind of had that Vince Perez sort of like, you know, thing in common. And, Connection, yeah. Yeah. And Because uh, so, Carl himself teaches too, so he... Yeah. And he's, so, Carl's a great artist, and yeah. he's a writer, and he's very... Um, yeah, yeah, I see. You know, he's a very talented creator, and I love Carl. He's a gentleman. Um, and I wish I'd worked with him more, you know, because I put him up there with uh, Archie and, and, uh, and, and Mike... Carlin, Archie Goodwin, Mike Carlin. But uh, so I, I did two covers of Conan the Savage. Um, what's kind of cool is I think one of the issues had a John Buscema story in it, which is really cool. And I was going to do more. And there was this idea. I think there was a story that had either come out or was going to come out where Conan fights an Hyborian Age version of Iron Man, this armored guy all in armor. Yeah, yeah. And I said, that's a great idea. Like, what about like a Hyborian Age like Spider-Man? You know, or this, that, and other thing. I said, you know, so we start kind of throwing ideas around. And so the idea I came up with for a cover was, was, was Fin Fang Foom around in the <laughs> Hyborian age? Yeah. He goes, oh, that's an idea. So I did this drawing of Conan with like a woman, you know, it's always like some gal, poor gal. Yeah, there. yeah. And uh, Fin Fang Foom is looming above them. And I penciled it. I still have it in my flat file somewhere. And I remember Carl was like, I like it, but could you do him like on horseback with the girl and he's fleeing and Feng Feng Foom is coming oh, I and see. falling him out? And I was like, that's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, I guess I can do that. And I wasn't that enthused, but I was kind of busy, you know, because you're doing these covers when you're yeah, doing your regular yeah, yeah. sequential work. And I never got around to doing it. And then there was this round of firings where Carl was laid off. When yeah. Marvel was going through the whole bankruptcy deal. Mm-hmm. and It was the first round of that yeah, stuff. Because then again, there was another round later on. Right. Because I remember I was, uh, I had done Thrill Killer for, uh, in uh, the mid 90s, uh, 96 or so, for DC, I mean. I pitched this idea to Epic, you know, um, Mark McLaren again. The idea was, is, it was this thing called the Strange Agency. And so the idea was that Doctor Strange it was operating in like the 30s or 40s and he was a detective and his agency, is, the people who worked with him, his operatives were all sorcerers and that's how they solved their mysteries and crimes or whatever jobs they were given a rival agency called the xavier agency they come into contact with and so there are all these mutants that are like detectives so you have wolverine and you have dr strange and you know these sort of like 30s 40s counterparts of the marvel characters and we were going to do this as kind of like in elseworlds but for marvel yeah and then like a week later you get and howard was going to write it and then and then marcus got fired <laughs> so that ended yeah. and i remember i remember some other editor like a week later Another editor called me and said, do you want to do a Venom miniseries? Yeah. And they've never done a painted Venom miniseries yet. Yeah. I don't think they'd even done a Venom miniseries. I totally I was like, at that. Yeah. I was like, I'm not a crazy big fan of Venom, but yeah, okay. He got fired a week later. I see. So just... So this is all happening all in the mid-90s. Just... So covers for Creepy, Vampirella, and Rook. You, th- these are basically revivals of the Warren magazines. Harris Comics got the, the rights for Creepy and um, Vampirella. There you go. I don't know if it was the rights or if they just took out a option or you know licensed. I so see. they so they they did Vampirella, they creepy, eerie, and uh, I did covers for all those. Uh huh. And um, Rook, yeah, Vampirella, creepy, and eerie. Okay. So then Harris Comics, which was a company that published like Guitar World magazine. Yeah. Okay. So they were had they, they and then this gal named uh, Melanie Crawford Chadwick who became Melanie Ch- Crawford because she got divorced from Jim Chadwick, I guess. And uh, there were there were a couple, and she was the uh, you know the editor in chief for the Harris comic line. Super great to work with, great lady. And I knew Jim 
I knew Jim Chadwick because he was working at Malibu and he Jim was Chadwick. Helping, Jim Chad was helping on Nocturnals. He was doing design work on Nocturnals and doing an awesome job there too. Yeah. Super nice guy. So yeah, I got to work with both of them. Um, so they hired me for um, a few covers and then I think someone else who was working there wasn't a huge fan of my stuff so I didn't really do a ton. I didn't mm-hmm. keep doing more. I did a... Uh, there was a creepy four issue miniseries. I did four covers. Mm-hmm. There was an eerie, and then I did a, like a they called a fear book, which mm-hmm. was a, the cover has Vampirella, cousin Eerie, and Uncle Creepy on it. And then, um, and then, what happened was they uh, those books ended up. What happened? Um, there was a Vampirella magazine, so Vampirella went into a magazine, Vampirella magazine. Yeah. With it was almost it had a few it had a few short comic stories in it, but then it had articles and stuff. And I had done four issues worth of covers for a Vampirella miniseries that never came out. Oh, and they took those four it, covers and they they used them as covers for the magazine. So they did see print. Um, but as far as working with people on that Warren stuff. I didn't interact with anybody because I was only doing covers. Yeah, right. So, because Steve Leloha worked on some of that. Yeah. Gene Colan, Tom Sutton. Yeah. Peter David, Joe Duffy, like these kind of Marvel. Uh, Kieran Dwyer. Kieran Dwyer. Kieran Dwyer. There Dwyer. You go. Now, I knew Kieran uh, not super well yet, but I did know him. I had uh, – Steve Leloha I'd met before – just before I got broke into comics. Uh-huh. And he was – you know, and Gene by that time, obviously, I, I think – I don't know if I'd met Gene yet by that time and early on. And I, I never really met Peter David or Joe Duffy, uh-huh. but I didn't work with any of these people um, like directly on it. But what a great lineup of talent to put yeah. forward oh, yeah. with these books. That's and, right. Was, um, was there any sense of like when he did Marvel, when he did DC or when he did Warren that you were like, man, these are, this, these are things that I was looking at when I was younger and I'm finally I, I, doing stuff for that this stuff. Or was it more totally. like – totally. I mean, I got my first creepy cover when I was working on the Psycho, and it was one of the first freelance covers I was hired to do yeah. outside of what I would normally go on the cover of one of my books. Right. So I had done the covers for like Black Terror and Psycho, and right. and you know, but I think the creepy cover might have been one of the first where some outside person had come in. And it was Rich Howell who had inked me on Ransom was the editor of of this um, of the creepy book, and I'm not even sure if that was Harris at that point. That might have been someone else, but I get hired to, to work to, to do these covers. And yeah, the first cover of Creepy that I did yeah. was very much uh, in mind of the first cover that Jack Davis did, there which is, go. I think, my favorite Creepy cover, Yeah, even though Frazetta did a bunch of them. It's just something about the monster sitting around listening to Uncle Creepy. You know, yeah, he's reading yeah. the story. Yeah. And then I find – and I have two copies. That I have one on my wall with – Oh, well, that's 1964, comments. I think, when that uh, Pretty early stuff. Yeah. And it's very simplistic cover. Yeah. But I can stare at it. Yeah, me too. Tired of looking There's at something it. about that. You're and right. I love that idea. And he would do a lot of those sort of ensemble monsters all together kind of things. And uh, Severin did them too for Cracked. I love that. I yeah. love that jumble of monsters, and I've done a few of those myself. Um, but I did this one where, like, he's Uncle Creepy's opening the door, and you're entering into like a party, and there's like Frankenstein and other creatures, and a vampire woman and stuff. So it's definitely, you know, inspired by that. And I would have, I could have done those every month. I could have done one of those every month. I yeah, would have loved to do it. Yeah. And then they got more specific to story in the next three, which were not as fun. Um, and then I got to do an, a. a I think there was one that had Cousin Eerie and Uncle Creepy on it, which was pretty cool. Right. But there were a couple that were like – there was one like a, a, a axe-wielding clown in like a tunnel of love, which came out nice. And then there was one of like sort of like a – kind of a devil woman with like monsters in her hair. Kind yeah. of very sort of, you know, not super representational. But um, yeah, that was – that was uh, A fun was, era. And, and what's – and here I am completely new to this whole thing. I'm not like a veteran cover artist. Right. You're like five years into your career at this point, right? This is the guy who would turn in work in school and it was okay. But somehow when you're when you're being paid and you're with the big boys, you step up. Yeah. Otherwise you're not gonna make it. Yeah. And I was just let I was cut loose. I didn't have anyone giving me rules and stuff like that. I was like, we you know, just do something cool. And and I and I didn't it wasn't like a getting an, an assignment 
in an art school where they said, okay, we want you to do the pamphlet for like a travel log. And it was some boring, not boring, but like something that wasn't like speaking to me passionately. Yeah. And all of a sudden they're like, creepy. Here, creepy number one. Holy cow. Like you're just, you're just set free. Yeah. You yeah. Know, for sure. Speaking of ensemble of monsters. So Nocturnals, it was first published by Malibu Comics. Is that right? Yes. And yes. Uh, and uh, with, with that agreement with Malibu, you still own the, the rights to the characters yeah, it, that's how that was. So right? Mar- Malibu had um had uh, they were they were they were flush with cash from being the distributor for the the, the first uh, image titles. That's right. And so they thought we're going to do our we're going to start our own uh uh line of superheroes and we'll hire these talented guys and gals and to put together this whole universe for us, which they did. And then someone somewhere along the line, the idea to do a creator verse, kind of like Dark Horse's Legend. Yes. Line, came about it might have been um the collective uh entertainment lawyer for all of this bravira guys who came up with the idea but i had uh pitched dark horses uh nocturnals and i was wanted to do with dark horse and then my my attorney said well you know here's the offer from dark horse but i got this other publisher over here that i'm talking to about putting together a line of creator owned stuff and he's i've got walt simonson i've got uh I've got Howard Chaikin, Gil Kane, yeah. Stephen Grant, Marv Wolfman, uh, Jim Starlin. Yeah. I go, and me? He goes, why not? I go, oh, I can think of some reasons why not, but I guess I couldn't really say no. I mean, sure, okay. And so they made an offer and accepted it. It was amazing. And yes, full ownership. This is what they offered us. It was like the greatest deal. It was such a great deal that when Malibu started to founder- To flounder, to, to, yeah. To, they were losing money. It was looking pretty dark for them. Marvel comes along and buys them, takes a look at the uh, – they send a, an, a, an attorney and an accountant out to run the company. Yeah. And they look at our deals, the the, the Bravira create our own guys deals, and they're like, what are you doing? You can't pay these guys this much. And I remember they had already kind of stopped paying us a little bit. There, right. were, there were these like excuses for why you weren't getting a check. Oh, you didn't turn a voucher in with your Who, cover. Who, yeah, my yeah. editor said, well, you didn't turn a voucher. I go, yes, I did. I would never yeah. turn in a, a work without a voucher. That's how I get paid. Yeah. Well, I don't have your voucher. I'm like, this is not right. Something's okay. not right. Something's Gil Kane stopped working on his book, The Ed- uh, Edge, immediately and started doing other work because mm-hmm. he'd seen that coming. He you know, he was no dummy. Yeah, <laughs> he'd yeah. been down that road. He he'd just started working on some other stuff. Other places, I mean, he yeah. eventually edited, it, finished it, but um, no, he was like, okay, well, if they're not going to pay me, I'm going to go do this yeah. work over here. Howard did some work with Brevera too, right? Oh, he so, did Power and Glory, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. that's right. Yeah. Uh-huh. That's kind of how I – I mean, I'd met Howard before, but that's how and, – and obviously, I'd worked with Walter. So, you know, that there was some familiar, familiarity there, but I didn't really know Howard very well. And that was a whole other thing, getting to know Howard. And that's what led to us doing Thrill Killer together later on for DC. I see. Was the Brevera um, yeah. mutual work there? And, and Howard was the one that came up with the idea because we had this uh, – we had we were in Philadelphia Con in '93, and we were we put together this panel to kind of announce this creator online. We didn't have a name for it yet, and Howard goes, "Well, you know what we're doing basically is Bravira Pulp." Yeah, and I went, "Oh, there's the title, Bravira Pulp," and then they just shortened it to Bravira. <laughs> <laughs> so now, when when you were making Nocturnals and you're getting your ensemble of characters, getting their colors, their visuals, their personalities. How much of it was planned saying, well, we got to, I got to have a little bit of this and a little bit of that to give it an overall balance? Or how much of that is like just id based, where you just kind of impulsively just create things and then just make it work? Well, I think there's both, there's both to it because there's characters that are sort of running around in your sketchbooks. But the original idea was I, I was on a plane, it's 1992, I'm on a plane in Scotland for the second time, going to their show out there. And I was trying to think of an idea for a pulp character who had like a pulpy sounding name. Yeah. <clears throat> so I come up with Doc, Doc Horror. Uh-huh. And and then the idea comes along of like this sinister, sorry, not sinister, but kind of mysterious character who's, whose um, motivations are kind of <clears throat> murky. And he takes in these sort of night creatures and he'll put you up and give you sanctuary, but you have to work for him and you have to you have to do his bidding. And so I thought, okay, who are these, who am I going to populate? So I had some characters from here and there. And then I had this character who I called Halloween girl. And that basically came from my four-year-old daughter, Lindsay, at the time, uh, we were discussing, uh, Halloween was coming up and I said, what do you want to, we're going to trick or treat. What are you going to dress up to trick or treat? What do you want to be? She goes, I know. 
I want to be Halloween girl. Hmm. I go, oh, no, no, honey, it's, it is Halloween. You can dress up however we want. And I just stopped and I went, wait a second. This is picture in my mind. Yeah, there you go. up of Halloween girl. So I did this drawing real quick. And I had this other character who was like a kind of a scarecrow gun sl- gunslinger. And he became the gun witch. And- right. So in the beginning, Halloween girl was one of these characters, but she wasn't Doc's daughter she was just this little girl who came out of nowhere it was kind of mysterious and spooky yes, and stuff yes. and i'd done a, a a kind of a rendition of her on a cover of a ray bradbury comic uh that byron price put out and i'd done this sort of idea the idea came about also from that too like this is kind of a halloween little vampire girl. uh-huh and um did you meet byron price uh yes how was yes. he nice guy nice guy I didn't didn't really talk very much with him but i met him and he liked my work and he was uh he was very you know, friendly, gracious, and gentlemanly, but it was it wasn't like I had long conversations. Right, I, think. Yeah, I, did, I did meet him, um, and I liked the stuff that they put out. I would have liked to have done more uh, Bradbury stuff because, again, huge influence Bradbury. Yeah, yeah, of course. So I'm in Scotland, and I had this idea, this title. It's called Doc Horrors Pawn Shop, and so you pawn yourself to this guy. You 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 you, in, you know, in, in return for for sanctuary and a place to live and protection from the outside world. You, you sort of pawn your life to this guy. And, and so I remember there was a, a British artist um, who had did a drawing and he had said, Doc Horror's prawn shop. <laughs> like a seafood place where you get fried prawns. I always thought that was funny. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to probably drop that whole idea. And then uh, and I start working more on the st- what the story really is and yeah. who the dynamic of these characters are. And, and I, think the, I think these are father and she's father. It's a father-daughter thing. And um, and then the, the name came later. I was like, I need a really good name. And then finally settled on Nocturnals. Yeah, it's a great name. Even though it sounds a little bit like a group or something, there was a. There actually turns out there was a, a short-lived group in the '60s in Canada called the Nocturnes. You mean like a music group? Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, um, and yeah. So, so I knew there were certain aspects I wanted. I thought, well, you know, I don't. It's not like I want to want to like create the recreate the Universal monsters, right? But right. I started to realize that there were correlations in some ways. There like you go. Fireline is sort of a demon, and she's like the creature. But uh-huh. again, I wasn't trying to recreate the the, the um, right, right. W- would you say that the Universal monsters and let's say like Clive Barker's Nightbreed and all that of, stuff? Did goes all that into stuff kind of go into your? I, I the weirdest thing is I was I remember seeing Nightbreed a few years earlier. And I was loved that film. I loved the idea. Yeah. And I remember trying to find movies or stories that were like it for like months afterwards. Yeah. There just was nothing like it. Yeah. And then I just forgot about it. When I watched it, it felt very much like the Morlocks from the X Men in a way. Like yeah. these weird yeah, underground yeah. kind of freak yeah. things with powers or yeah. whatever. But there was this like serial killer in a mask who was yeah. the bad guy. Right. And then this guy's a monster too. And they live like underneath a, a cemetery. And to be honest, when I was coming up with uh, all the different things for nocturnals i never even thought about nightbreed anymore i was over nightbreed yeah but it had gotten into the cauldron the yeah. bubbling cauldron along yeah. with so many other things and it wasn't until much later that uh some nightbreed came up somewhere and i went oh yeah so i got to do it so i so i made what i wanted yeah i wanted that something like that i wanted that feel and i just ended up making it myself yeah that's great never thought about that i might have thought about it back at the time i was into nightbreed but then I, I put it on a shelf and yeah. forgot about it. And you already had such a tendency toward monstrous things anyway that you're just kind yeah. of following your creative yeah. impulse, basically. I mean, um, I was a big fan when I was a kid of Herculoids, yeah, which was right. a bunch of monsters and a family. Yeah. You know, a mom yeah. and a dad and a kid and a bunch of monsters. I mean, what? it's my fantasy. Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? Holy crap, you know? Did you ever interact with Clive Barker at all during any of this? I met him we, uh, when Dread came out. Uh, Eclipse put out their version yeah. with the horrible cover. We were in San Diego and we did the first signing. I did my first signing. There you go, at the Probably convention. The and he was there. And so we sat at the table and we signed books together. And I met him for the first time. He's super gracious, super nice guy, yeah. very charismatic. You can see why people love him. Just such a cool guy. Yeah, that is cool. And I uh, uh-huh. wish I got, could have gotten to know him a little bit better. But it was great just to spend that, you know, like a couple of hours just sitting and talking. And definitely one of those guys that makes you feel good about yourself. You know, there's certain people who are like that. They make you feel good about yourself when they're when you're around them. You know, yeah. they, know how to, they know how to treat people. And Oh, and, that's great. Just kind of um, like a review of various covers you did, you know, in the kind of the mid-90s era is the Spectre. You did one where he's fighting like a five-headed monster. Yeah. <sighs> Yeah. And uh, then you did Animal Man, which had like a wolf man. Kind like of. like a Bigfoot 
character in the background shirtless like on yeah. the ground yeah, yeah and then behind is like the silhouette of sort of like a right. ape likes maybe like a big foot yeah yeah character. like some and fur, then, fur and yeah. i threw in some raccoons because working on nocturnal at the time and i was really into raccoon although you know you could have taken it to like a superhero extent you definitely went more monster in those themes was that was that intentional was that something that the editor wanted well or, sometimes you or was get... that more your thing so they, you can get a label thrown on you. Like, you know, if you, it's funny, I remember. And um, I was going to ask about the label being thrown and kind of being typecast a little bit. Tell me about that. Well, it, that's why sometimes you get offered some things and you don't get offered other things, you know, because they see you do apples all the time and they don't think that you can do oranges, which right. is silly. And that's something they, they told us. That was actually something they talked about in art school about how you have to show them in your portfolio you can do apples and oranges. There you go. Because they're not going to necessarily make that connection themselves. Yes. Now, I worked with people who did make the connection, which is odd, um, a couple of times. Um, but for the most part, you you wish you could do something because you know you could do the heck out of it. Could, oh, I could, man, I could really just do that cover up. I could have done that story. That would have been so much fun. But they don't think of you that way. They think of you as this way. They put – they they see He's this, the monster this, guy. This. Yeah. yeah, or he does the dark stuff. He doesn't, yeah. you know, or his stuff is way too colorful. You know, uh, any any opinion someone can have about your work, they're going to have it and they're going to hang on to it. Um, Even if you've gone beyond that, they'll still kind of yeah. have carry it with them. I mean, look at the difference between like Legend of the World's Finest cover. This is the first piece of artwork I did before I even right. started working mm-hmm. on it. Big painting is what they call the promo piece, yeah, I love like it. a poster. And the original sat under uh, Mike Carlin's desk blotter to say safe and flat for like a year. Uh-huh. And then we decided, hey, let's use this for the cover for the trade paperback. Right, right. Well, very colorful, primary uh-huh. colors. Yes. You know. And I love when you look put at red this in your one. work. Yeah, Could right. it be any more different? It's very different. Yeah, the yeah. cover to Dread and the cover to <clears throat> Legend of the World Finest couldn't be more different. Yeah. And yet, they're different genres still get altogether. Put in the box by right. certain people in certain boxes. Yeah. So, in some of those covers that are more monster, that was more directed by the editor to do it that way. The Animal Man thing was a specific story. There you go. And so they said, do this. Mm-hmm. The Spectre, Spectre one. Uh-huh. I wanted to do the Spectre, like you know, like a Spectre cover. And then Dan said he's fighting this monster with five heads because it's in the story. And yeah. I was like, oh, so what? A monster with five heads, and he's fighting him. <laughs> and this thing's coming in this uh-huh. gross character thing, and he's he's like back here. He's like um, he's at the bottom of the thing. It's my fault because I was trying to get the monster, and the monster became the monster for me, you know. And I instead of pushing him up out into the frame more, I was trying to figure out how to fit this creature in there. And again, you don't have a lot of time to put this together, right? And uh, so rather than doing some badass shot of like the specter. You know, with shadows and, you know, just something dramatic. I was asked to do this scene. And um, I remember Dan said, can you have him putting his – reaching out and grabbing the, the neck of this creature? I go, the neck of the creature with five heads? <laughs> so which That's neck? Like the, yeah, so are you talking not, about the common so neck now? It was this – there. it's coming down. This creature is coming down. Yeah. On, he's down here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's coming – Okay, I'm sorry because I'm. He's down. He's down here. <laughs> he's down here, uh-huh. and it's coming down on him. Yeah, like that. And so he wanted me to have him reach out and grab the neck. And I'm like, which neck? His arm just disappears into a nest of heads, and yeah. I just hate it so much. It's so anathema to what I would do if he just left me alone and said, "Do me a killer." I would have yeah. done a killer Spectre cover yeah, that we sure. could have both been happy with. But it's sometimes there's a little too much muscle flexing editorially. I see. Now, if it had been another editor. They would have said, I, like Archie would have said, I know you'll do fine. Just do a Spectre cover for me. Right. Don't worry about it. And uh, it's funny because with um, the Legends of the Dark Knight, I did two Legends of the Dark Knight covers for Archie. One was for specific to my story that I yeah. did. He didn't give me any uh, – he didn't tell me what to put on it. Uh-huh. It's Batman like holding his side and he's bleeding and he's like – you can tell he's like in some ruin. It's very close up on him. Right. So it's a character shot. It's, it's powerful. It's one of my favorite – um, covers I haven't seen the originals. I don't know how long, but uh, the other one I did was an inventory cover. Yeah, and Archie was had done covers with Frazetta for Warren, where Frazetta would just turn in stuff, and then Archie would write a story around the the like the cover of Erie. I think Erie number one. Yeah, is this like sea monster? So he he F- Frank turns in this cover, and then Gene is asked to do a story that, that, that Archie writes about a guy who encounters like these, uh, you know, a creature, some kind of sea monster creature, underwater creature. So he'd write the stories around Frazetta's covers. So when I did my, my, um, 
my quote uh, inventory cover for Legends of the Dark Knight, he said, make it as specific as you want. So I have him in a cave wearing a gas mask, um, shining a flashlight. There's rats, there's skeletons, there's snakes. There's like noxious fumes coming up yeah. from some, I don't know, whatever's in the cave. And uh, he took that cover, that inventory cover, and then later hired whichever writer wrote the, the issue for that and said, here, write the story around this. Uh -huh. And they did. Yeah, and they did. And I was like so thrilled because, you know, that's how I used to do it back when Yeah, Rosetta. absolutely. And uh, that was great. Um, but to have some, I mean, and, and again, you know, it's my job as an illustrator, as a freelancer, to like make the client happy. Okay. So if, if the editor says, please do this and this, that's going to make him happy. You, you should do it. Yeah. You know? Right. Sure. And yeah, maybe you're not crazy about it, you know, and, and Baron story in class used to say, find something of yourself to put into the work to make it yours. You know, you may f have a job that you have to do. That's just, there's nothing about it. That's interesting to you. Put something of yourself in there, find some way to make it yours. And that's, was great advice, and I've used that advice many I times. I see, and you've uh, not you've, on you've, the Spectre cover, but. You, right? But you've consciously <laughs> made that choice to do that. I try to make the the. I try, you know, I try and it's another thing someone said to me one time, and our director said, "Well, you know, I consider you an asset, you know, and you want to be an asset to your employer. So you want you don't you, you know. I wish I had heard that. That was good advice I could have used when I was younger because you can get a little bit of a prima donna attitude when you're younger because mm -hmm. you think that you know that they should just leave you alone and do your brilliant work but you're not always going to do brilliant work necessarily and you do need to listen and be cooperative you need to be an asset you need to be someone who's a team player and i learned that 10 years after i got in business it finally sunk in you know mm -hmm. and maybe it was too late by that time with some people maybe some people had written me off as being difficult i don't know if i, I if people think of me as being difficult mm -hmm. or not you know maybe they had but but i really do try and be more like I said, more of a team player, more of an asset, you know, right? So that you felt good about hiring me. Yes. And it's funny because I have been doing that for a long time, and it doesn't always return a dividend. You know, I'll 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 kill on some job, a cover job, like say for Marvel. Marvel is for some reason I'll I'll I'll, I'll deliver the goods, I'll bring right. it home the bacon, right, right. And then I think they're definitely going to hire me again soon because because they're so happy with this and then nothing for years. You just got to move forward. Yes. Just move forward the next thing. And a lot of what freelance illustrators do when the work dries up a little bit or you go through your doldrums is you hustle. You you drum up work or you, you go into commission mode or something. And there was a time, I think it was 2017 or 2018, a whole year went by without a single call or email from any comic book editor or publisher for, for a job. Yeah. A whole year. And it hit me. Wow, I haven't gotten an offer for any work in a year. And I thought, well, maybe they're done with me. And then a month later, Stephen Grant, old friend Stephen Grant, writer, who made Punisher popular. Yeah, yeah. He says, oh, yeah, one of our old editors at DC is now uh, is now over at uh, Valiant. Should I tell her you're interested in maybe doing some work? I go, yeah, sure. And um, so she called me or emailed me that same day right. and said, you want to do Punk Mambo? I go, what's Punk Mambo? Yeah. <laughs> you know? And so she offered me like to, you know, the, the art chores on like a mini series, you know, drawing it, doing covers. And she told me what the deadline was. And I was like, I can't make that deadline anymore. And I'm not sure I want to because I had other things I was doing. In other words, by that time, I had worked out a system for myself to be an illustrator and to be working and busy and make a living that didn't involve comic book land i see i realized when i realized that i hadn't been called for a year i thought that's okay because i figured out a way to to exist without them mm. i don't need them anymore mm -hmm. i can stand on my own two feet and then the work starts coming in from dark horse comics is wanting me to do covers I'm doing covers for valiant some other a lot of jobs i had to turn down i turned down a graphic novel for some company um and uh that was great and, but then you go through another stage where you don't get any calls again. Well, pandemic was kind of interesting because some stuff dried up and other things came up. Mm. It's really weird. But no, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm, I've figured a way to, to make it work right. on my own terms. Now, some of the other covers and illustrations, Sergeant Rock, Cable in Marvel Masterpieces mm -hmm. 2 collection, mm -hmm. Deathlock. So you got to kind of revisit a childhood kind of fun comic. So Deathlock like. and uh, Cable were trading card. Uh, yeah, trading yeah, cards. Marvel yeah. Masterpieces, right. Okay. And then yeah. uh, Mars Attacks. 
Tops. So Tops, Tops. Tops hired me to do some Mars Attack stuff. Um, and uh, and then I ended up doing some more stuff for Tops or IDW because uh-huh. Tops remembered me um, oh, from I having see. done stuff when they were a comic book company. And yeah. so I got kind of jungled up with them again. That was oh, kind cool. of fun. But uh, so random. I mean, and yeah. that's a fun piece of pop culture. Mars I Attacks. did a few covers for them. Yeah. And they were tops. Uh-huh. And the editor was fully the perfect editor for Mars Attacks because he was kind of sadistic and it, not sadistic, but he liked really gross stuff. Uh, yeah. Right. And uh, so the ideas that he would come up with for were me, I actually had to tone one of the ideas down. <laughs> I want you to have this beautiful woman. But she's been she's been altered by the the Martians, so she's kind of scary looking. And the Martian has his tongue wrapped all the way around her neck, and then the end of his tongue is going into her mouth. <laughs> I said, I am not gonna do that. I said, I'll do everything, but I'm not gonna put his tongue in her mouth. He wanted that on the cover. This is the guy. But you know, that's that certainly gets your attention. Well, I got people's attention without all without that. the tongue most down of there. Every, it was everything he wanted right. except for the tongue going in the mouth, which with is the, just I think right without had, the without, without the colonoscopy part to it. Yeah, it yeah. was <laughs> it was too much. And then Neil Gaiman's Lady Justice, you did a cover right. there. So Tell I me did, about that. I did eighteen covers for Lady Justice. There you go. So so uh, Techno Comics was founded by a company that just sold. Uh, the Sci-Fi Network. Yeah, they yeah. start a comic book company with pretty much the express purpose in mind of creating IP. Yeah, that they can sell. And Techno is T E K N O. Yes, T E K N O. And uh, they they did about nine or ten issues as Techno Comics, and then they changed their name to Big Entertainment, okay. which was the parent company was Big Entertainment. Yes, Techno Comics was the comic line, but then they just changed it to Big Entertainment. And so I. Did 18 covers all together, but I did like Lady Justice number one through nine and then volume two, one through uh, 11 through – no, one through 11 or something like that. Whatever it was, it was 18 when I was done. And uh, that's my longest cover uh, – Cover run. Cover, cover gig, yeah. And I actually wrote three issues of the book as well. So I wrote a three-issue arc. Yeah. And this um, is where you start kind of trickling into the writing stuff too, like kind of late night. I had done Nocturnals. I hadn't what, was done... Nocturnals what like proved to the industry that you could write also? I don't know who it proved it to. It proved it to me. I already knew I could write because I've been writing stories forever. But yeah. but I, I, I got over my initial anxiety about it a couple different ways. I, I talked to some I talked to a couple of writers about doing the writing with me on on, on Nocturnals. And then mm-hmm. I decided uh, one of them said, uh, you know, I might want to change things that are dear to you, so you might want to think about writing yourself. So that, you know, nothing that you really, really want is going to get excised. And I thought, that's true. And then I started thinking, there's some really badly written comics out there. What am I worried about? All I'd be doing is just adding to those. And some of those are popular. You know, and I thought, I can do this. So, But I, but uh, Harris, entertainment attorney, said, well, let me uh, let me put you in touch with, with Chaikin. And you can talk with Chaikin. Oh, I see. Uh-huh. So Chaikin became my what they called creative rabbi for a very brief amount of time. And so I sent him my outline for Nocturnals. He said, it's way too opaque. I can't even get through it. Read these books about well, screenwriting. What's that word opaque mean in, uh, in, in a sense of writing? It's so – it's hard to – in other words, you're reading something that is not clear to understand. It's mm, the way it's okay. written. There's too many ideas. I see. There's too I many see. Okay. things going on. It's it's not a clear through line. Okay. And, 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 which is important. You want to be able to make it very easy to yeah, understand yeah, and right, follow us along. Right. And I had too many ideas. Way too many characters. Way too many ideas. Interesting. So I pared it down. There were a lot more nocturnals. There were a lot more villains. Some people almost say that was Jack Kirby's issue with New Gods is so many ideas but didn't really focus it and, and pare it down. Probably. So that's interesting. Okay, so you but had But there that. was also this other thing which was you don't have to – put everything into the pitch or the outline. You you can hold back the things that aren't that important. And I remember having this conversation with Howard. I was like, well, these guys, he goes, well, you need, you know, you, you need, you, you need to have like this main villain and you have this mm. and that. I go, well, yeah, there's a lot of villains, but some of them are just like henchmen. He goes, no, no henchmen. Mm. There's no henchmen. And I'm thinking, well, there's always henchmen. Mm-hmm. He's like, no, the henchmen don't enter into your, your pitch. You know what I mean? And I had, I had, I had histories and names and personalities for all these different characters. 
And um, it's not that you can't put henchmen in there, but they're not integral to the main story. You have to pare it down. So he said, you know, I'm going to want you to read uh, this book called Screenplay by Sid Field, which I did. And it's about structure in, in story. And then I, I also ended up reading Robert McKee later on, some other Sid Field stuff. And, and, and uh, also William Goldman wrote some uh, stuff about, you know, writing screenplays. So I was reading that to kind of get the idea of this three-act structure and, and you know, the things that you're supposed to do in the beats and, and everything and the paradigm for, yeah. for you know, for the three-act structure and uh-huh. story. All these things that, like, were intuitive to me before. I didn't really think about them. And when I was trying to explain all my ideas to someone like Howard, it was all coming out in a big vomitous riot of things instead of picking and choosing what was important so now if i write a pitch i'm going to pare it down to the most important things i still have an issue sometimes where i haven't quite figured out the whole entire three-act structure but i have a very strong idea and i always feel like i can get there i know how to get there i feel confident i can get to that third act and make it all come together but i don't necessarily always know from the very beginning you know how it's going to end or i might know but what's the second act going to be like, you know? So uh, that helped a lot. And that really kind of made me realize that there was so much I didn't know and so much I really had to, to, to keep in mind. But somehow I think I pulled it off with that first thing. I pulled it off because I knew I knew I had a story. It was just, how do you explain it to somebody in this many words when you know you're going to make it this many pages later? Uh-huh. And that's a whole uh, that's a whole skill in itself. You know, pitching the art of pitching. It is, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, that's the whole pitch deck, and then sizzle reel, and all those, things. all that stuff. Yeah, you know, all that stuff to get the two pager, uh, the one pager. Yeah. You know. To get the people financing it interested is yeah. the idea. Quick thing on Lady Justice: Did you ever interact with Neil Gaiman at all? Neil Gaiman's inter- Neil Gaiman basically he came up with this concept. They paid him a lot of money, and then he went away. He had no interest in being involved with uh, I see. the comic series. It was more itself. the initial concept. It was the did. idea. And basically, he took the idea of Lady Justice, which is a statue in many, many cities around right, uh, right. wherever there is the concept of justice. There is the sword and the woman with the blindfold. And he took that idea and he said, that spirit takes over someone, oh, some woman, and then she's able to you know, enact justice right. or vengeance or whatever, right, right. which – and then $80,000, please, or whatever they paid. I heard it was uh-huh. like seven or $80,000. And then he walked away. I see what you're saying. Uh-huh. So they used his name. They used this concept. Uh, and it was up to the editors to kind of – Assign writers, writers. To and, sort of figure out where a, it was going to go. I see. And so it was a very episodic type of story. And I finally got to do my third um, – my three-act thing, which was uh, kind of a, um, a hats off to uh, Red Harvest – the story D- Dash uh, Hammett's uh, novel, which has been adapted many times, it's mm-hmm. the idea of a uh, character who comes into a situation where there are rival gangs who are who are tearing up a city, yeah, and and pits them against each other. I see, um, like Yojimbo, basically. Yeah, Yojimbo is right. a very pared down sort of version of Red Harvest. Another cover heartbreaker that was for Dark Horse, right? And that this is where you start moving. Heartbreak. Nar- nocturnal yeah, heartbreakers yeah. yeah yeah and you start moving nocturnals over to dark horse and you uh, tell tell us how that happened what you were interacting with mike richardson around this point to kind of make this deal happen so i had done the malibu previra nocturnals and i was supposed to do a second nocturnals mini series with dark horse uh, but i was going to do a second one i had it all worked out yeah it was all set up two months before I was supposed to start or something like that. I get a call from the editor saying they they're not going to do it. It's uh, they they did the the accountant went through the numbers and they can't afford to pay you whatever you're wanting whatever it was, you know. And um, sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was like, wow, I was going to start this major thing in two months. And now what am I going to do? Uh-huh. And so uh, Mike Richardson said, well, I'll tell you what you can do is you could do uh, a three part Dark Horse Presents story, and then. That'll give you some work to do on a nocturnal thing for us. And then we will uh, put it together as a, a one shot. And that gave me work. Uh, and so I was able to do that. And I added, I think, eight pages to the story for the one shot. And then as I was working on it, it was, you know, Dark Horse Presents is black and white, but I was doing limited color. Mm. And I added more color as I went along. So the story isn't just flat black and white. There's color in it. Yeah. And I'm actually really happy with that story. 
Um, and I'm really happy with the way it came, especially in the in the one shot. They um, got some great pinup art in there and stuff like that. Rob right. Zombie did the illustrated introduction to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, It's a great book. Um, and it, I'm pretty sure that that issue sold out eventually, that one shot issue. So uh, that was really cool that uh, Mike was willing to do that because he knew I needed work. He knew I just he didn't want to leave me high and dry. Uh, but then I think after that's when I did not uh, giant uh, did throw killer because I killer, pitched yeah. throw killer and then did throw killer and then ended up doing another one. So uh, heartbreakers came about because I'm friends with Paul Guinan and, and Anina Bennett who were a married couple at the time doing that book heartbreakers. They're they're creating their own book for Dark Horse. And uh, so they asked me to do a cover for them. And I, th- I think around that time that I did that cover for them, I was working on Lady Justice and Thrill Killer. There you go. Yeah. And uh, I only just did the one, which is, you know, which is fine. And that was fun to do. They're nice folks. Uh, but it didn't lead to like a whole bunch of Dark Horse covers. And what happened basically was there was an editor at Dark Horse who was not a fan of my work who came to power. I guess for a time, and so my work at Dark Horse was very limited. I see. I didn't have. I would even have editors who would call me up and say, "We want you to do this thing," and then later on they would say, "Oh, we're not going to do it," or they would just not never call mm. back. And I found out later it was because there was this there was someone there. who was not exactly a fan of mine. Thrill Killer. Yeah, that came out in 1997. There's Thrill Killer. You know, Batgirl and Robin. Thrill Killer, Batman and Batgirl. That that was written. By Chaikin. T- tell us about how that came about. Because what I love about it is that it's set in that time period. I love the way you draw and and paint the characters, especially Batgirl. Like, I love the way you <laughs> did her. Commissioner Gordon with his pipe or Bruce Wayne out of costume in his suit. They look very much like their initial appearance in that first Detective Comics that mm. they premiered in. Hmm. So there's this very classic Gordon and Wayne depicted by you in there. And it's an Elseworlds story. You know, tell us first, like, how did Thrill Killer come about? How did that get conceptualized and implemented? So I had uh, this idea for what basically was Thrill Killer, which was Batgirl and Robin are the dynamic duo. And Bruce Wayne is a cop who works for Gordon. And something happens to Robin or Robin's family. Bruce Wayne's brought in on the case. And he has to deal with these two uh, kind of thrill-seeking vigilantes. There you go. Who are kind of like having this uh, crazy wild romance with each other. And um, she's the heiress. So she's the rich one. Because her mom – and the way we worked that was this Gordon, the father of, of Barbara Gordon in the story. But the the woman he married was was like the heiress. She was the rich – rich. she had the money in the family. And uh, so she's just like a thrill seeker. And that's why I, I, I came up with this title, Thrill Killer, which was supposed to be a working title. But it never, it never got changed. Yeah. It just stuck. So the idea is that you know they're these sort of fun-loving vigilantes who like to go and fight crime, almost kind of in the way that Batman and Robin in the TV show fight crime. But they're also like Elvis and Anne Margaret, and they're in this like, you know, kind of whirlwind romance, and it's kind of wild and fun. And um, I actually thought of it as being more set in 66 or 67 originally, but then Howard – when I when Howard was brought in because I pitched this to Arch, Archie Archie liked the Archie idea Goodwin, initially, yeah. and I thought and we sort of thought about like the idea of Howard writing it. I thought Howard would be the guy to do it because he's you know he would remember more about that time than I would. Yeah, I was born in sixty five. He was born in the fifties, so he put me together with Howard on a phone call and we talked about it and he liked the idea and we talked about Anne Margaret and Elvis Presley and this kind of May December romance and setting it he wanted to set it in the early 60s because it still feels like the 50s it's not yeah. really the 60s yet yeah, yeah. and he had these very specific ideas and I thought this is great because he's taking the idea and he's running with it you know but it's not diluting it he's not changing my my basic you know uh, idea he's adding to it he's fleshing it out perfect you know and he just got it and I kind of thought he would I don't know Howard that well, but I kind of thought he would. And yeah. He did. Perfect storm, and uh, so yeah, it was so easy to do. You know, there was really no conflict, as far as I know. There was only one little hiccup, which was, you know, we talked about them carrying guns, and the whole story went through. And I think maybe it was because we're used to writing these characters the way that they're written. So Barbara Gore, Batgirl, and Robin never pull a gun in the story. And I'm, I'm illustrating the last issue and it hits me, the third issue. Oh, there's been no guns. They're, they're holding guns on the cover. 
but they've never used guns. Uh oh. Hmm. So I call Archie and I said, what do you think about it? He goes, yeah, it's true. Well, I, I said, I have an idea for how we can make a, a change that would have, would resonate in the story when, when involving a gun. And the idea that when Robin is out for blood, he pulls a gun, but it ends up to being his undoing. So it's, there's a message there. I see. You know? And, uh, it didn't help, didn't help at all for these heroes to carry guns. And uh, so I get on the phone with Howard and I said, you know, we did this whole thing. We've got them carrying guns on the cover, but they never co- carry guns in the, in the story. You're right. Let's go with what you want to do. We'll make that work. That, that, I like that. Okay. We'll make it work. I was like, good. Yeah, because um, I interviewed him, as you know. And then yeah. and then he and I worked together on that Howard Chaikin zine that we made. Mm-hmm. And um, mm-hmm. it was a real pleasant, you know, even when I, I turned in the draft before publishing. Mm-hmm. And he read through it, made some little quick, um, he spotted a couple uh, changes and he sent it back. And it was just very easy, you know. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, But one thing that I really remember was when we were talking about Batman mm-hmm. during the interview. Mm-hmm. I said, how do you like Batman? He goes, oh. I hate that character. And I'm like, why? And he says, because why would a man of such means, if he really cared, he would do something more in the form of like social programs, things like yeah, that. If he wasn't not, damaged. Not not putting on right, not putting on some costume just to beat up poor people in the street every night and to get off. And the way he was talking about it, it felt very like there's a fetish to Batman. And there is yeah. a weird fetish between yeah. Batman and Joker anyway. And he's a unique individual to be able to spot that because not yes. everyone pe- Not everyone he, sees it that Howard, way. Howard yeah. Howard is lives outside the world of fanboy the fanboy he, world he does so and, and he's many not, of he's us not, do yeah but, but he, he has, and he's not a superhero obsessivist either yeah and he i also get the it. feeling that he's somewhat versed in the snm world i i don't really know black so. kiss you know that he did that was banned in canada right very sexual oh and, yeah and yeah. all that kind of crazy stuff within yeah. it. so you know to so yeah i agree but i made this joke i said well then it sounds like uh you know batman should be wearing a ball gag the whole time that he's and he was like yes exactly he's right you know and he's one of the few people working in comics who will point out the reality of the situation that we're all trying to like you know we all sort of stuck in this kind of like little kid yes. loop about right. stuff. We nost- the nostalgia yes. behind it. And he has all that, but he also has the presence of mind to know that look what's going. I mean, I was just thinking about this the other day, which, which I love about him, by the way. Yeah, I and love what's that. funny about that is that I was I, I'm I'm doing these um, pieces for an upcoming like virtual art show. So I'm doing uh, some characters I like to do. I'm doing some Bronze Age characters, like I'm doing Warlock and uh, Gamora and Deathlock and stuff like that. And I wanted to do Kill Raven, and so I have the first, I have several issues of the War of the Worlds Kill Raven stuff. And the first, in the beginning, his costume is like a wrestler's singlet yeah. with like these th- neat thigh high boots. <laughs> I mean, and you know, he and Neil drew that first issue. I don't yeah. know who came up with the costume, but the costume is very. Kind of like it looks straight out of some S and N club, right? Sure, you know some guy. Yeah, like Zar- Zardas look like that. Yeah, the, exactly. The Sean Connery. Yeah, I wonder. Deal. Yeah, I wonder if there's a correlation there. <laughs> but yeah, exactly. And um, and then it changed when yeah. Craig Russell came on, and he kind of right. made it like I prefer, I much prefer that one. So it's like, oh, okay, I'm going to do that one. I'm not going to do this other yeah. one. But yeah, I mean, that's that that's someone had to come up with that idea. Where did it come from? Yeah. You know what I mean? Did yeah. it come from Zardas? I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> Well, I had Maybe to, it came I, from some club someone was at. Because my parents romanticized Sean Connery like as James Bond. I'm like, look, we got to watch Zardoz. I made him watch Zardoz. Like, oh, my what God. What really? did we just watch? The Brutals. <laughs> we mentioned, you know, Giant Killer 1999 already to some extent. It definitely seemed to be a fusion of like the Japanese kaiju with the Jack Kirby monsters, <laughs> West Coast samurai swords. I'm kind of conflating that creatively a little bit with your time on Frankencastle, that Frankencastle 2010. Yeah, 10 years later. Which was 10 Mm -hmm. years later. I'm almost grouping it because there were Kirby monsters. There was a 70s horror hall of monsters. Mm -hmm. And the colors were just all all beautiful in both productions. And what I find in these productions is one, your influences kind of show in this, but also how you can mix monster with like this like very vibrant color scheme which i feel like is is so rare and and beautiful unless you um, look at the old kirby and dicko stuff uh-huh. where it's like these big orange guys yeah big green guys which are guys. naturally like yeah. that but in yeah. the in the in the right. four color version yeah it's like the last issue of the series 21 i did they're in the jungle so it's very lush and green you can't get away from green in the jungle green's not a, co- a color i gravitate to right or try and use it very sparingly um 
You you do red a lot, right? Yeah, red, yeah. Uh, purple, yeah, yeah, warm tones. I mean, even warm greens, like olive greens and stuff. Uh-huh. But, but uh, you know, sometimes it's just uh, it just somehow it feels right to just. I, I'm not afraid of using bright colors. Yeah, you know what I mean. And for as far as I'm concerned, as long as you put the right colors next to each other, they they get kind of harmonize. Yeah, you know. Um, I wonder, is there some of the kid in you also active? To portray monsters, but almost brighten them up so they're not too scary. Well, have you noticed how in the have you noticed how in a lot of films when they have monsters, like even Pacific Rim, they're kind of gray. Yeah, you know, there are a lot of gray. Yeah, muted colors. Yeah, yeah. But you know, what? Why? Why do they have to be? I mean, they're not like that in necessarily. You know, uh, like if you look at kaiju films, or if you look like shows like Ultraman. Ultraman's wearing like silver and red. Yeah. There's yeah. uh there's that riot of color that sort of swirling paint in Ultraman, the beginning. It's, yeah. You know. Um and and there's a lot of characters with like bright splashes of color on them, you know? Um and I think those accents of color are what kind of bring excitement to things, you know, just making everything gray. Oh yes, it's more real maybe it's more realistic to think of things being gray. But I kinda don't care about necessarily that part of realism yeah you know i want to get the lighting right but why not throw in some color i'd almost rather you know? have just the color in there yeah i know it came out of my love of discovering rediscovering those films there you go so my son hunter was just a toddler at the time and someone sent me i think i watched uh godzilla versus biolante on a video cassette uh-huh. which was hbo video and it's a film that came out in 89 where they brought Godzilla back. It's called the Heisei series. It's, the, it's like the second series of Godzilla films. And it starts with Godzilla versus Biollante, and it goes all the way up to Godzilla versus Destroyer. Yeah. So I discovered, I was going, th- I'd gone, I was going, th- I went through a divorce. Uh-huh. And I was, my son and I, uh, at the time, it was just my, my toddler son and I living uh, up in uh, Sierras, where my parents live in Truckee. I had a place there, and my parents live nearby. And they're helping out. And uh, so I'm this newly single parent, and, and I watch this movie, and I think, wow, I love this idea that, first of all, Godzilla fights this sort of Lovecraftian plant monster who's part him. But the way that the, the people in the story regard Godzilla as almost a deity. Yeah, right. So one character in the story goes, the ways of Godzilla are mysterious to us, just the way that people <laughs> describe yeah, God. right. <laughs> and I was like, I love this idea of a world where people – worship godzilla like yeah. a god yeah yeah that's so freaking cool yeah that is interesting and it's, it's not really been done yet necessarily but and then i start watching more of these movies and i and i'm getting to the point where i have to get the fan subs so the movies are come japanese laser disc and then some fan does it does a subtitle i on see it, and it's like a bootleg thing yeah and then i'm buying the i get a laser disc player i'm buying a laser disc just to watch godzilla versus destroyer even though it's not subbed I don't care. I'll find one of those later. Yeah, and you want the action it. too. I yeah. want the full screen, yeah. you know, yeah. laser disc uh, thing in my 50 inch screen and all that stuff. Super into it. It's like nothing I've really been exposed to before. It's not even that much like the old stuff because when I was a kid, I thought Godzilla got kind of silly in the 60s and I wasn't really down with that. I liked right. Ultraman a lot. Right. right Watched it every right. day after school. Yeah. There's even an homage to Ultraman in, in Giant Killer. It's Jack is basically watching Ultraman TV shows in this big screen and getting all excited because he yeah. wants to go in there and fight these rubbery monsters. So, um, so I, I, my son and I start watching these, and he's just again a toddler. He can't even say Godzilla. He says Yah Yah. It's as close as he can get to saying Godzilla. And buying the toys, and this is all helping me forget my stuff you know my personal stuff. And we're moving forward, and we're enjoying this thing together, and we're bonding over kaiju. And uh, I get this idea one day, like, what if you took a human being, you took a, like Godzilla DNA, and you splice them together into this warrior? Yes. Who could fight the monsters, not titanically tall like them, but you know, bigger than a human, but would scale them like a monster and just go at them and have the same powers as a kaiju, but would just take them on on his own terms. And that's where Giant Killer was born. Yeah. It really just came out of that, watching those films with my son, which is why I dedicated the story to him. But um, So then I started coming up with this sort of A to Z list of them. Yeah, I love that. And uh, <clears throat> It was so much fun, actually. I was talking to Mike Carlin about Giant Killer, and Dan Rasper was in the office. So I guess I was in the office talking about it. And uh, I was pitching it, and Dan liked it, and Mike liked it. And Mike goes, well, 
since Dan's here in the room, he'd be the one that would edit it. Yeah. And you're, you're cool with that? I go, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll be a team player. So Dan was the editor, came up with what is Jack's motivation? Yeah. What's his right. quest about? Dan sent it in. It got accepted. And they even said okay to the field guide issue. And it introduces Jill, Jack, other monsters, yes. the situation, and it's issue zero. When I read- when I had I, a crush on Jill, by the way. Have hey. you noticed how many characters there are? That are like these tough gals with like the platinum blonde yeah. short hair yeah. who carry guns. Like there's right. one in uh, Wreck It Ralph. That's right. I was right. like, she's she reminds me of Jill. She fights monster aliens and she looks like Jill. Uh huh. Um, again, I'm not saying that they red giant killer, but it's just kind of this sort of archetype somehow. It seems you know? that way. Yeah. The fact that they said yes to the whole thing. I was walking on. I my feet didn't touch the ground for a month. Yeah. So excited, and uh, that was just such a. There was nothing about it that was work. Yeah. It was, and Dan and I would have conversations about like you know what you know, what Jack's purpose was and, you know, and, um, and that helped too. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was pretty great. And I, I, the only thing is I wanted, I, in my mind, I kind of wanted them to publish it as like an oversized book. Yeah. 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 And then I ended up getting to do that like a few years ago. Yeah. Published it oversized full color because yeah. if you watch some of the Godzilla movies that have come out, there's uh Godzilla in like the nineties, Godzilla versus Mothra, <clears throat> space Godzilla destroyer. They're colorful. Yeah. There, there's, color on the screen and Godzilla is kind of held back. He's not super colorful, but it's that gray black or green black against super bright bombastic colors mm-hmm. and they're, and, and they're giant and they're fighting. And, um, that's, I think that's what I was trying to capture. And yeah. then Jack, Jack himself, I was like, okay, what color is he going to be? Originally it was going to be green. I was like, why does every monster have to be green? It can be green and red. That's too much like a Christmas tree. And I can't make them all red or too much red. Cause that's like Hellboy. Yeah. So I made him gray. I yeah. tried gray, purple with stripes like a like a Tim. I did a uh-huh. Tim Burton one on purpose, like black and white stripes on uh-huh. on his pen- tentacles. Oh, interesting. To see what I thought of that, and then eventually came up with the gray, like asphalt gray mm-hmm. with red as the accent. You know? Right, and it's a great contrast with the various colored monsters he's fighting and stuff. They take yeah. all these different colors, and he's like right. kind of the more gray one. Right, and he's it just fit. It really it, it worked. Fit. It worked yeah. well. He's not black and red. Yeah. He's gray and red no it's perfect and you can do when you're using a character whose whose skin is gray you can throw colors and reflected colors in there you can make you can make it more blue you can make it more orange yeah true like at the end of the story when he crawls out of the volcano he's blackened practically yeah, you don't have yeah, him in the yeah. volcano <laughs> um so on the very last page he's this dark smoldering black figure yeah yeah i read that when i read that i was like wow this is uh more fun than I've had in a while reading a <laughs> comic, man, actually. I that. Yeah, because you know you That's read comics, really cool. you enjoy it, but it, it was like just a fun ride. The whole thing. Um, it's nothing like. There's no heavy, you know, issues or yeah, things like that. It's just my love letter to that stuff. Yeah, that right. You and feel I it. You feel it when you read it. Too. Um, there yeah. is a little bit of some people have said to me at the end. They said the relationship between Jack and Jill was kind of interesting. The way that people reacted to yeah. the way I. Because you I structured couch. it like a brother and sister. Yes. But I thought there was going to be a romance at right. first. Right, right. But it didn't – interspecies romance didn't really seem like the way to go. It, it wasn't that, even, yeah. never in my mind. And also, it, he's, he but, shares – But, you know, ever since Howard the Duck and Beverly nailed it, I just – I don't think there's any <laughs> – there's no more walls right now. No, yeah. no, you're right. You're right. But, I mean, for DC, I don't know. And also, another thing that was interesting about that is DC wanted to make it part of the DC universe. Yeah. And the idea was that we will, we will do – we'll do an issue of Justice League because Justice League was really a top selling yeah, book yeah, at the time. Yeah. We'll do an issue of Justice League with Jack. We'll introduce him in the Justice League book. And I said, well – why do you need a Jack the Giant Killer if you have a Justice League? If you have a bunch of monsters invading California, just send Superman and Wonder Woman over there to take care of them. Why yeah. would you even need Jack? That's yeah. I also knew in the back of my mind that I was going to get the rights back eventually and that it would be a lot harder if they made him part of the, the DC universe yes. and they had him show up in a comic. It would have been tougher. So you almost kind of resisted that. Did you end up getting the rights back to it? Yeah, five, six years later. Oh, yeah. good, good for and you. That's put awesome. Out, put out the trade through um, through Image. And then, uh, again, I did the big oversized hardcover a couple of years ago. So this is a win-win all in all. Yeah. I mean, um, it it didn't sell like a dog. It didn't like make me like royalty money necessarily. But, it, you know, I was getting paid to do the work. Yeah, and, and it's a beautiful property. And then I was able to put it out myself. And, and when I put it out myself, yeah, there was – yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. I didn't lose money on it or anything like that. It was – I was really – I was actually pleasantly surprised how many people uh, – supported it and yeah. were, were wanted it and i i actually made the decision not to sell it through diamond because i kept the print run small i thought you know what i'll just let bud plant take up the excess you and go. he can sell them and and uh and actually um 
it just came out in France uh, this week, and it came out in Japan last year. Which I set I set those uh, the Japan thing I was helped with Matt Frank who's a Godzilla artist who's, who they love in Japan too, and he set he put me in um, touch with a publisher that, that does a lot of the Godzilla stuff he's involved with, and they they did Giant Killer over there in two volumes. Buffy the Vampire Slayer, you know, created by Joss Whedon, the property. He wrote the screenplay originally and then worked on the TV show. There was a comic series in 1999. Tell us how you got involved in that. You wrote or co-wrote for Buffy the Vampire Slayer, mm-hmm. right? I was never uh, approved as an artist, but I was approved as a writer, Yeah, which was cool. So we're watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer. We think it's a really cool show. I, of course, remember the movie, but the show is different and it's just, you know, sucked us in and we were into it. Pretty early on in the first season, Jamie Rich was uh, editor at uh, Dark Horse at the time. Um, and we were, he had been my editor on the Nocturnals uh, Witching Hour book. And so we were talking about Buffy, and then he tells me the news, you know, we're, we're going to do Buffy comics. Are you interested? I go, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, he, he didn't get me, he, I didn't get uh, approved as an artist on the, for covers. But I did get, because I couldn't have done, I didn't have time to do the interior stuff. I did get uh, approved as a writer. I'm not sure how that happened, but it did happen. And they were, they offered me the monthly gig of writing the series, the monthly series. And I, part of me was a little intimidated by that. Part of me was also really busy. And I thought, I don't think I can quite carry that yet. You know, I haven't done enough to where I just dive right in yeah i should have said yes and dove right in i could have handled it instead i said i I don't know i don't think so so they give it to andy watson and that's andy with an a-n-d-i yes british uh comic creator who had done uh skeleton key Uh okay thing anyway before that came out i wrote the first graphic novel i don't know if there's any other graphic novels but i wrote a buffy the the vampire slayer graphic novel called uh the dust waltz and which was a lot of fun. Joss Whedon's people asked me to change one word in the entire script. They said, can you take out the Eddie Munster reference you put in this one line? I said, sure. That was the only That's nice. they had. Yeah. They liked it. Uh, and they were Joss's mouthpiece. So I never talked to Joss, but these people were represented. They were I mutant, mutant enemy. They yeah. were mutant enemy, his uh-huh. company. Um, so I was. they liked me. I was doing well. I wrote that. And then I... I, were, I, I uh, and then Andy left... Andy, Andy, not not Andy Stout, my editor, uh, Jamie. Mm -hmm. Jamie left Dark Horse to go help uh, Bob Shrek with Oni. Mm. Oni Press. Oni Press, which would be the future home of Nocturnals for a while. And Scott Alley was brought in. And I knew Scott Alley didn't really like my work. but he And he wasn't a Buffy fan. He wasn't that thrilled about any of it. But he was fair with me at first. He was fine. I did uh, the, the Dust Waltz I was working on when he was – so I was still working on the Dust Waltz when he came on. And I remember uh, the, the, at the end of the story, Buffy fights uh, a, a, a werewolf. But the artist who was a South American drew him as a, a vampire. And I said, Scott, you didn't tell me that he didn't draw him as a werewolf. He goes, yeah, the book's behind and – I guess we can change it. And they changed it. He just drew a snout on this vampire mm. to make him look like, which, okay, whatever. He just didn't care. But Buffy became a hit. There were celebrities at Comic-Con. There was this, that, and the other thing. And then slowly you start to see, wow, this thing has, you know, some momentum. And so then I, the next thing I did was, again, the mutant enemy people liked me. They liked Christopher Golden. So Christopher and I wrote uh an adaptation of the film script, but we worked it in, we worked in the TV stuff so that you could make a bridge between the film and the, uh, the TV show. And that's what that Buffy, the origin miniseries was. And so we wrote some new material, but mostly we were adapting the original screenplay. So it wasn't that tough to do. And, and, and Chris did a lot of heavy lifting, probably most of it. So that came out and that was fine. And then I, I wrote a, uh, I wrote a um, – can't remember what other stuff I did. But the last thing I did was it was like this TV guide eight-pager. Mm. And I, 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 I sent in a, a, a plot, got approved, wrote the script. Then they said change the plot. Now, by this time, I was supposed to be working on 
giant killer. And I was getting the feeling that the mutant enemy people were off me a little bit and more on, on Chris. And I, and, cause I noticed how I would t- send in ideas and they would, they would, um, they would say, no, we don't want that. We don't right. want that. And uh, re- actually what I found out later was a lot of those ideas were already scripts. Like, Oh, Buffy goes up against a cult. I see. No, the, they didn't say because we have a script for an episode. It just I found out later because they sent me a bunch of scripts or someone sent me a bunch of scripts. Or, oh, okay. So they already had this idea, this idea. I so, see. So uh-huh. that was part of it. But then I felt like they really responded well to to, uh, to Chris. And more and more I started feeling like I was losing touch with what they really wanted. I wanted to hit the mark with them and I was hitting it less. So I thought, well, I'm going to take a break from Buffy, work on Giant Killer, and let Chris uh, make the changes to this little eight-pager and then he, I'll, I'll share a writing credit with him. And he was like, sure. So later I tried to go back and do more Buffy stuff. And Scott just didn't want any, anything to do with me. And that's okay. I moved on. And Buffy got more and more and more popular. Yes. And, you know, and I really should have taken that gig, the first gig. I see. The monthly gig. I should have taken it when it was offered to me by Jamie. I think it would have been fine. But uh, do you feel really just, good. Do you, do you feel that it's it's a, it's an issue of, of commitment and confidence and uh... – you know, it sounds yeah. like there's a lot that goes into that, especially if you're working in some sort of commercial art. Like, can I do this and it'll be a good job? Was there some insecurity there? I really, yeah, there's probably always a little insecurity because, you know, the sensitive artist types that we are. But I think I really was, I really was thinking schedule wise, can I make this happen without it becoming a, a big issue in my life and causing a lot of headache and stress? Yes. And can I do the job? do justice i knew right. i could write buffy the vampire slayer stories i i was totally in tune with what the story right, what the, what the right. show was and i love the characters and there was no it wasn't like there was going to be any shortage of ideas it was just can i juggle this and this because right. i was working on this and i was working on this and i was like that's a lot to kind of put together the, and realistically sa- it didn't seem like a good idea this sounds like we're like the balance of ambition and quality of life if the only there thing I was doing at the time there. was writing a comic book and that would have paid all the bills, I could have just written the Buffy comic yeah. book. Not done any covers for it. Maybe there done some go. covers and something else. But I had right. other things I was doing. Yeah, yeah. Big commitments doing pages, 12 pages yeah, a yeah, month painted. Yeah. That yeah, you're also everything. painting at the same time. Yeah. Right. And that pays the bills more than a script does for a comic, right? Definitely. Yeah. Especially if you're writing it too. Yeah. Like Giant Killer was writing it yes, and doing it. Yes. So that was a, it was a good page there you rate. Go. Very yes. good page rate. So. Yeah, I saw this amazing illustration of Mike Allred's Madman that you did. Um, it was like, you know, one page <laughs> illustration in one of his Madman comics in like 2000. What was the story behind that? I mean, that thing is was incredible. I looked well, at it. Well, in case you didn't know. Amazing. That's the greatest piece of artwork I've ever done. That's what Allred said, uh, right? Parent, yeah, according to Mike, it's the greatest thing I've ever done. <laughs> I said, you're not a little bit maybe biased because it's your character. Because it's his character. No, no, yeah. I'm being totally serious. I said, okay, thanks. But it, it, it's an uh, incredible, so incredible piece. It's uh, just something weird I did, f- some fluky thing. He's like, he's got a phenomenon in his mouth. He's sick. He, there's a devil pu- puppet menacing him. Yeah. It's just some odd and there's something image. That, and it, it, it also kind of goes with like his lightning heroic imagery with – and you're also oh, just stars great. and weird, yeah, stars things. and yeah. weird other stuff. Yeah. Uh, just it's just a great. I think it's just paying trying to pay homage to a really fun character. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's just. Uh, yeah. I remember when the Mad Men was called the Spook, and uh, that's when I Mike went, met Mike when he was doing this thing called the Spook. And yeah. Had, and the character had a mask over his whole face, and he had these stitches on his mask. And I remember Mike telling me, "I took the stitches off of him because it it, it was because you already had the Gun Witch with the stitches, so I took him off." I go, really? Wow. Thanks, man. Oh, yeah, that's right. The and gun he took the has... mask off completely yeah. and just made him this handsome Mike Howard looking guy. I mean, he made the mask more like it, just like a face, yeah. you know, and changed the name, which was a good, good, good name change. Um, but that was fun. And I remember when um, that was done for a trading card set that he was putting together. And I went and visited him and stayed overnight at their house in Eugene. I was doing a convention out there. Oh, yeah. Oh, and cool. I stayed overnight with in their the house. All Reds. Yeah, with the All Reds and the kids and everything. And um, the whole house was. Like the, the staircase you walk up and other parts of the house, he had he had gotten all the artwork for the, the card set that was going to come out and he had the artwork. It wasn't put in a flat file of Dark Horse or whatever. It was in his house, matted and framed all over like a like his temporary art show. <laughs> and I said, wow, you got this stuff matted and framed already in the walls. He goes, oh, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's temporary. It's going to come down and go back to everybody. Uh-huh. But for now, I have it up. Yeah, I yeah. Like, oh, my yeah, God. Yeah, like a little museum going on. So in the hilarious. The, 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 the shrine to, you know, 
Um, but yeah, he's a very interesting guy. Um, he did this thing with his drawing board that I, I kind of got the idea to do, Yeah, which is he had this uh, – over his drawing board was a huge piece of plexiglass and then he put – um, images underneath it oh, of see. all the things that he liked, his character and things he liked, and yes. Jack Kirby over here and Steve Rudolph oh, yeah, or whatever, yeah. uh-huh. like influences and things. And so I thought, what a great idea to yeah. make your drawing board look like a collage of oh, what's in your head. Yeah. So I did the same thing, and I still do it. Yeah. And I would add and subtract, and I don't and always of, see the stuff underneath, you know. But yeah, but it harnesses like your creative energy into that. Yeah, and I think for 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 someone who's drawing, you would see more of it because you're moving pages around. Because I what I do on my board is I have like a I have these pieces of masonite or artboard, right? And I tape the pieces of that I'm working on because when you're painting, you usually tape stuff down so uh-huh. it doesn't get warped. So I put things on uh, masonite so I can move them around. So if I have something I'm going to stop working on and put something down, I just lay it on top. So I could have three thick with three different pieces that I'm working on. They just stay on there, um, and then when you're done, you just peel them off. Mm-hmm. So. Um, but yeah, so it was really cool to do that. And uh, the, the, he got Frazetta. He got Kirby. I don't. I can't believe he got Frazetta. And yeah, the the card set was came as a little box. And it was a really cool idea. Um, but that piece, uh, he definitely he's used it. A, he used it a couple of times mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. some other things. But yeah, it was pretty fun. Mainstream superheroes. You actually, yeah. you know, let's go back to them for a little bit because at this point, kind of like two thousand two. You're starting to kind of um, get involved it, in Ultimate Spider-Man special. In 2002, you did one with Spider-Man and Blades in it. So there's, yeah. again, a monster theme going on. Yeah, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Then uh, the JLA, the Justice League of America, Seven Caskets. Yeah. You wrote and painted that. And mm-hmm. what's interesting is you have, you know, the Justice League, superheroes, but they're in- encountering large underwater monsters then they kind of die and become demonic versions of themselves. And, and then Wonder Woman has almost looks like Lily Munster in a way when <laughs> yeah, you kind of did that her. Yeah, she kind of a vamp- vampire. Yeah, vampire kind of deal. And, uh, <laughs> and it's kind of like a morbid take on the JLA. So, so tell us, like, you know, in approaching Spider Man, you know, throwing Blade in there and then the JLA and having like this kind of monstrous take on this, you know, it, tell us about putting those together. So, it, yeah. In 2002 or 2001, I uh, was supposed to do a three-issue Ultimate Spider-Man team-up arc. And I was supposed to do the art, and, I, and Brian obviously was going to write it. And we were going to do the Marvel 70s monsters, Morbius, mm-hmm. Dracula, yeah. you know. And it was like three months worth of work. And I was really excited to do it. And it would have been, yeah, me penciling and inking and someone, or uh, you know, doing the colors or whatever. I think, or it might have been painted. I can't remember. But whatever it was, it was going to be three months worth of work. And I think it was going to be black and white for me. And uh, then what happened was, is Brian was doing all these different books and I guess decided to drop Ultimate Team Up. And then they decided to drop the book from being published completely. They, they I don't know if it's because the sales were low, but what they said was that Brian's so busy that he had to drop a book. And we can't think of anyone else who could take over for him, which I found not a credible statement. You can't find anyone who could take over Ultimate Team Up to make it cool. Yeah. Mm, you could. But for whatever reason, they decided to drop it. But then – so there goes my three months worth of work. I see. So what happened was – and there were other people I'm sure who was set up to do stuff too. Um. So, uh, so Brian says, well, we're going to do a uh, final issue that's like a double size, you know, giant final issue. And you can do, a, you know, a, a chapter, a part of that. Okay. So my three months uh, job was shrunk, shrunk down to seven pages. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. So I was not thrilled. And, uh, we, and I, I thought it was going to be Spider-Man and Morbius. And then they said, well, you got that Blade movie coming up. So Joe Quesada and I were thinking, oh, Blade, I see. Uh-huh. There's a new Blade coming. And I go, Blade, okay. Yeah, okay, I'll do Blade. Venice goes, uh, just knock it out of the park and just really show them what you can do. So, you know, I, so I pencil and ink this, this seven page story, came out and no one cared. You know, the thing was over. Cool, uh, Michael Golden cover on the book, okay, you know? Okay. Um, and there was a lot of people in there, a lot of different artists, uh, represented in that book, but it didn't really go anywhere for me. I didn't get any more work from Marvel or Brian after I that. I see. It's just, okay. just like, you know, 
Hey, Brian, I want to do an electric cover. Oh, well, it's not up to me. That was the answer. It was cool to do Spider-Man because Spider-Man's not a comfortable character for me to do. Yeah. I, I didn't grow up drawing him because it, it's just not at my wheelhouse to draw all his webs. I can draw him. Out of, I can draw him just fine. But it was kind of cool in that way to yeah. be able to, to kind of do that for for at least seven pages. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So then – um, but before that, I had finished Giant Killer with Dan Raspler and I wanted to do something else. And – this is like 99, 2000, something like that. Uh, we talked about doing it because you want to do a Justice League like one shot because they were doing those. They were doing these Justice League prestige format one shots, 48 pages. So I came up with this idea that uh, the JLA become sort of monster versions of themselves. And the idea was that they discover um, all these start, horrible things start happening all over the world. And the seven kings of this primordial kind of primitive prehistoric version of Earth are, are resurrected from their caskets. Yeah. And they start to wreak havoc. And they're very powerful like sorcerers and they're inhuman. And and they used to rule the world at one time when the continents didn't look like they do I now. see. Uh-huh. Okay, so it's, it's another age. During Pangea. And the idea, it's the, the idea that the human race is just one of several intelligent – civilizations that have sprung up over time and then gone away and this new one comes and takes its place. Interesting, yeah. Civilizations rise and fall. And we have no idea of the real prehistory of hum- of, of not humankind, of the earth. At the center of this is this god of chaos that lives in the bowels of the earth. And guess who knows about this stuff but hasn't been telling anybody? Aquaman. Because Aquaman is the one in this story who is the keeper of these ancient secrets that mankind really doesn't need to know. So all these crazy things start happening and Aquaman explains to them. He takes them down to the bowels of the, the ruins of this city in, under, you know, deep underwater, underwater yeah. and shows them this map of what the world used to look like and the kingdoms that were, you know, these uh, places that were, you know, cut up and, and, and they were all, you know, divided up and and who were the good guys and bad guys and who ran things and all this kind of stuff. And so it's all coming back. And so uh, the um, the story was pretty wild and out there. And then we get to the point where the JLA, in order to fight the god of chaos, have to align themselves with chaos and be changed by this chaos energy into these these chaos beings yeah and it's the only way they can fight it on its own terms right and so that's why they become these sort of monster versions of themselves and the 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 danger is is that they could go too far you know um and how are they going to come back from it and you know they do because it's not an else world (laughs) in the end everything has to go back to normal that was yeah that's one of the things the editor says well everything has to go back to normal at the end and i took a lot of cues from dan because they're they're their characters they're not mine Mm -hmm. so when he said well let's do this and this and i said okay and so one of the ideas was that um, there's a disagreement between two characters that in the end gets resolved, you know. And uh, so we had that. I think it's between Superman and, and uh, Aquaman. And at the end of the story, one of the things I came away with was Aquaman would be a cool character to do these kind of stories with where Aquaman's the one who has all the lore, the secret knowledge. Right, because it's all underwater, buried somewhere. And, and we, we actually talked about like a miniseries or right. something where, where Aquaman is kind of the keeper of secrets. And it never, never amounted to anything, but it was kind of But cool. it's an interesting concept, which I like, actually. But it was fun. And yeah, Wonder Woman had this kind of like streak in her hair and she looked sort of vampiric. And But they all had that. They all had that kind of thing. And um, that was kind of fun to do. And people, I guess people were sort of more or less expected from me. Oh, look, Brereton's doing Nocturnals with the JLA. So, you know, so, so 12 pages, it takes it probably about 30 days to do 12 pages. That was 48 pages. So that took about four months of work then. It was more than that just because uh, – Because you're also doing other stuff at the same time. Well, you know, 12 pages a month, you have to – well, first you have to get around to the point where you've like done all your layouts. You've approved the story. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wasn't writing dialogue per se <clears throat> ahead of time, but I had in mind what they would say and stuff. So I was doing the artwork plus I was writing the dialogue. So it took more than four months, you know. But uh, what happened was I had about – 20, 12 pages to go, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. I was halfway through when they put it on the on the schedule, uh-huh. which they are not supposed to do. Right. But DC would do it to me all the time, and so you have to do twelve pages or twenty four pages, and you have to get them done because the book is coming out and the book needs to go to press, and you don't have enough time to spend the real time. So I had to kind of like really just go wild on the last uh, 
part of the story and just kind of just just knock it out yeah. as fast as I could. Interesting. Which sucked because I think it could have been better. And there's some cool stuff in there, you know, but I feel like some of the battle scenes could have used more finessing if mm-hmm. I had more time to really focus on them. And that's another thing too is when you're doing 12 pages with a handful of characters, yeah, you can do 12 pages a month. But when you're putting all these guys and 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 every pa- and every page and maybe some in, in every It's a lot of work. I needed to what yeah. I should have done and was I should have I spread them out, but I should have spread them out even more. And I did try and do that, put them in teams. You know, Dan and I talked about that, yeah. put them in teams. Well, that's but what a lot of end, these team books do is they split them up into the yeah. teams. Just, I didn't think of that being the reason, I did do that, though. but there was, there was too much teamed together stuff. So I'm doing, okay, do him. And when you're painting it, you have to paint everybody in all the colors and you have to really be precise about everybody's costumes and it's a lot of work Mm. and when you get to the point where there's seven of them fighting seven of these bad guys on these pages i really needed to be able to slow down yeah and i just didn't have time to slow down i see and uh but other than that you know i it was fine it's a beautiful book though thank you oh yeah uh, it's weird to do um and then after that um there was no more dc work after that, and I, I ended up doing um, uh, Nocturnal's uh, miniseries. Interesting. It's Oni. Is that just because um, basically the uh, like editors kind of move on to other places, so a new batch comes in and they just don't know you as well? Is that how that works? Raspler was just, I think, had moved on. I see. I think he felt like the only reason to have me do anything was Monsters, which... Again. But again, I was doing other things. So when you were doing this uh, seven caskets with JLA, mm-hmm. there was this feeling of, uh, hey, can you make it, this a monster story? Like, is that was that the well, expectation? I had done Giant Killer. We talked about me doing Justice League. Mm-hmm. I had this idea for um, a Justice League story that had a little bit of a super. The idea was there's this kind of like a barbaric sword and sorcery character they would go up against, mm. and then eventually it just kind of turned into this thing where they were going to um, become these monsters and stuff which was fine but then i think dan was just like i'm gonna take a break from monster dan brereton for right. a while or something even though i could have done anything yeah you know but by that time i also was talking with oni about doing nocturnals so, right there you go nocturnals got brought over to oni presses around 2003 you also did gun witch outskirts of doom around yeah this time. so what happened was is when um uh oni started up with bob shrek at the helm one of the first things we talked about doing was doing uh, was collecting Nocturnals, the Black Planet, the first Nocturnals miniseries, as a trade paperback, which they did. It looked great. And then uh, talking about doing new Nocturnals. Yeah. And so I pitched uh, The Dark Forever, which is this three-issue Nocturnal story. And then the, the, another, the secondary idea was that the, the, those issues would come out bi-monthly. And then in the intervening months, we would do a – Gun Witch miniseries. I see. I would write, do covers for, and then we 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 wanted Ted Nafy to draw it. Uh-huh. There's a friend of mine who's super. You're going to meet him one of these days. Super talented. Um, he hadn't really come into his own as a creator yet, like he would with uh, with uh, Courtney Crummer and the Night Things and a bunch of his other creator on things. And he drew the heck out of the story. Yeah. So I remember I I um, laid out the Gun Witch story on a trip to visit some friends in Montana with my family and my dad was doing all the driving and I sat in the back with Hunter in this minivan that we rented and I, I, I laid out the entire story for the gun witch, uh-huh. but the, the nocturnal stuff was already in motion. Right. So yes, yeah, so I worked on the nocturnal stuff. Ted was drawing the gun witch stuff. I was writing it all doing covers and uh, it, it got late toward the end. Um, I moved to uh, from Truckee to Verdi and my parents were helping me with the kids because you know raising three kids basically by myself with my parents help yeah. when we moved to Verdi they were 25 miles away so I didn't have the same kind of help it slowed things down then I got into a relationship with Chartreuse who was in Sacramento that slowed things down in a good way yeah. you know my life wasn't just revolving around kids work kids work kids work and so it slowed things down but mostly it was about being outside of the comfort zone of having my parents helping with the kids yes. so that I could they could help take up the slack so I could spend more time working I see and that slowed things down and I didn't realize how much it was slowing things down until only was like you know you're behind we're talking a month behind not months and months behind um and uh it did it came out when it was basically when it was more or less when it was supposed to and and I was pretty happy with it the only thing that what that I regret, and it's, is that 
when it, I didn't scan my own pages and send in scans because back and then you still were sending back that time we were still sending artwork in to, to for them to scan it and then send it back to you I should have scanned it all myself because Oni decided instead of having it scanned they decided to um, have a, a digital camera to shoot mm. the artwork in the digital camera mm. so if you look at some of the pages mm. of Dark Forever you'll see where at the very bottom of the page it goes a tiny bit out of focus maybe Mm. It's not quite, and you're not catching all the nuances and all the detail. Uh -huh. And there have been people who have who have said, "I don't really like the art on that one as much." Well, if you saw the original pages, you'd probably like the art just fine. Yes. And uh, when I finally figured that out, it was way too late. I see. It was already in production. Yeah. So there were some little inconsistencies and things like that. Like they took, like when they put the they put out the Dark Forever as a trade paperback, my name isn't on the cover, and they didn't bother to like. Say, oh, you know, we forgot to put your name in the cover. We're right. sorry. I brought it up and they got really defensive. It's just kind of sad. Interesting. I really wanted to work with them more and they just they didn't. It just never happened after that. Ha has Oni Press changed, changed since you first worked with them like that? They've totally changed, but in ways that I wouldn't quite be aware of because I, after the Nocturnals, I didn't do anything else with them. I see. We were all like gung ho together. <clears throat> and then for some reason, they felt like I had, I don't know. I really don't know what their feeling was. They, I feel like they, um, you know, one thing I will tell you is if someone's paying you much more money to do a book than they would normally pay other creators that yeah. are doing books for them, you really should put – if you're putting that much – if you're investing that much in something, you should not You should invest more in marketing and sales I see. and promoting the book because if you want a return on your investment, you have to treat it like it's – it's what you paid for. Yeah. So if, if you're doing 10 books a month and you're paying 50 or $100 a, a page to these creators and then you're paying much, much more to some other creator, you really should put more work and time into promoting that book. And I'm not saying mm. they didn't put work and time Because without the it, promotion, then it doesn't really hit. Right? I feel like it was a little more than they were ready to – they bit off a lot. I see. And – um it was great to do it, and I liked working with them, and I would have been happy to work with them again. But it just that was just the end of things, mm -hmm. and it's just that's just the way it goes. You right, know, I, right. Don't, I don't bear any ill will toward any of those guys. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I uh, I'm I'm thankful that we got to work together, and we did um, a book called uh, Troll Bridge that uh, they put out in 2000. That was like this one shot Halloween book. It yeah. was all colored in black and white and orange. Got a bunch of different artists to come in and draw different sort of chapters of the story. And that whole thing is set up to where Halloween Girl is going through these, going to these different worlds on Halloween night. And every world is drawn and sometimes even written by different creator team. So we had Jay Stevens, we had Jill Thompson, we had uh, Bruce Tim is in there, Adam Warren's in there, John Hebink, uh, the um, Landry Walker and Eric, Eric, um, jones you know the little gloomy team at the mm -hmm, time mm -hmm. and it just all flowed it was so fun to do that book you know and that was my one of my first times where i was sort of acting kind of as an editor i see and, i mean not that we didn't have an editor but i was helping sort of wrangle some of these people and that was really fun to do so we put out some really cool stuff you know and everything got collected as trades never saw a dime from any of the trades that's kind of that happens sometimes i remember there was i think black planet went to second printing and I never saw a royalty check. And I just was like, you know, okay. <laughs> you ever asked? You ever kind of think, okay, I'm going to ask? I could have pushed. That? Yeah, I could have pushed harder, but I just, I don't know. I don't know. It's just, um, it was you don't, just you don't want to create a conflict if there doesn't have to be one. Well, I mean, I think maybe they thought that if they sent me more comps of books or something, that, that would take up the slack for it. But I, I kind of got the feeling like that if they, could have if they had no problem just sending me a check they would have and then maybe they needed the help so part mm -hmm. of me maybe wanted to yeah. just like lay Almost off kind of lay off and like take it easy on them a little but then again that's not a good business so you know I yes. don't know if i would do it that way now right right you have to kind of think about both things sometimes moonstone a company that you did it, it, kind of interesting work kind of a pulp style anti-heroes you did the spider yeah. The bat, yeah. The bat, uh, the black bat, rather. And these yeah. are like pulp magazine characters, like uh, you know, kind of gun-toting, kind of detective types. Then you also did like werewolf, Dracula for the same company, Moonstone. Two different things. You got like mm -hmm. pulp magazine mm -hmm. kind of characters and doing their covers. Then you have like monsters, like Universal monsters for the pulp characters. Did you look at old? You know, pulp magazines to kind of get the visuals. Oh, yeah. How did that all work yeah. out? I mean, Joe, who runs Moonstone, also has a couple of comic shops uh, in Illinois. 
he publishes the comics kind of as like a labor of love. He does a great job with what he has. And I tried to be as accommodating with the low budgets as I could until mm-hmm. I just couldn't anymore. Mm-hmm. And so I did a lot of covers because they were fun. And then I, you know, oh, yeah, you can sell the originals and stuff. But it was just kind of fun. And to be honest, around that time, I wasn't I didn't have a lot of work. I wasn't being offered a lot of work. So I would just take I would take really low paying gigs thinking this could be fun to do. I'll sell the original art. But that's not a way to run your business. So eventually when you get to the point where you don't have to do that anymore, you don't. But I don't have anything bad to say about working with Joe at Moonstone because mm-hmm. he's a nice guy. I like his aesthetic. And I did some Kolchak uh, Night Stalker covers. Oh, yeah? Okay. A uh, bunch of spider covers I did, which were really fun to do. Uh-huh. Um, Black Bat, like a Phantomos type character. Uh-huh. I can't remember uh-huh. what they call him. And those were just fun to do. I mean, especially the spider stuff. And yeah, of course, I looked at the, I looked at all the pulps. And I love pulp magazines. I love the pulp aesthetic. And ever since I... S- went to a show in Oregon in the early 90s and found a, a dealer who was selling a bunch of old pulp magazines. I didn't really realize that I had – I felt like a kinship to them more than a lot of people in comics because mm. I never really – I could never really look at anyone who was doing stuff in comics in the 90s and kind of go, oh, I'm kind of in that neighborhood. Yeah. I didn't really feel like that kind of kinship with any of the other comic book painters. I mean, I love those guys. Yeah, you know, sure. I, they're, yeah. A lot, some, they're amazing. But it didn't feel like we were in the same neighborhood necessarily. Mm-hmm. And then you see the pulp stuff. And I'm not saying I'm a pulp artist, but like I felt a lot more kinship towards That's it. That's really yeah. interesting. And I hadn't seen a lot of that stuff. I'd seen a little bit of it, but I hadn't seen enough of it. And so, yeah, I definitely, um, you know, that stuff is extremely well done. Yeah. It's sad that a lot of those covers were just painted over and painted over until they just burned the canvases. Um, there's some great stuff and great ideas. And that's one of the things about Nocturnals is that I felt like there was a lot of Pulp Fiction in there because of some of the Pulp yeah. Fiction that we don't really know necessarily know that much about or that wasn't as popular, say, the you know the Shadow or Doc Savage, is a lot of melding of things, weird right. stories, yeah. you know, melding together ideas. And they don't always work. There was a character, one of my favorite Pulp characters is Captain Satan, who only lasted for a few issues. But I love the idea this guy's called Captain Satan. Now, we have the son of Satan and stuff like that yeah, now in comics. Yeah. But a guy called Captain Satan who's a good guy is such a bizarre idea. Right. So I actually wanted to do something with that character. And I came up with these kind of weird arcane things. And I wrote Yeah, there was another guy in the pulp, Satan Hall. The pointy ears and like a kind of the Spock here. way of kind of um, getting your attention and what was acceptable, you know. Yeah. Um, there's also a character called the, uh, the Crimson... Don Diavolo, the Crimson Magician, or the oh, okay. mm-hmm. Crimson Wizard, or something like that. There's right. some pretty cool covers for that. Some of it's not really easy to read. Right, you mean the text, no, yeah. The, A lot of that stuff, the pulp stuff, it's all about the covers. For me, for, if you're going to read Pulp Fiction, you should read, like, you know, Hammett, Chandler. Chandler right, is right. kind of coming out of pulps, but right. Chandler for the sure. Good stuff, yeah. Quite a few other people who are doing stuff, you know, obviously Lovecraft, Howard. And have Robert E. Howard, exactly. Last Battle, 2011. And it was like set in ancient, uh, ancient Rome. Yeah. 2011 was when the American version came out. So, yeah, set in ancient Rome. What was that all about? And did you get a lot of your imagery, like looking at the old Spartacus and Cleopatra movies? Like, <laughs> it, was that part of the visual that worked its way in there? When I was approached to do Last Battle by uh, Disney Italia out of Milan, I was developing a, a show for Jetix, the Disney's... Uh, like eight to 10 year old viewers adventure uh-huh. program. Uh-huh. At the same time I was doing. The yeah. Last battle. Ultimate battalion. The last so battle, they yeah. come to me and they want me to do this uh, Romans versus Celts thing. And I'm like, you want me to do that? And this was the case that was the opposite of like apple. We see apples. We, we know you can do oranges yeah. or we don't think you can do oranges because we only see you do apples. Yeah. They saw apples and they thought he'd be perfect for oranges. That sounds like a European thing. Uh, maybe because I asked them, I said, well, is there fantasy in this story? And they're <laughs> like, no, it's sword and sorcery or peplum. It's, it's, you know, not really. I go, well, these characters believed in gods as if they were real. Is there any of that kind of stuff in the story? And like, well, maybe there could be. I don't know. Not really. I was like, so what do they want me for? And I I'll, and I tried to turn it down a couple of times, but I didn't want to turn it down because this was like an opportunity, you know? Yeah, to stretch your wings so a bit. So they tell me the story is about the siege of Elysia, like I know what that is. <laughs> it's where uh, uh, Vercingetorix, or if you're Italian, it's Vercingetore. Vercingetorix is a Gaulish leader who uh who 
Caesar lay, uh, laid siege to this town with his people for, for a while until they finally gave up. And uh, this Gaulish leader uh, sur- surrendered to, to – very famously surrenders to, um, to Caesar. He's prisoner for several years. When Caesar finally gets his, his triumph, which is this – this when the military dictator comes home with all his uh, you know his accolades and he has it, they give you this big this processional parade and then they pull out all your enemies that they've been throwing in jail for years to wait for you and then they execute them publicly and it's just this big big thing it's called a triumph. I didn't know about any of this stuff. Okay, I we didn't study ancient history in high school. We didn't study Julius Caesar. I don't know anything about this stuff. So I sit down. I start drawing. They said, well. This character, who's like a retired Roman general, this guy Rodius, they describe that this uh, this Roman general is retired, is asked by Julius Caesar to go in and take out this uh, Gaulish leader who is trouble, and he is he's going to lead an army to to aid the siege and it will beat Caesar if he does. So I'm going to send you in and take this guy out. It's described that he has a dirty half dozen that are his handpicked yeah. you know, guys. Yeah. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to sit down and see if I can just draw some of this stuff. Yeah. So I start thinking of, of ways to kind of play against type for these characters. Like one of the characters is long blonde hair, almost like a Greek. So you're designing the visuals for and these one characters. One guy's really yeah. scarred up. Like he's been, you know, all he's fat. He's had boiling pitch turn on, you know, and he's just, he's just, there's another guy who's like a, um, he's a Nubian warrior. So he was a former slave who's become a Roman citizen and a soldier because that happened a lot back then. And then um, one guy is uh, – there was a gladiator type guy who had like a mask on. He always wore a mask. And so I just started these draw- – and a female Celtic warrior, you know. So I start doing these drawings. I send them in and they really like them. Now, were the costumes – were they like uh, – did they fit the time period? Not really because yeah. I didn't really know, you know. Um, then I did this piece that's at the cover and, uh, and they're like, oh, okay. So, so the writer, Tito Ferracci, who's writes a lot of stuff for Disney and he writes this comic called Tex that's very popular over there. Very prolific guy. So he likes it all. He uses all of it. Yeah. In his own way. Because I don't really know what a gladiator is, so I draw a gladiator, which is not a gladiator. There were only certain types of gladiators. There I were see. like, you know, there, you didn't just make them up. So he became a Celtic warrior, wore this mask, and he was a headhunter, and all this kind of stuff. Which there's all these different stories about whether or not the Celts, um, the Gauls, took trophies head heads, or whether they were uh-huh. cannibals. Basically, see, and so I I go on this crash course. Yeah. So I think you know what I'm going to show all these editors that aren't hiring me that what I can do. If Frank Miller can screw up history with 300, which he most certainly did, I can I can do my yeah, version of 300 right. That's and, and show that I have that. range, okay? And it's not even it's not even about Frank Miller. It's just showing that I have some range. Yeah. I can do things that they don't think I can do. Right. That right. aren't monsters. And but can I get invested? So these characters, if I can do draw these characters, yeah, I can be invested. I can I can get invested in these guys. I can yes. make it part make it me. So like, there's a little know, bit of a challenge for for yourself. Totally. And a learning pr- – I mean you learned about And the writer added in Rome some uh, – Yeah. Oh, I had to – basically I had to go on a crash course yeah. and teach myself all that stuff. Right, right. And I ended up learning things that they didn't even know, some stuff they didn't even know okay, in a couple of points. Um, so yeah, there's not a lot of pictorial uh, reference. The first thing that really got me onto it was I was in San Diego. The, uh, Disney Italia was there at their own booth and they were handing out um, – this like these posters of the cover piece I had done, and it's uh it's Rodius the, the the Roman fighting the Gaul, and he's got like his winged helmet and all this kind of stuff, and he's wearing his sort of armor and they're fighting and it's it's a cool image, and these just out of the blue at San Diego these two guys show up dressed like Roman legionnaires, and they're looking at my poster, and they're like uh, and I tell them about the story and they go yeah. well that armor is all wrong. These guys were reenactors. They were they were yeah. Roman legion, re, re, legion reenactors that just showed up at Comic Con. Never seen them before or since. <laughs> they just happened to be there to help me out, like yeah. little guardian, little messengers to come and help me. And they tell me <laughs> how wrong I'm doing because that's Lorica segmentata armor. That's not around till 300 years uh, uh, AD. I see. I was like, oh, okay. And I go, well, how would they have dressed? He goes, um. Back then, Caesar's legions, the tenth, the tenth legion or whatever, they would have wore chainmail tunics and and uh, well, you know, all these things. And I was like, oh my god! So I got I I got to really pay attention to this stuff because I want to get it right. So one of the things that you do not do is look at any Hollywood Roman films. They're almost all wrong. 
they're almost all wrong. You know how like they're always wearing these like gauntlet things, yeah. these wristbands? No one wore a wristband. In really? Rome, unless they were an archer. If you were an archer, you'd wear something to I protect see. your forearms. So those movies but, didn't get it right. No. But nobody knows no. the difference. The armor Question. that's being worn in the Passion of the Christ by the the, the soldiers that are scourging right. Jesus, they're wearing Lorica Segmentata. That's when that stuff would have been used. So I there's, see. there's somewhat of that there. But you have to really know – you have to find out on your own. There are some books that are like military uh, costume books that I found. There's a whole series of them. That helped. I also read uh, Caesar's Gallic Wars, the translation of Caesar's Gallic's War, Gallic Wars, which is his – it's the only thing we know about that time period is because yeah. Caesar wrote his memoirs. But Caesar is an unreliable narrator because he describes things like fantasy characters and creatures and stuff. He also says some horrible things about the Celts or the Gauls, Celts, yeah, same yeah, thing, yeah. which aren't true. You know, they make it seem like they're just barbarians and they were they were animals, but they had their own road systems, they had their own yeah. civilization. Right, right. It just got it got absorbed and conquered by Rome. So I became this like insufferable, you know, bore for a long time with my family because I just I had all this information that I was <laughs> I was absorbing and uh -huh. it would come it would come out sometimes. So yeah, I could have given lectures about. So people who haven't read it would expect to see something pretty visually accurate of that time period. It sounds like I I tried my best, and the thing it's funny is like leather leather uh, armor. None of that leather armor su survived, so it's hard to know what it was like. Right. So if someone's if there was a lot of leather being worn, but I don't really necessarily know what it looked like because it rotted away. Yeah. Also, back then, most soldiers were using slings. Yeah. yeah. In fact. More most soldiers were using that more than like bows and arrows. They were deadly accurate with their slings. I see. They could take you out from you know, you like know, hundred yards. Like David and Goliath. Oh, style that was slings. very. That was like the pistol of the time. I that see. was the gun or the rifle of the time. Um, Rome. The average Roman soldier was five foot five foot five inches. Yeah. Tall. Sure. The, the Gauls were huge by comparison. The Romans could get in with their short swords. If they could get inside that the reach of the Gaul with his long sword, they could get him. You know, there was a reason why the, the Romans were very um they're very well uh organized. Caesar was a whole interesting character. He Caesar doesn't he's only in a couple of pages of the book, which is fine. And then uh Vercingetorix doesn't show up really at all. Uh, but I had to illustrate the siege of Elysia. In other words, I had to show the siege towers, I had to show what well, you've seen the book, right? Yeah, oh yeah. You've seen all the stuff they set up and everything. Yeah. Uh -huh. Um, there was a, there was a scene where, uh, a bunch of characters get killed and they don't even like, and Tito didn't even deal with the, a bunch of people getting killed. They just moved on. I go, wait, wait a second. This is like his friends. Yeah. Shouldn't there be some like moment taken for them, you know? And, and, um, and they're like, yeah, you're right. They should be buried. I go, well, they didn't bury their, they didn't necessarily bury their dead. They go, well, yes, they did. I go, well, yeah, but they burned bodies and then they buried them. Right. The Gauls just burned you. Yeah. You know, so, uh, and there's also a scene where Rhodius is in, um, he's at one of the arena games. This is before the Roman Coliseum. They just, they had arena games. So he's, he's in this, you know, the crowd watching these, um, these gladiators go at it. And, uh, he, someone tries to kill him and he's walking around with, he said, why is he wearing his toga over his head? I said, well, look at these bas relief sculptures of senators walking, walking together. They're wearing, you know, they're wearing their toga over their head like a hood. And that was so they either weren't going to be recognized or people couldn't throw stuff on their heads. You know, it was a way or to keep the sun off. It was just a way to wear your toga. I see. It's not something you ever seen very often. But I was paying attention with all these – anything I can get my hands on. So there's a scene where he's wearing it over his head and they went, oh, OK. I thought that was cool because right. you're not going to see that necessarily. Did I get any <laughs> – did anyone come and go, wow, it's really very accurate? Well, who's going to tell me that? You know, who's reading comics? Yeah, yeah. They don't know. They don't know. <laughs> so here's a funny question is if everyone's used to seeing the inaccurate stuff. Right. In the Hollywood movies and they see your stuff and they see it's real, you know, is or as real as there I a can make it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or as real as you can make it. Was there some predicament saying, well, should I just make it more like the Hollywood stuff since that's more recognizable? No. Or was it more like, well, let's keep this. I had so much respect for the stuff that I was learning and I, I had so much yeah. fascination for it that I yeah. wanted to get it right. And I wanted to do it for Rome. Yeah, for Italy. There you for the go. People, for you know, because for them, they yeah. have a sense of what's going. on And there's on with a lot that. of people yeah. who would know. One thing was also interesting was there was uh, Rhodius wears the leopard pelt 
because when they were doing the arena games, they were catching all, they were capturing animals from Africa and, and other parts of the world that they sort of dominated, and they'd bring them back to the arena games, and they would just slaughter them wholesale. Yeah, they would let a bunch of lions, tigers, and panthers and whatever animals loose, yes. and they would set people against them. So they were just slaughtering people and animals like by by the hundreds and thousands all right, the time. Right. And so I thought, you know, it would make sense that maybe Rhodius would be have, would have been given some pelt. So he wears kind of this pelt. Yeah. Um, it's like a spotted, like a leopard or panther pelt or uh-huh. something. And um, in this, at one point in the story, he has to fight one of his friends who's like a turncoat. And they strip down and he's wearing his pelt. And they said, um, can you take out the spots on it? Because some people are saying he looks too much like Tarzan. Yeah, yeah. I was like, what? Uh-huh. He looks like Tarzan with a sword and a kilt and yeah, a yeah. short hair. I go, okay, fine. Yeah. So I went in digitally, took all the spots. Yeah, because Tarzan had a loincloth. That's not the same. Tarzan, if he was wearing a spotted loincloth, it's only because it was a texture. He probably would have had a lion loincloth maybe, yeah, which would yeah. have been blank. So that's, you know, just that's as Tarzan is the yeah. next thing. Uh-huh. And I, I just, there were these little touches I threw in that sometimes work and sometimes didn't. But yeah, that was kind of funny. They wanted me to take the spots off. The next project that I, I really loved going through, The Simpsons Meet Cthulhu. Oh, yeah. Yeah, written by Len Wein. Yeah. And uh, for Bongo Comics. Yeah. Uh, you, you did... <laughs> Beautiful art for this because it was like painted, mm-hmm. and uh, for for Treehouse of Horror nineteen, uh, mm-hmm. twenty thirteen. That and, was my and- second. That was my third Treehouse of Horror story for them. Ah, because earlier in uh, two thousand, I did uh, a Lord of the Rings. Oh, thing. okay. It was fully painted, yeah. so it looks like a Lord of the Rings graphic novel kind. Not necessarily yeah. based on the movie, but then the Simpsons get dropped into their world. There you go, and cause havoc. And that one was written by Ian Boothby. So Ian Boothby wrote the Lord of the Rings adaptation. I illustrated it. Ian's very funny. Uh, we didn't really have a lot of back and forth, but uh-huh. he's a super good guy, very sweet guy, funny as heck, did a lot of stuff. Powerpuff he Girls can, and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, that's right. He can totally nail it. And he's a stand-up too. So that was really fun to do. And then when I was done with that painted story, yeah. they said, we have a uh, black and white story in the same issue. Can you do it? It's a shorter story, but the artist couldn't finish it or something. It written by uh, Paul Dini. It was a take on the Poe's story, The Cask of um, um, Amontillado. A quick pencil job because they didn't have a lot of time. And then right. I said, can Ted Nafee ink it? Ted Nafee inked it. So N-A-I-F-E-H. Uh, he's, he drew okay. the outskirts of Doom. Oh, okay, there you go. Book. Uh-huh. So that was really fun. And that appeared in the same issue. I see. So you painted the other one, but then you penciled the other yeah, story. Yeah, And I had all this like uh, steam left over because I finally, like after doing that whole 18 page uh, story, I could yeah. finally figure out how to, I finally had to figure out how to draw the Simpsons. Right. Because it was like a learning curve. I didn't have yes. time to sit there and do all these drawings before I started. Yeah. So. Um, so it took a while to get warmed up on those guys. And by that time I was ready just to draw Homer Simpson, whatever. So, um, and they do want things on model cause I could have drawn my version, but they want things to be stay on model. Yeah. Right. Right. So, uh, so years later I'm talking to Bill about doing another story. I said, have you guys ever done like a, a Lovecraft? And Bill said, you know, to be honest, I'm not really familiar with Lovecraft's work. I know who he is and everything, but I've never really read his stuff. And I go, Oh wow. Well, that would be really fun to do like a, Cthulhu kind of thing. Yeah, and, I, yeah. and I feel comfortable enough with the Lovecraft stuff to have ideas for how to put in these little uh, uh, Lovecraft asides to his work. Right. The idea that like maybe Homer, there's some 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 town somewhere where everyone has the Homer Simpson look rather than the Innsmouth look. If you know the story, the Shadow Over Innsmouth, everyone has kind of this kind of weird wall-eyed look because right. they're all descended from the deep ones. Wall-eyed Homer, as in the eyes are pointed sideways, yeah, right? Yeah, like, you know, yeah. he gets sometimes. So the idea is like that Homer goes there and they mistake him for one of them. And uh, they try and chase him around and stuff. And maybe I should have written it myself. But I thought Len, who did lots, plenty of Lovecraft stuff with Swamp Thing and many, many other stories, that Len, which maybe Len would be fun to write it with. And yeah. I wanted to work with Len. So they asked Len and Len said, yeah. So um, he, he, he turned in a, a script and his was less uh, pointed about the Lovecraft um, asides, the Easter eggs. I see. But it was very much like... I love the premise because 
Bart and Nixon have to clean the library. It's like yeah. a punishment. The yeah. library is in the basement and no one goes down there. Yeah. So true to life now. Yeah. Uh, and they find a, a copy of the Necronomicon. Yeah. And but my idea the Necro- was Necronomicon, the Necronomicon yeah. is like a paperback scholastic books edition. <laughs> it says abridged, you know, oh, 75 cents or whatever. That's like from funny. the 70s. Uh-huh. Um, kind of how like when I read 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea for the first time, it was yeah. like an abridged, you know, scholastic edition. And then he takes that home. He starts using it to get revenge or whatever. And uh, it was just really fun and a uh, horrific ending, you know, and just uh, goofy. Yeah. And um, yeah, fully painted. And that yeah, kind of stuff painted. takes a while because does, you're trying to, yeah. you're trying to be, it's a different way of working than kind of this sort of looser, more illustrative thing. It's the same thing like when you're doing superheroes, you know, yeah. you have the specific costume you have to stay, stay on model. So yeah. Yeah. I loved how it was painted where the Simpsons are their cartoon character but there's a certain extra shading that you could tell this was a darker place they're in. And then mm-hmm. when you have the Cthulhu, you know, monster in there. Yeah. And I'm just like, man, this is great. I scanned the artwork. I did a little bit of digital, maybe here and there on it, but not a lot. And then I sent in the digital. So I, even though, you know, technically Bongo is supposed to own the art because they do a buyout, uh, it's, it's just sitting in my flat file. It's nice. never going to get sold or anything. And if they asked for it back, I'd send it to them. But, but – they were like, no. And Bill was like, no, no, just hang on to it. I don't know. Maybe they'll send that stuff back to everybody now that they're sort of folded up. I don't know. You never know. Yeah, I might right. get my Lord of the Rings story back. Interesting. Um, at, around the same time that I was doing The Simpsons, I was also working on a Batman story, which uh-huh. would be my last thing I ever did for DC. I see. Okay. I was offered by an editor who became like more of like a group editor higher up, uh, Hank Canals. Uh, the opportunity to pitch uh, Legends of the, of, the, of the Dark Knight story for the digital series. And so I did. I pitched three stories. He said, um, I like two of them. Pick the one you want to do. So it's a fish out of water story, and it's called uh, Six Fingers. So in the story, a mobster's daughter, teenage daughter, gets uh, kidnapped, and no one's doing anything about it. Batman wonders why. So he goes to the mobster, Falcone, and it takes a while for him to get out because no one wants to tell him what's going on. He talks to the Joker. The Joker's too scared to talk about it. Matt Hatter won't talk about it. Falcone barely talks about it. He finally figures out that this he does his detective work, and he figures out that the last time she was seen was at this summer camp up in the mountains, with, and she he talks to her friend. And her friend tells her, oh, yeah, this woman came and visited her. And I thought she was like related to her. He goes, why? Because because they both have six fingers on each hand. I see. And the idea in the story is polydactyly is a sign of, of being a witch. So he goes up into the mountains uh, outside of Gotham in the middle of the night with his, his headlights turned off just <laughs> through the, the moonlit night to try and find her. So the story takes place uh, – the bulk of the story takes place on like this moonlit night in the mountains with Batman's like all alone. Yeah. And then he encounters this coven of witches. Yeah, yeah. And it's supposed to be creepy and scary and weird. Fish out of water story. And it is. It goes weird places. And I did not talk about the plot or anything about it with people because I wanted them to be surprised. Now, the idea is that there, it's a it's a four-part story. So it's it's 40 pages and a cover. And but when you're doing the, the the digital stuff, you're doing each page is actually two pages, a top and a bottom. That's because you look at the screen a certain way. So it was over sixty pieces of art when I was done, and I wrote story two. So uh, it was supposed to come out. It came out in 2015. Uh, the first part came out in 2015 at the end on December, and then subsequent uh, three months later, the whole thing was out, and you could just download like what for a dollar or two each yeah. episode or something. And then eventually it was supposed to be collected with other Legends of the Dark Knight stories I see. In, in, in like a, a, a you know a physical edition, right. a printed edition. And Derek Robertson was working on a story that was a five-parter that he didn't finish for quite a while. And I guess they were waiting on that to be able to put them together. Now, here's the weird part. Somewhere along the way, I lost track, but he finished his. It came out. It was published both ways and mine wasn't. Yeah. I don't know why. It's probably one of the coolest things I've ever done. Yeah. I'm I I I would almost say I was proud of it, but that's just kind of a weird weird thing to say, but I I'm happy with it. Yeah, you know? and right. I want people to see it. Yeah. And I would like it to be in print. And um <clears throat> it's not, and I don't know if it ever will be, but you can get it on uh, you know DC's uh platform. I don't know if you've seen it, but you should check it out. Yeah, yeah, I will. The the most recent thing you did for Marvel was that it was like an Alex Ross curated series and you did yeah. a classic X-Men short story. Yeah. Very much in line with like the Dave Cockrum, Len Wein X-Men totally. of the all new, all different X-Men. 
yeah. and uh, kind of the origin of the fastball special, basically. So, so <laughs> how funny, how yeah, did, yeah how'd that uh, come about? That sequence. I was it's just 2020, so I was getting ready to do the Giant Killer 20th anniversary big hardcover, and then Alex gets a hold of me out of the blue and says, "I'm I'm curating this uh, anthology series." And they ended up calling it Marvel Anthology. It was sort of in line with the uh, anniversary of Marvels. And he was handpicking artists to do these stories. You can write them yourself. You can work with a writer. Whatever you want to do, you can pick any character in the Marvel Universe. Just can't pick Conan. And I was like, oh, okay. And then so I started thinking, what do I want to do? You know, and, and, and do I have time to do it? Ten pages? Yeah, I can do it. Yeah, that sounds awesome. You know, I'm excited. And it took me a while to, to figure out which characters I was going to do, about a month. And then... Alex and I were talking and I settled on the new X-Men. You know? Yeah. And the storyline takes place like right after the events of uh, Giant Cro- Size X-Men number one. Yeah, the Krakoa adventure. They're back home. The only difference is is that all the X-Men are there. The idea is like what if all the X-Men decided to try and make it work as a team, yeah. including the Beast, who yeah, was yeah. in the Avengers at the, the time. The original uh, X-Men. It's, it's, so it's almost an Elseworlds in that respect. To make it simple, even though it wasn't simple because there's so many characters in every page, again. <laughs> yeah, there were, um, yeah. They're all called to be in, to train in the danger room together for the first time. They get there, the doors close, and there's a note that says, danger room is down. And they're like, what? They just called us down here, and it's, what do you mean it's not open? Yeah. It's broken? What's going on? So they're waiting. <laughs> they know what to do, so they're all waiting. They're on staircase. They're in front. There's a bunch of them. You know, Beast is hanging from a chandelier. And while they're waiting... Stuck in the elevator, so to speak. Yeah. They start to interact with each other. And they start to not all get along. And Logan's freaking jerk, you know? Yeah. And so is Warren. He's a jerk too. And people start butting heads and getting real. And the whole time, Xavier and Professor X and Scott are in another room watching it all take place. Yeah. And Gene knows what's going on because they're watching them to see how they interact with each other, how they're going to work together. You know, is this going to work? And then when things get to get kind of to the point where Wolverine and Beast are going to get into it, the doors open. So they go inside, they start training. And I mean, you know, I know you know the story. And then we see what happens. We see if there's any kind of turnover because they're like, I don't know if this Wolverine guy's going to work out. Right, right. But when they start working together as a team in training, it's it becomes clear that, yeah, okay, I think we have a team. This is kind of funny because I wasn't going to write it originally. I had the idea. They liked the idea. They said, yeah, let's do that. I said, what if Chris Claremont wrote it? How cool would that be? Yeah. To work with Chris right. on those characters. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like yeah, what yeah. a weird – cool thing yeah and they are like yeah we'll, we'll talk to chris so chris was working on uh he was gonna he was flying overseas to the uk this is 2020 so they tell him the story he writes an outline he sends it back i don't hear anything for a little while and then alex calls me he's agitated and he says uh you know, we got our thing from from uh, Chris, but it's totally different he said it in a bar they're not wearing their costumes Sabretooth shows up i go what he goes, oh, I'll send it to you, but you're not going to – I don't think you want – this isn't what we, we asked him for. This isn't what we, we agreed to do. You don't have to do it. And I go, well, I want to do the story that I – you know, the idea I came up with. He goes, we do too. I go, well, now what do we do? He goes, don't worry. Tom will take care of it. Hmm. Brief work. So he did. So he told Chris that we were going to go with me, I guess. I don't really know what was told, what he was told. But then he wasn't on it and it felt really weird. Yeah. And Alex goes, don't worry about it. He didn't do what we asked him to do. What are you going to do? You know, I was like, okay. Uh, you know, Alex has no problem with dealing with legends. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I guess. I was in uh, a terrific con in, in 2019. First time I'd ever done that show in Connecticut. It's a great show. Yeah. Shout out to Mitch Halleck. And you, you, you saw him out there, right? I'm talking to two guys at my table about this very thing that we were talking yes, about. Yes. The whole story, just telling two guys that came up. That about were, what happened, yeah. About what happened. And I turn around and Chris Claremont is walking down the aisle toward us, <laughs> all dressed in white. And I go, there he is right there. And I'm a little nervous because I was just talking about him, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nothing bad. No, yeah, just saying what happened. And I go, hey, Chris, are you mad at me? And he goes, What? He walks up to me. He goes, why, why would I be mad at you? So I, I kind of recounted the story and he goes, I never saw your story. I never saw that. So it just was never he communicated never saw it. to him? I, 
I thought they sent it to him. I'm pretty sure, but he never saw it. It's I easy see. to sometimes miss things in email. Yeah, that's true. Who yeah. knows? Whatever it was, he never saw it. I see. He went in cold, and that's why it's so different. And I went, oh. So I start to tell him my idea was, and he immediately starts rewriting it <laughs> while we're standing there. <laughs> and I thought, that's perfect. So well, when you say rewriting it, he was like, no, it'd be better if it was like this. Is that what you, oh, I, oh, oh, he I would never you. do that. Or he wouldn't say that. And I, and I was just giving him general broad strokes. Oh, I like, see. That guy would never say it like this. Now, I, okay. I could go and show it to him now and say, give it a read and let me know what you think of it later and see what he says. But I'm way too nervous. I'm way yeah. too insecure to do that. You know, maybe he'll just come up and tell me sometime. Yeah, that's wonderful. If I'm lucky, I'll never know. So – I do my story. Yeah. Um, and eventually you wrote it comes script. out. It yeah. takes, it's a little late because of pandemic, but yeah, it comes out. Yeah. I wrote a story. It took me a long time to work on that thing. Cause I was just trying to make it as good as possible. Yeah. It has a Cockrum vibe to it and the yeah. way the art works. I am not Alex Ross. I never will be found that out the hard way. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, the first page where they're all standing in there, it took me two weeks to paint that damn yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I just – There was a I lot of figures on it. each page. And I obsessed that over it. You know, I don't – if I had to do it over again, I could have done it in half the time, but I was just obsessing. Well, why do you think you obsessed on it? Is it because – Because I felt like I wanted to impress everybody and put my best foot forward and maybe this will lead to other things and you just – all these things that you think I'm yes. really working on. And, and I also – And also it's the X-Men that you loved yes, as a kid. Yes, yeah. exactly, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I'm I, – this is a big deal for me, you know? It's not just some job where I don't feel the pressure or it's just right. pure joy. Yeah. It was supposed to be. Part of the time I was doing it, I was thinking, why didn't you just do that? You should have done Deathlock and Killraven fighting Martians because then you should have just painted rubble instead of the interiors of the X-Men mansion. Yeah, right. You know what I mean? Or whatever. Or all these characters on every page. I was really kicking myself at one point for not having chosen the simpler idea, you know. Yeah, yeah. But that's okay. And then when it came out in, in comic form, it didn't really look great because for some reason it didn't print so well. And it wasn't until it was collected as that um, Marvel Treasury edition yeah. that it looks perfect. It looks just the way there it's supposed go. to look. And it looked the way it was intended. And then they offered me to do a cover, which turned out to be the variant cover for issue two, which was super fun to do. Yeah. And that was great. Yeah. <laughs> and imagine. then it sounds like you have a good relationship with Alex Ross too. Yeah, we came up around the same time together. Yeah. So um, we we don't we're not in touch like constantly, but you know we can I can talk to him anytime. He can call me anytime he wants. To call him. Yeah. Um, it was great that he thought of me, and I uh, put together a really good package with that. I, I would have loved to see them do that again, and just to be able to kind of like be set loose to do whatever you wanted. Yeah. That was so great. That was like, again, the kid in you is just like, wow, you're doing the new X Men. Yeah, you know, no, that's awesome. Do it, don't screw well, it up. I, I love that era too. That's like, I think that's like the, the, that I think that is my favorite era of X Men is that early, those early like first 30 issues. It was or so whatever. exciting to have these new characters show up and then they show up in the issue and then they show up in this giant size. And I'm, I was right there for all that yeah. stuff. And it was just exciting to see Marvel move in some new direction and, yeah. and, and bring in fresh blood because they yeah. hadn't done it for a while. That's right. They were doing it here and there. They had Nova and, you know, I remember Guardians of the Galaxy when they kind of brought them back and they were sort of peppering yes. them around. Yes. They never really got their own series. Right. Like Steve Gerber would kind of write random adventures. Defenders. Yeah. Or their, right. Uh, they showed up in Marvel right. Premiere right, or whatever. Right. Or like in Avengers with Korvac or whatever. Yeah. That I just. I that was exciting too. The idea that you could follow characters around different titles yeah. if they didn't necessarily have their own title. Yeah, I love it. And the yeah. X Men had that for about five years. Yeah, they were they were doing reprints, so they would just show up in these yeah. random things. It really, and it was weird. the original team just kind yeah. of walking around like Marvel kind of team up or early seventies versions of mm-hmm. those guys. Yeah, I remember I was into the X Men and I was reading uh, back issues. I was getting back issues. Yeah, of the X-Men. yeah. I was really yeah. getting into them for a little while there, and then you couldn't really get them. Yeah. They weren't really out. And then all of a sudden, here they come. X-Men 97. Yeah. You know? And you're like, holy crap. Yes. They're back, but who are these guys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and we already knew, well, we already knew about Wolverine because I've been reading Hulk. Yeah. He shows up there and you're like, again, super exciting. New character. Really yeah. cool. Right. And Storm, Nightcrawler, Colossus. I just love this And way, that's Dave Cockrum right there. It's Dave Cockrum. And before that, what did you have? You had Jack Kirby. Jack yeah. Kirby was the guy who did all that stuff. Yeah. He's the one that brought it all out. Right, right, That right. tells you a lot right there that, you know, I mean, there were definitely Roy Thomas has a hand. Yeah, so sure, sure. Characters. There was something special about <laughs> Dave Cockrum. He didn't, he wasn't afraid of creating new characters, creating whole new costumes mm-hmm. and new powers and. More flamboyant, the better. On the costumes, yeah, yeah, that's you know? right. Yeah, the little yeah. sash and whatever. Yeah. Total, and, uh, whole 
style that he he introduced because he, he brought Kirby. in that legion of superheroes vibe mm-hmm. of his legion of superheroes right right that was awesome too it was like 12 issues or whatever it was right and it's beautiful stuff and then he basically recreated those characters as the the lalandra's imperial guard mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. it's like each one has a legion of superheroes those counterpart. guys are super exciting and they were when they first came out i was like what is this, this i is discovered awesome. them toward the end when uh, the toward the end of the dark phoenix run because i took a break from comics in like yeah. 1970 well probably around the time star wars came out yeah yeah because i got really into star wars yeah. got really into like tolkien yeah, and some yeah. other stuff because the hobbit uh, tv movie came out that in 77 so I got into more reading and, and super into comic strips because for a while I wanted to be a comic strip yeah, artist. right, right. And so I got away from comics and then around the time that Dark Phoenix saga was coming to a close, I got back into comics. And and that's that's when they have that duel. They have to yeah. fight the guard on Amazing. that moon. Yeah. And John <clears throat> Byrne and I'm like, this is – I mean I had – Seeing John Burns work that way after he'd been doing all this work on on the, that I hadn't been aware of, yeah, I wasn't reading. So it was definitely I next level. Like, a lot of that is a recreation of Fantastic Four thirteen, where the Red Ghosts and the Super Monkeys were fighting Fantastic Four mm-hmm. on the in the blue area of the mm-hmm, moon, mm-hmm. and they had that where they would appear over there and they're like, "What's that flash of light?" Right? Yeah. And then they're all about to fight, and a lot of that a lot of that that was the first time that Kirby mm-hmm. basically did that first. Mm-hmm. But Byrne and Claremont did this next level version of that yeah and and yeah. when it resulted in you know gene gray's death it was the whole thing was a huge emotional yeah. amazing event there was so much emotion in those last issues oh yeah when she goes home yeah and she to can't, return to her parents she can't keep gene straight and she she kind of goes back and forth yeah. and scares the shit out of her parents and, yeah, yeah 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 that stuff is really powerful and, yeah and the covers like uh oh see chris and mar both do the same thing where they have these big prints of covers yeah that they work okay on and i sign them I which see. is a great idea for yes. a writer to do so i i got one from chris which was that cover and he signed it and um that just that whole it just brings whenever i look at it, it just brings back so much stuff and i still have my original issues that i bought like at some little store in outskirts of modesto mm-hmm. back at the, when they came out i still have those and they're in not too bad a shape yeah that's how cool. many times i've read them and that's looked through them. you know and i would and i i would love to do more stuff with them you know i just you who, know. who determines that is that individual editors mm-hmm. or is that yeah. more like overseeing like editors Tom what they're pu- what? well what they're publishing what's in their publishing plan it used to be that you could come up with an idea and pitch it to them and they would buy it and you'd be doing it. But now there's much more organization and editorial yeah. with the writers of what their right. plan is for what they're going to do. And so if you don't fit into that plan, you know. I see. Like when I did the Punisher thing, Rick wanted to work with me. Rick Remender was writing the Punisher. Frank Rick Kansas Remender, stuff. yeah. He wanted to work with me. And and so they hired me to do two issues. And that was really fun to do. I enjoyed that. And I like working with Rick. I might be doing a cover for one of his new books coming up. Nice. But uh, yeah, the there was – really fun to do you know and yeah. it was but it was a ton of work and then yeah. i had the giant killer stuff waiting because i had a whole 10 page giant killer story to put into the new book yeah that i did right after that and that was a breeze by comparison because there's only four characters in right right but uh and you're also used to that world and those too. are my guys those yeah. are your guys <clears throat> those are my yeah guys. and then um what the giant killer just came out in france is that, is that yeah correct? it just came out in france um through uh hugen munin which is a like an imprint of dargod and there you they do go. a lot yeah. of American stuff. They did Nocturnals. And yeah. doing a second volume of Nocturnals pretty soon. With Just language French countries. language. So, yeah. Belgium, I guess, too. Belgium, France, that. maybe yeah. uh, French-Canadian readers. Interesting, yeah. Know, Quebec. Uh, I'm not really sure. But, yeah. So, it's pretty cool. And um, the dark, the Nocturnals thing happened through Dark Horse. Um, but the Giant Killer thing was them approaching me. I see. I, I do want to do... Uh, a mass market version of Giant Killer for American audiences because not you know we only did a print run of a thousand books yeah, for Giant yeah, yeah. Killer, uh-huh. but if but Dark Horse has so much more reach, you know, yes. like with the Nocturnal stuff, they reach thousands more people yeah. than I would on my own. So uh-huh. yeah, and I'd like to do I'd like to do more Giant Killer stuff down the road. I mean, I did like this kind of crossover in that book with Nocturnals and Giant Killer. I'd like to ride that out, see where that goes yes. someday. Who knows? Maybe. So a lot of these plans are all in progress, basically, and and then you also do commissions on top of your work for uh, yeah. whichever companies, and then you have a Patreon as well. So the commissions and Patreon are basically go hand in hand now because I I can I can um, organize and manage my commissions through the Patreon uh, uh, thing. That way I don't have to I don't overdo it. I don't take on more than I you know bite off more than I can chew. I do also keep up 
pretty good with Kickstarter projects. I've done one, at least one every year yes. since 2014. And that's that's made a lot of difference. But oh, great. What I like about that is having the control. So you have a fan base now. Yeah, luckily I have that, you know, and that's built up over, well, last 30 years. Mm-hmm. You know, some people stick with you and some people don't. And then there's a lot of new people that come in too. And um, it's great to be able to come up with an idea and then throw it out there and see people go, yeah, I'm down with that, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and I try – and w- one of the things I incorporate with the Kickstarter stuff is doing the, the, the art rewards. So I get to create more art – yeah. And then that feeds into the next project. Yes. And then the Patreon stuff will feed into another project. Right. You know, um, sometimes there's even a theme involved. Like the last art book by the blade is like, you know, characters basically holding sharp weapons. Mm-hmm. Um, so I really enjoy doing that and I want to keep doing that. And, um, and I'm also working on a new Nocturnals graphic novel right now uh-huh. that's completely penciled. It's 96 pages penciled and the covers. 96. And- yeah. Amazing. Right now. It might get longer. Yeah. Depends. Sometimes you have to add stuff in. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. The last one was 96 pages and this one right now is 96. Uh-huh. So barring any uh, editorial changes where I have to add a scene in here or there to make things work better, mm-hmm. about 96 pages. Amazing. So it's all penciled and I'm just slowly since uh, just before Christmas, I started finally doing the paint, paintings paint and stuff. Yes. Yeah. And I'm doing as much as I can when I'm um, when I can. Yeah, yeah so. of course. And the more work I get done for that, when I get closer to being finished with it, I'll, I'll run a Kickstarter because I want to have most of the work done yeah. before I run the Kickstarter. Oh, that's great. And uh, yeah, so I'm pretty excited about that. Well, that's amazing. Yeah, and I'm excited. And I love your art style. I love the way you depict every aspect of the characters that you draw. And, I, and, I, and I'm a big fan of yours. So thank you so much for okay. spending this uh, time with us here. Thank you. And I'm excited to see how this also – I mean, you'll see it on the the – YouTube podcast, but you'll also well. I'm excited to see how it manifests in your art book. So that's great, and I'm excited about yeah, that. Yeah, me too. And how that gets fleshed out. So I can't wait to actually have some text in a book because usually it's just a bunch of art. Well, I try and put so much artwork in there that yeah. I think, well, you know, I really have more art than yeah, text. Yeah, but sure. I think uh, Bud Bud actually was saying that he thought it was time to do something, and yeah, that's he actually was the he was the it was his idea to bring us together, and I yeah. thought, oh, perfect. That's yeah. perfect. Worked out well. Yeah. Well, because I think I, I wanted to have some reason for us to do an interview yeah. anyway yeah, all the better right yeah no totally yeah. you son of a bitch thanks so much thanks dan <laughs> all right 